George Erbacher, DO, FAOCR, is starting us off this morning. Dr. Erbacher graduated from Kansas City University of Medicine and Biosciences College of Osteopathic Medicine in Kansas City, Missouri. He completed his family medicine residency at Rocky Mountain Hospital in Denver, Colorado, then practiced family medicine in rural Northwest Kansas for six years, then a diagnostic radiology residency at Tulsa Regional Hospital, now OSU Medical Center, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In 2019, Dr. Erbacher received the American Osteopathic College of Radiology Distinguished Service Award. He currently serves on the ACGME Review Committee for Radiology. I'm George Erbacher, and I'm happy here to give you a little talk about uh, radiology, common pitfalls in rural setting. A lot of the things I'm going to tell you that we may not be doing right, I did wrong myself, okay, for many years, okay. I ordered lots of uh, uh, radiographic exams without physical exam. I got a call from the ER and I'd tell them to take pictures of whatever hurts. And uh, when I got there, the films were done and almost always they were negative. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about physical examination today as part of what we do, okay. I don't have any disclosures. Uh, our objectives then are uh, the number one have performed a history and physical and considered conservative treatment if appropriate before considering imaging. Uh, to think about the risks and benefits of imaging, and we'll talk about what that means, and then how to use evidence-based ACR appropriateness criteria to determine if imaging is beneficial and decide what exam to order. So what do we do? We have to do history and physical first, okay? And it's necessary to guide appropriate imaging, and there's a uh, how to get a hold of the ACR appropriateness criteria. It's over 400 clinar, uh, clinical scenarios that uh, talk to us about when is imaging appropriate and when is it not, and then what to order. They're evidence-based guidelines, and it talks at the bottom parts of the guidelines where that evidence comes from. Um, this says 2019, there's a 2022 uh, version. They keep adding more scenarios. So pitfalls and trauma. Uh, first of all, not doing a history and physical. That's a pitfall. So when we do a, the history and physical, in terms of history, what should we be concerned about? What's the mechanism of injury? Is there underlying osteoporosis? Are there open grown pla uh, growth plates? Could there be a stress fracture? Does a person have fragile or brittle bone for any reason? Uh, could there be underlying infection? Could there be underlying cancer? How about diabetes? Have they had any um, use of steroids for prolonged periods of time? Signs and symptoms, intense pain. I have to underline that word intense, okay? It's not like it kind of hurts a little bit. This is like seven to 10 over 10 pain um, with you pushing on whatever hurts, okay? Uh, deformity, that's the bony tenderness to palpation. You gotta palpate the entire bone and the joints above and below uh, the fracture site or concern for fracture site. Uh, soft tissue swelling, which is the most sensitive indicator of a fracture, but it's not very accurate. Uh, bruising, numbness, tingling, severe pain with range of motion. Uh, again, severe pain, inability to weight bear. And we're gonna talk about the Ottawa foot, ankle and knee rules here in a little bit that give us some guidance on who needs imaging and who doesn't. So pitfalls, uh, no history and physical before considering imaging. Negative is not negative. And what does that mean? Probably 20% of the time, plain films can be negative when there really is an underlying fracture, okay? So just because you don't see a fracture me, does not mean that there isn't one, all right? Um, and sometimes you just have to immobilize and, and uh, uh, re-image. Sometimes, especially like if you're concerned about a scaphoid fracture or some kind of a fracture uh, that um, could cause serious problems if it's not picked up early, you probably need to go on to MR, most likely, but occasionally CT. And last but not least, you're not alone. Call somebody up, get some help. You know, call the orthopod, call the ER doc, call the radiologist and say, here's what I have on my history and physical. Uh, how should I approach this? Important things in radiography, one view is no view. Minimum of two views at 90 degrees. Uh, the uh, images always need to contain the joint above or the joint below, and if they don't, order more images. And the x-ray beam really needs to be centered. There's something called parallax with x-ray. So uh, things that are seen on each end are not well seen. So the beam needs to be centered at whatever you're interested in. In terms of pitfalls for trauma, you want to maximize your diagnostic acumen. 
Why do orthopedic surgeons rarely miss fractures? I'm going to say they cheat. How do they cheat? They do a really good history and physical, okay? And they uh, question about the mechanism of injury. Those are all really important things that help you decide what you're going to do. Now, if you want to cheat some more, put a marker on the point of maximal tenderness. Get additional views. If the original um, uh, set of images doesn't show what you think should be there, get uh, images at angles to those, okay, obliques. Uh, do comparison views, the contralateral side. And then uh, old images are your best friends. All those will help you. But what's going to help you the best is your history and physical in your fingers. Pitfalls of trauma. Systematically evaluate the images. Really important, okay? And it's something we tend to blow over. We just look at we look at what we're thinking is important. So is the patient's name there? Is the date of birth? Is it right versus left? And systematically evaluate for air, fat, soft tissues, bone and metal. We're gonna practice this here a little bit. If there is a positive finding, look at the rest of the images because 10% have a second finding as significant as the initial. So what's the radiographic definition of a fracture? Transcortical, sharp, lucent line that tapers. What are the pitfalls? Nutrient vessels, accessory ossicles, stress fractures, blowing, uh, bowing slash plastic fractures in kids, normal variants. There's a lot of uh, variants, but are, are variants gonna have severe pain? Are they gonna have severe bony tenderness to palpation? Are they gonna have swelling? Nope. So this is an example of a variant. Um, as we look at this image, we're gonna look at, here's some air, here's some fat, there's some soft tissue, there's some bone, and we see this lucent line. But is it a sharp lucent line that tapers and goes all the way to the cortex? Not really. Uh, so it's corticated, it's really not good and lucent, uh, it's a vascular line. It's, it's a blood vessel in the bone. It's a dense white corticated edge, okay? So that's not a fracture. And again, your, your history and physical would help you, okay? How about this picture to the far left, all right? And let's go through our um, radiographic uh, algorithm here. Air, here's a little bit of fat. Here's some soft tissue. Here's some bone. Do I see any soft tissue swelling here? Nope, it's normal, all right? I do see this lucent thing, okay, but it's corticated. It's not uh, sharp. It's not tapering, okay, and that's a normal apophysis, okay. It runs lengthways along the bone. Now let's go look at this thing, okay. Air, black, and fat, and there's a lot of soft tissue swelling here, okay. So soft tissue swelling. We see. Uh, a lucent line, sharp, tapers with soft tissue swelling, that's a fracture. So you, you got to put it all together. That's the important things, okay? Here's another thing that could fool us a little bit, all right? And let's just go through our, our, our little story again. Air, here's a teeny bit of fat. Here is some soft tissue. This is not a sharp lucent line, it's corticated, there's no soft tissue swelling. This patient has an extra bone adjacent to the navicular, it's normal, has a corticated edge, okay? And there are lots of normal variants. Uh, if you're concerned, take a picture of the other side. There's also books and online uh, images of uh, normal variants. So if it's not tender and you, you're, you're confused, you know, uh, pull up those normal variant books. Bowing fractures, all right? And again, we'll go through our story. Black is air, soft tissue. This is probably a, some fat that's displaced because this bone is bowed. Now, do you see a lucent transcortical line? Nope, kids don't get those, okay? Because their bones are plastic. That means bendable, okay? But these are all uh, fractures that need to be referred to an orthopedic surgeon, okay? Uh, the forces on the bone stop short of fracture. Uh, if we don't get them taken care of, uh, there's persistent deformity, very little remodeling, very common forearm, fibula, 
um, and they can result in functional and cosmetic deficits. So uh, if you're not sure, uh, splint them and send them to your orthopedic buddy. Pitfalls trauma, all rings fracture at least twice. Uh, the force has to get in and the force has to exit. Uh, examples include pelvis and C1, commonly the mandible and the acetabulum fracture in more than one location. If management will change, um, do an MR or CT to see the outlet fracture. So we're gonna look at uh, C1 ring fractures here. Um, if you look at the images over here, you see something, a lucent transcortical uh, sharp line, posterior elements of C1. You see a little opening here, uh, dens, um, air, not a lot of fat here, air, soft tissue. Do we see a lot of soft tissue swelling? Not really, okay. But then let's go over and look at this mechanism of injury, all right? So this is a, a Jefferson fracture, but do we really see this? Do we see those ligamentous tears? Nope, we really don't, okay? We infer there's something wrong because the space is bigger than it ought to be, okay? And we do see a little something back here. So with the history of axial loading, what's gonna happen? You need a CT, you need to see what's going on. The next question then is, if you had enough trauma from this mechanism of injury, to fracture C1, did you have enough mechanism of injury to injure the brain? How about the rest of the spine? How about the chest, abdomen, pelvis? Uh, you know, what's the mechanism of injury? Because if you're gonna send them for cross-sectional imaging, you wanna send them and get them all done at one time. It's part of the, part of the what I call trauma survey, okay? Primary and secondary uh, surveys. And remember that with trauma, we have a golden hour so you really want to figure out what's going on and head to treatment within that first hour. So do your primary and secondary surveys and think about all the things that could be associated uh, with whatever it is you're seeing. So uh, a Jefferson burst fracture is not just a, a Jefferson burst fracture. It's how about all the other forces associated with it that cause that and what, could, what injuries could they cause? So pitfalls of trauma, plain film limitations, it's a 2D representation of 3D anatomy. Stimation, that means uh, things lay on top of each other and they can confuse you. We talked about beam angulation when we talked about uh, centering the beam earlier. Remember, plain film doesn't show us a lot. It doesn't show us any ligaments, tendons, soft tissues, and those can be injured. Um, and when we tell our patients that uh, plain films are negative, they think there's nothing wrong. That's not correct, okay? <laughs> We have to base it on our history and physical, and the plain films don't tell us about these soft tissues. Fracture and trauma can be present and not seen, and the real key here is your history and physical. If you think there is a fracture based on your clinical exam, severe boniness to, uh, and tenderness to palpation, there is a fracture. And if management will change, you can go to MRCT. If it's um, something that's not going to be too uh, worrisome or result in um, long-term um, problems. If you don't find it, you can always splint them and bring them back. Uh, kids will show some callus probably in about seven to 10 days. Uh, older people may take a couple of weeks. So um, if you're not too concerned, you know, put them in a splint, bring them back in a couple of weeks, take pictures. If you see callus, there was a fracture. If you don't, there isn't, okay? If it's important to know right away, you're heading to an MR or CT. So what are the common missed fractures by region? You can see uh, foot, because uh, lots of bones are in there. Knee, elbow, hand, wrist, hip, ankle, shoulder, tibia, fibula. And we'll talk some more about these specifically. So missed fractures are often subtle, small, and occur in areas where overlapping bones obscure their detection. Think about the foot, think about the hand. So carefully inspect those hand, wrist, and foot images. Uh, ask the x-ray tech and radiologist if available for advice on alternative imaging views to visualize those areas. I'm basically gonna tell you, if you think there's a high probability of fracture and you're not seeing it, it's quicker just to get a CT uh, uh, or an MR. 
if the initial radiographs are normal, but there's continued pain and tenderness, and it suggests an occult fracture, consider referral for the things we just talked about. Um, MR is the most sensitive technique for bone injury. Um, when in doubt, again, immobilize the injured limb and refer to the appropriate specialist. So in terms of how we decide what do we do, how do we decide? What are some unnecessary imaging exams and why would we wanna eliminate? And this isn't new, this all came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1980. I was just starting family practice and the article that I took this from came from that. So why should we eliminate unnecessary exams? Well, excess costs and radiation, it wastes patients, technologists, and physicians time, false hopes, expectations based on exam results. And I alluded to that earlier uh, when we said, oh, plain films are negative, you're okay. Not true. Um, and it indicates an illogical thought pattern in the patient's workup. And in the United States, we do lots of unnecessary imaging. U.S. healthcare spending grew 3.9% in 2017, reaching 3.5 trillion or $10,739 per person. I just rechecked uh, for 2018, we're up to 3.7 trillion. Um, healthcare spending accounted for 17.9% of GDP. Um, in 2017, it's up to 18% in 2018. Uh, defense spending in 2017 was 4.2% of GDP. In 2018, it was around 3 to 3.25%. So we spend lots more for healthcare than we do for defense. If the U.S. did less imaging and lowered prices and the number of procedures to levels in the Netherlands, it would translate into a savings of $137 billion. Um, the country that spends the next most after us is Japan. They spend about 12% of their GDP on healthcare. They rank number 10 in overall healthcare in the world. We rank number 37. So the countries that do it well, uh, they have actually much higher health um, quality of life than we do. Okay, they're following algorithms. Why is this important, okay, that we do it right? Actually, the federal government has recognized this. And whenever the federal government recognizes that we're spending too much money in certain areas, uh, they do something about it. So um, the Protecting Access to Medicare Act of 2014, which was supposed to go into effect 2021, but because of all the other stuff that's going on like COVID, it's been delayed. Um, it says that you're not going to get paid for doing cross-sectional imaging, such as CT, PET, nuclear medicine, MRI, if you don't use a qualified clinical decision support mechanism. And that's what that ACR appropriateness criteria is. And I'm going to share those with you and how to get into that. Um, the clinical dis support uh, mechanism provides a determination of whether the order adheres to uh, authorized use appropriate use criteria or not. So uh, whether we want to or not, the federal government is going to cause this to happen. And if your hospital isn't getting paid and your radiologist isn't getting paid for these things, uh, things are gonna happen. So let's talk about what unnecessary radiographs are. Uh, why treatments based on clinical, not x-ray findings, skull series, there are a huge number of variations in the sutures of the skull and a skull fracture does not equal intracranial injury, okay? Your clinical exam does. And we'll talk about the Ottawa CT head rules a little later, okay? And I say that skull series are really fodder for attorneys, all right? So don't do skull series. Nasal bones, what are you gonna do? 18 year old boy gets hit in the nose. Um, he's got a deviated septum. What are you going to do? Okay, well, if you can't breathe, you're going to send it to an ENT person. But for the most part, you're not going to do anything about it because he's going to get hit again. So nasal bone fractures, what are you going to do about it? Rib series. Well, rib fractures are important if they puncture a lung, if they cause an effusion, if they cause a problem. So instead of a rib series, order a two-view chest x-ray, okay? Because really what you want to know is, is there a complication of a rib fracture, all right? Um, and rib fractures and rib contusions most often are going to be treated same, okay? Coccyx, 
There's hundreds of variations of what a cox looks, looks like. And what are you gonna do? You're gonna have them sit on a pillow. So why even do pictures, all right? I don't think I ever called a coccyx fracture in the years I was in radiology. Ankle series, knee series, um, foot series. We're gonna talk about the Ottawa um, uh, decision-making rules, okay, a little later, but uh, that help us decide when those are necessary. Unnecessary radiographs. When auscultation is normal and there are no historical risk factors, the probability of abnormal findings is infinitesimally small, chest radiograph. So no smoking, no inhalation history, um, fever, you listen to the lungs, you don't hear anything, do they need a chest radiograph? No, okay. Um, and I see fevers being chased all the time with chest radiographs. If you don't hear anything with your stethoscope, they're not coughing up sputum, you're not gonna find anything. Unnecessary radiographs. None of the plain film findings can be responsible for the acute problems and other imaging modalities have superseded these exams. Lumbar spine, plain films, outside of the setting of I'd been ejected from my motor vehicle uh, or crushed by a bulldozer, not useful. And we'll talk some more about um, low back pain and how to image it a little later in this talk. But if we're really concerned, uh, you've got motor weakness, uh, or uh, lost DTRs, uh, you're really concerned about some sort of a severe neurological inj injury, and it's CT or MR. Sinus series, um, push on the sinuses, they hurt, they transilluminate, you're blowing out stinky snot, that's uh, sinusitis, you treat it. Uh, plain films, plus or minus 50%, so you might as well flip a coin. Yeah, if you've treated them with several courses of antibiotics and they're not getting better, you CT the sinuses. So if you're looking for um, metabolic uh, bone disease, you do hand films, metastatic bone survey, we do uh, bone scans. It really depends upon what you're looking for. If you know that they have a particular malignancy, uh, go to the ACR appropriateness criteria uh, and it will help you decide what you're gonna do. Bone scans are not very sensitive for slow growing tumors, uh, lymphomas, um, they may not show you, probably won't show you myelomas unless they're giant. Uh, so anything that has a low bone turnover uh, in terms of metastatic disease may not be seen uh, on a bone scan. So uh, remember negative is not negative. Uh, lumbar myelograms, um, at least in radiology, we feel they've been uh, replaced, by, replaced by CT or MR. And I did work in some orthopedic hospitals, and I did a lot of lumbar myelograms, but they are all followed by uh, uh, post-myelographic CTs, and that's a different story. So one of the things we do need to be consider considerate about is how much radiation our patients are getting, and we'll chat about this some more in a minute, but if you don't do the exam, you don't get radiated. So in radiology, we have a concept called LARA. It means uh, do as little radiation as you need to, as low as reasonably achievable. And when we're looking at the musculoskeletal system, only after clinical exam, and most often, conservative treatment is imaging indicated. And again, we'll get into some algorithms as we move along here. So let's get into something that's pretty common, uh, acute C-spine trauma. This is the Canadian C-spine rule. We'll look at another uh, C-spine rule here in a minute. The reason I like it, it, is it has the rhyme over here. So it has a high risk rhyme, 65, 65 miles an hour, fast, dri or fast drive, sense deprived, image if alive. So that's what this says here, greater than 65 years old, dangerous mechanism, paresthesias, neurologic abnormalities, they're gonna get imaged, okay? What's a low risk rhyme? Slow wreck, slow neck, sitting down, walking around, C-spine fine, range the spine, okay? These are low risk factors, all right? Simple rear end, uh, low speed, uh, you can read through it there. What does range the spine mean? If you can look both ways, you can cross the road without imaging. And what that means is if you can rotate the neck actively, 45 degrees left and right, you don't need imaging, okay? And if it's negative to those questions, then you can go on to radiography, okay? 
And again, the reason I like the Canadian one is the, is the mnemonic, okay? And I think it's a little more specific, okay? This is a nexus rule. It's kind of an ER or a main uh, rule in terms of who gets uh, imaged for C-spine trauma. Um, blunt trauma with a mechanism suspicious for spine trauma. I don't see physical exam in here. I think that's really important. Uh, awake, alert, and reliable. Uh, if that's no, you're going to get it. The other thing I should put in there is, you know, if they're intoxicated, you know, if there's drugs, um, you know, if there's other kind of things that confound the picture, yeah, you're going to have to get imaging. So, and that's what intoxication, neurologic deficit, distracting injury, midline spine tenderness, that's you using your fingers, okay? You don't ask the patient, hey, does your spine hurt? Uh, yeah, it does. No, use your fingers. Does it hurt? Is it bony tenderness? If it's no to all that, it's no spine injury, all right? So, um, and then the modified nexus is uh, no spine pain and applies to the entire spine, okay? So these are the ACR, Marin College of Radiology, appropriateness criteria, suspected spine trauma. Uh, and that's what you're going to find when you get to this website is it's going to have lots of variants, okay? So variant one, age greater than or equal to 16 years, less than 65, suspected acute blunt cervical spine trauma, imaging not indicated by nexus or Canadian C-spine rule clinical criteria, and when you go through these appropriateness criteria, you are going to see they're going to defer to the clinical exam. That's what's going to determine what goes on. So remember, we started this by saying you can't decide what to do if you don't do history and physical. You got to do a history and physical. Patient meets low risk criteria. Remember, you can range the spine, look right and left. We talked about the uh, Canadian rule. What should you get? Nothing. Okay. Now let's look at variant two greater than or equal to 16 years suspected acute cervical spine blunt trauma. Well, how would you suspect that? How about that rule that we just talked about, the CCR rule, okay? Imaging is indicated by nexus or CCR clinical criteria. What do you start out with? Here it says usually appropriate CT cervical spine without IV contrast and maybe appropriate radiography cervical spine. I'm gonna say do the CT and why is that? Remember when we talked about that Jefferson burst fracture? If you've got suspected severe problems, you really need to know what's going on. And plain film is not a three-dimensional study. You really, what I saw a lot of is they would do plain films, don't see anything, and then they send them for CT. Just do the CT straight up, okay? Um, rule it out. And don't forget, was there a head injury? How about all the other things that go along with it? You know, Usually if you have acute severe uh, cervical spine injury, You've got other injuries too. So think about the whole patient. That's super important. And that's where your HNP is so critical. So this is thoracic and lumbar spine blunt trauma, uh, variant nine, age greater than or equal to 16, blunt trauma cr meeting criteria for thoracic and lumbar imaging, initial imaging, CT thoracic and lumbar spine without IV contrast. The CT scanners are so fast now that you can actually get the CT quicker it's three-dimensional, and that's what I'd recommend. And here they say usually appropriate radiography, thoracic and lumbar spine may be appropriate. It gives you a relative radiation level, but in the setting of severe blunt trauma, you really don't worry about that, okay? Uh, their injuries are more important than the, the diagnostic radiation they're going to get. Now, if you're doing it for non-appropriate reason, then that is wasted radiation. Um, Variant 10, age greater than or equal to 16 years, acute thoracic or lumbar spine injury, detected on radiographs or non-contrast CT, neurologic abnormalities. That's the key. If there's neurologic abnormalities, MR. MR is the study of choice. It's the only one that can show the cord, okay? CT doesn't, all right? Uh, plain CT without intrathecal contrast in a lot of places, especially above the lumbar spine, is not necessarily sensitive to uh, disc disease and other things that can cause um, neurologic abnormality. So MR is the study of choice. Uh, and it says without IV contrast, if a person has had prior spine surgery, say like thoracic spine or lumbar spine, you do do it with uh, uh, MRI contrast because telling the difference between fibrosis and a new bulge or disc 
uh, is not really possible uh, without IV contrast. So that's, that's something to think a little bit about. Have I had prior surgery in the area uh, that I'm about to get an MRI in? So talk some more about pitfalls. Low back pain, why am I talking about it? Super common, lots of wasted money on imaging and low back pain. It's the second most common reason for primary care physician visits in the United States. About a quarter of US adults reported having low back pain lasting at least one day in the last three months. Two thirds of these that recover will have recurrence within 12 months. Total costs attributable to low back pain in the United States were estimated at 100 billion in 2006, two thirds of which were indirect costs of lost wages and productivity. What's the definition of low back pain? Pain slash muscle tension slash stiffness, you need a history and physical, uh, plus or minus sciatic or radicular symptoms between L1 and L5. Acute's defined as present up to six weeks, subacute six to 12 weeks, chronic present for greater than three months, semicolon, significant enough to impact function, quality of life. And that's what I'm gonna call activities of daily living. You really gotta ask about that. Um, Non-specific low back pain, pain not attributable to a recognizable pathology. What are red flags? Okay, now age less than 20 or greater than 50, severe or progressive neurologic deficit. A neurologic deficit, I think, is an indication for referral and an indication for imaging. And if it's low back, I would go to an MR first, okay? But that's a real neurologic, you know, this is motor weakness, I can't stand, okay? I got a limp leg, that's, that's a neurologic deficit. Bowel or bladder dysfunction, neurologic deficit. History of cancer, now, this really needs to be qualified. It was a squamous cell of the skin, that's really not history of cancer. But you know, breast, thyroid, colon, things like that, that's a real history of cancer, all right? Uh, those people should get imaged. Uh, fever or unexplained weight loss. Uh, you know, you're thinking about cancer, you're thinking about infection. Disturbed gait, we talked about that above. Patients with back pain in the primary care setting, 80% tend to have one or more red flags, but rarely have a serious condition. Serious conditions we just talked about, the neurologic deficits, bowel, bladder dysfunction, et cetera. And let's go back to that last one. One of the things I would do a lot is a SED rate, okay? Um, SED rate's gonna be elevated in infection, um, basically anything that causes an inflammatory process. If your clinical exam is suspicious and you have a high SED rate, image. So this is the ACR appropriateness criteria, low back pain, variant one, acute, subacute, or chronic, uncomplicated, low back pain or radiculopathy, no red flags, no prior management. What should you do? Nothing. Um, I was, for my last two years in practice, on the road doing interventional radiology all the way from Tahlequah to Woodward. And uh, I was on the east end of the state in a hospital that had a family practice residency and I'd hurt my back. And uh, so I was kind of limping along for three or four days. Uh, I was doing PT and the usual stuff, okay? Anyhow, I was doing a CT guided biopsy and uh, I had a family practice residency with me. And uh, that person kind of saw my left leg go out for a little bit. And she said, you need to get an MRI right now. And I says, no, I don't, okay? Uh, because I didn't meet any of these criteria, okay? And we'll talk about that. Well, in fact, we'll talk about it now. The VA did a study looking at their patients who got cross-sectional imaging of their lumbar spine. They had a 13 time greater probability of winding up with surgery if they got imaging. And the reason for that is if we take 100 people off the street, okay, especially if they're older than 65, and we do CTs or MRs, we're gonna find something that looks like surgical pathology. But if these people have no clinical signs and symptoms, they don't need anything. And, and that's the problem, okay? If the people haven't had a clinical exam and you just go right to CT or MR, the next thing you know, you find something wrong. The next thing you know, you wind up in the OR, which really ought to not be that way. So the people doing spine surgery, who I think do it ethically, 
uh, do really good histories and physicals first. Remember that about 30% of spine surgery is failed. Uh, why is that? Because I think we may not make good diagnoses to begin with. And those diagnoses can oftentimes be very difficult to make, even uh, with good cross-sectional imaging. Uh, it takes really good clinical acumen. So now we're going to look at variant four for low back pain. Acute, subacute, or chronic low back pain or radiculopathy. Surgery or intervention candidate with persistent or progressive symptoms during or following six weeks of conservative management. And we've chatted briefly about what some of those signs and symptoms are. Um, exam of choice is an MR uh, without IV contrast, but who should get contrast? Those who have had prior lumbar spine um, surgery should get contrast, okay? CT lumbar spine with IV contrast says five. CT lumbar spine without IV contrast, five. You can see MRs uh, preferred. CT is useful if MRI is contraindicated or unavailable. And it's rare that it's unavailable nowadays. Um, MRI lumbar spine without and with IV. We talked about why that is. Lumbar surgery. CT myelography. Um, I probably wouldn't order one of these uh, from a primary care setting. If you're really concerned, send them to your spine specialist. If that person wants to order a CT myelogram, that's fine. Remember, myelography is invasive um, and there are complications, not, not often, but they do occur, especially with contrast in the intrathecal sac. And uh, especially if you're doing cervical spine myelograms, you almost have to turn the patient upside down on their head in order to get the contrast into the uh, uh, cervical spine. So it is not a pleasant exam. Lower extremity knee, ankle, hip. So these are those Ottawa uh, foot and ankle and knee rules that uh, I said we would get to. And these are evidence-based and they've been validated and studied over a long period of time. So if we're looking at the ankle, you only do order plain films. If there's uh, bony tenderness at the malleoli and there is an inability to weight bear immediately and in the casual department. And then foot, um, bony tenderness, base of the fifth, uh, navicular inability to weight bear. And we'll talk about knee rules later. So, whoops, I guess we'll talk about knee now. Uh, a knee x-ray is only required for knee injuries age 55 or over, isolated tenderness patella, tenderness head of the fibula, inability to flex to full 90, inability to weight bear both immediately and in the ER, four steps, unable to transfer weight twice onto each lower limb regardless of limping. So it actually takes a history and physical. Adult or child, and this is scenario from that ACR appropriateness criteria, greater than a year old, fall or twisting injury, no focal tenderness, no effusion, able to walk, first study, you had to do a history and physical to figure this out. What should you order? Nothing. So this is a plain film of a kid, and you can see that there's a bucket handle fracture out there. Let's go through this again. Air, I don't even see any fat. This is soft tissue. This is bone. Let's do the same thing over here. Air, what do we see out here? Lots of soft tissue swelling. Remember we talked about soft tissue swelling as the most sensitive indicator of a fracture. Not very specific, but... Um, uh, very sensitive, okay? So if there's soft tissue swelling, something's hurt underneath, okay? So bucket handle fracture. And again, go through that whole uh, story. Force yourself, you know, air, fat, soft tissue, um, bone, metal. Now we're going to look at uh, variant three for uh, fractures or trauma to the knee, adult or child greater than a year old, fall or twisting injury after either no fracture or a Sagun fracture seen on a radiograph, suspect internal derangement. Now, in order to suspect internal derangement, you have to do a history and physical. You got to do a physical exam. A Sagun fracture is a lateral tibial plateau fracture. Uh, it's a marker for severe internal derangement. Uh, about 75% of those folks have an ACL injury. So it's basically a marker uh, for more severe injury. 
So if we're really worried about, you know, an internal derangement, not because we're worried just because we're thinking about being worried, but because we've examined the knee uh, and we suspect an internal derangement, uh, we do an MR. MR is a study of choice, okay? Remember that CT really doesn't see the menisci. It can be difficult to evaluate the ACL. It can be difficult to evaluate the soft tissues about the knee. MRI does all of that. Now we'll move on to hip, hip injury, mechanism of injury, osteoporosis. Are there open growth plates? Fragile, brittle bone. I'm thinking about people in the nursing home. Same thing with osteoporosis. Is there potential for infection, cancer, diabetes, long-term use of steroids? Uh, again, what are the signs and symptoms? Intense pain. I always do measurement on the zero to 10 pain scale. This is seven to 10 over 10 pain, deformity, bony tenderness to palpation. You gotta do history and physical. We talked about examining the entire bone, joint above, joint below. Is there soft tissue swelling? Um, we talked about highly sensitive for fracture, not very specific. Bruising, numbness, tingling, severe pain with range of motion, inability to weight bear, ACR appropriateness criteria, variant one, acute hip pain, fall or minor trauma, suspect fracture, suspect fracture. What's that mean? You have to do history and physical. Um, initial imaging, radiography, hip, appropriate, pelvis, appropriate, pelvis and hips, appropriate. Uh, I took care of four nursing homes. If I got a call, uh, a call, and remember I did this wrong, grandma fell, I would get hips and pelvis. And sometimes I'd get there in 24 hours or 48. And I did the same thing everybody else did. Plain film's negative, you're okay, okay. Not true, okay? Because you can have a significant hip fracture and not be seen with plain film. So if you uh, examine 80 year old grandma's hip and you try to do range of motion and she goes ballistic, uh, it's fractured. You need an MR right away because you gotta fix hips. Uh, variant two, acute hip pain, fall or minor trauma, negative radiographs, suspect fracture. Again, you have to do the history and physical. Next imaging study, MRI, pelvis and hips, okay, without ID contrast. Um, CT says usually appropriate. You're going to get, remember, MRI is the most sensitive imaging exam we have for bone injury. Uh, it can show micro fracture. We talked about what the plain film diagnosis of fracture was. Remember, that was a, a lucent transcortical sharp line that tapers. You can have microfracture of the bone that doesn't have any of that, okay? It is what it is. It's a microfracture. And it really needs to be treated as a real fracture. And you're only going to find that with MR. Ankle trauma, plain film, and conventional evaluation are still best for acute skeletal injury. So now we'll talk about those ankle rules uh, again and foot, ankle, basically the malleoli, uh, bony tenderness to palpation. And we talked about what that meant. Seven to 10 out of 10 pain on palpation uh, over the malleoli, uh, inability to weight bear immediately in the casualty department, foot x-ray, uh, bone tenderness, fifth uh, metatarsal base, um, Navicular, severe bony tenderness to palpation, inability to weight bear both immediately and in the casualty department. So let's go to our ACR appropriateness criteria. Uh, adult or kid, greater than five, acute injury to the ankle, does not meet the Ottawa ankle rules. And remember, there's other rules out there, Philadelphia rules, but use a rule. It's just that Ottawa is super common, been validated. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, and ACR uses it. Uh, no point tenderness over the malleoli, talus, or calcaneus on physical exam. You can walk neurologically intact. First study, none. Variant five, adult or kid greater than five years old, acute injury to the ankle with greater than one week persistent pain, initial radiographs negative. Remember, negative is not always negative. Uh, MRI, and we talked about why MRI is the most sensitive tool for evaluating bone injury. Not only does it look at bone injury, 
It looks at uh, ligaments and soft tissues in and around whatever you're looking at, uh, where these other things don't. So if you really want to find out what's going on and it's going to change the way you treat the patient, do an MR. Upper extremity, wrist, elbow, shoulder. For trauma, uh, after physical examination, uh, osseous trauma, plain films. We're going to look at the ACR appropriateness criteria for acute hand and wrist trauma. Variant one, acute blunt or penetrating trauma to the hand or wrist. Initial imaging, plain films, usually appropriate. Variant two, suspect acute hand or wrist trauma. Initial radiographs negative or equivocal. Next imaging study. The key word suspect, that means you did a history and physical. You're worried that there is a fracture. Plain films didn't show it, remember? Negative is not negative. Classic is navicular fracture, about 20% of navicular fractures are not seen on plain film. If you have anatomic snuff box, bony tenderness to palpation, you've got a broken scaphoid, and MR is the examination of choice. You can see what the ACR says here, MRI area of interest, usually appropriate. Radiography area of interest, 10 to 14 days. CT of interest without IV contrast. Remembering that MR is the most sensitive uh, exam we have. Elbow, and the adult elbow fracture is excluded and imaging is not necessary if the patient has normal full elbow extension, absence of bruising and lack of bony tenderness over the radial head, olecranon, and medial epicondyle. So we do films, really important on the lateral is to get a true lateral, okay? And on a true lateral, the condyles ought to pretty much superimpose. This is a good one. Why is that? If it's not a true lateral, you can have subtle posterior fat pad elevation that you're not gonna see on the plane films. And that's the key to this, okay? So here it shows posterior fat pad elevation. This is a bowed convex anterior fat pad sale sign but this is what we care about, all right? And in an adult, when you see this, most commonly, you have a radial head fracture. Can you have a radial head fracture that you don't see by plain film? Yeah, you can, okay? Is it gonna change your management? Probably not. In a kid, a posterior fat pad is a supercondylar fracture until proven otherwise. Um, those kids need to be packaged up and sent to the orthopedic surgeon um, because that, uh, Supercondylar fracture needs to be excluded. But remember, you have to have adequate plain films to begin with. And if it's not a true lateral and you're really concerned, send them back. You got to have good films. Shoulder trauma, ACR, traumatic shoulder pain, any etiology, initial imaging after history and physical radiography um, is usually appropriate. So now I'm going to talk about something that kills many, many people in the United States, okay? Probably is the number one cancer for killing people, uh, and that's lung cancer. Lung cancer kills more people each year than breast, colon, prostate combined with a five-year survival rate of only 19.9%. I did lots of needle biopsies of lung lesions, um, and we'll talk about what I got to see as I travel all over. Lung cancer incidence and mortality rates are higher in rural areas. Rural areas have higher rates of late stage lung cancer compared with urban areas. Smoking rates are consistently higher in rural areas than the urban counterparts. Um, smoking causes uh, 80 to 90% of all ca cases of lung cancer. And compared with urban areas, rural areas also tend to have high poverty, more uninsured residents, lower incomes, lower educational attainment, and a higher proportion of older adults, characteristics that make these areas more vulnerable to high smoking rates and high rates of cancer. When I was in primary care, I had a bunch of young farmers that smoked two to three packs a day. They would mix agricultural chemicals in 55 gallon barrels uh, with their bare arm, breathe in all those fumes. Then they jump in their tractors, some of which did not have cabs, spray that stuff, inhale it. Uh, we had very high incidences of lung cancer, lymphomas, 
leukemias. Uh, so think about what goes on in the rural areas that predisposes us to those kinds of things. It says these disparities are most pronounced in the South. Why is that? Because they smoke the best in the South, okay? Um, to improve lung cancer survival rates, early detection is imperative for every other cancer that we're interested in, especially like breast cancer. It's all about early detection. The sooner you can catch it, especially if it's in stage one, um, then it can be cured. Lung cancers diagnosed at the local stage have a 56.3% five-year relative survival rate compared with 29.7%, 4.7% five-year relative survival rates for lung cancer diagnosed at regional and distant stages respectively. Um, it probably takes a lung cancer that's four centimeters or bigger before a lot of times we're gonna find it on a chest X-ray. So a chest X-ray is not a screening tool for lung cancer. I still see a lot of chest X-rays ordered in smokers uh, for quotes heart disease. Uh, you know, that should have gone away 50 years ago, okay? So these are lung cancer screening guidelines and recommendations from lots of organizations. And I'm gonna pick on the United States Preventive Services Task Force. You're gonna see that, you know, they kind of span from 2012 up through 2013. And actually the CT lung cancer screening studies have been going on for many years and it's taken them a long time to get all that evidence together. But you can see the United States Preventive Task Force down here, their rules are age 55 to 80, greater than a 30 pack year smoking history and uh, smoking cessation uh, less than 15 years. Now they have new uh, recommendations. This is proposed. I just got something last week that said within the last six months, uh, these are the real ones. Okay, so they're no longer proposed. They are the US PSTF low dose screening CT guidelines and what's changed, okay? We screen people 50 to 80 years old who have at least a 20 pack year history. 50 to 80 years old, 20 pack year history screening. As in the 2014 recommendation, uh, screening should be discontinued once a person has not smoked for 15 years or develops a health problem that substantially limits life expectancy or the ability or willingness to have curative treatment. Also, it says lung surgery, okay, but you know, radiation, other things are out there. Why is that important? I did a lot of lung biopsies on 90 year old women who were on four liter nasal cannula O2 and they wanted to know if they had lung cancer. Would that person have been a candidate for surgery? No, they wouldn't have been, okay? Um, and a lot of them would say, even if you find cancer, I'm not gonna do anything about it. Well, then why am I putting a needle in your lung, potentially causing a pneumothorax or other problem, okay? If you're not gonna do anything about it, okay? And you're not a candidate for treatment. Now, remember, you know, you can do radiation, interventional radiology can put probes in and, and uh, do radiofrequency ablation, cryo, do things uh, to kind of improve life expectancy a little bit, but it's not curative, okay? And so the only way to cure lung surgery is to catch A1 disease. And that's why it's so important that we uh, encourage our patients to have uh, CT screening. And I just read something in Internal Medicine Alert that even with the 2014 guidelines, less than 20% of the people who were candidates for screening got screened. So it's really super important for everybody in primary care to be aware of these guidelines and get their people screened. So if we look at the ACR appropriateness criteria, uh, it says 55 to 80 and 30. Remember, um, uh, I, I'm sure if the US um, Preventive Task Forces people who are the ones that actually tell Medicare what's gonna happen, uh, say it's 50 to 80 and 20 pack years, that's what you're gonna get reimbursed, okay? So CT chest without IV contrast. Now remember, these are low dose CTs. It's not a standard CT of the chest, okay? So it's done faster with lots less radiation. And so it's not the same thing as a diagnostic CT of the chest. So we're getting close to the end here. Nobody's told me to stop. Um, so what's the key? History and physical. And then use appropriate use criteria. This is the reference, uh, appropriateness criteria. 
if you're not sure, call your friends, okay? Call your orthopedic surgeon, get a hold of your radiologist, give them the pertinent history and physical findings and say, what should we do? Nobody stopped me, so I'll keep on going a little bit more. I put in some additional uh, uh, slides in case we had more time. So referral decisions, um, how do you decide what to do? Urgent referral immediate, significant soft tissue injury, life-threatening injuries such as hemorrhage, fat, PE, gas gangrene, tetanus. In the setting of trauma, it's usually a fat pulmonary embolism, okay? It, it, this is not a blood clot thing, okay? And th that's a, a much more serious problem. Arterial and nerve injury, open fractures, you know, get them there as quick as you can. Referral decisions, urgent referrals, ambulance to the ER, compartment syndromes, uh, which are elevated pressures and rigid fascial muscle compartments. You feel the, the calf, it's hard as a rock. Pain, pallor, paresthesias. By the time you have paralysis, pulselessness, it's a late sign, and you're headed towards an amputation. So this is urgent. Uh, tinting of the skin, concern for open fracture, uh, get them splinted and get them on the road. Referral decisions, urgent referral, ambulance to ER, question mark, complicated fractures to refer, um, fractures needing to reduce. Now, I took care of a, a lot of distal radial fractures when I was primary care, so I think there's a lot of what I would consider simple fractures that primary care people can deal with if they've been trained and they feel comfortable with it. Um, both bone fractures, eh, send them to orthopod. If it involves an articular surface, especially if it's depressed more than a millimeter or two or three, uh, or if you have questions, that goes to see the orthopedic surgeon. Um, multiple fractures, fracture dislocations, uh, anything involving a growth plate. Remember what's a Salter Harris one look like? It looks normal, okay? But it's still a significant uh, plate injury and especially in younger kids, you can wind up with deformity. So it's better to have an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I've seen that person. Uh, fractures with tendon injuries. If we still have a little time, I'll talk about this. This is the ACR appropriateness criteria for shoulder pain. I currently work in Xavier Free Clinic here, and it's a pain clinic, and I see a lot of pain in all these joints, including the shoulder. So atraumatic shoulder pain, initial imaging study after history and physical radiography. The British have looked at uh, shoulder pain, okay? And this is their guideline, subacromial decompression surgery for adults with shoulder pain and clinical practice guideline, um, subacromial pain syndrome, rotator cuff disease, basically pain out there. And I'm thinking more along the chronic line here, uh, does not apply to traumatic shoulder pain, other differential diagnoses. They looked at uh, subacromial decompression surgery uh, versus non-operative management. And the bottom line, non-operative management, especially at the end of a year, um, had better results and it was strong evidence. So uh, I always share with the folks that, uh, you know, let's get you some physical therapy. Let's do the NSAIDs and the rest of the things. And I do a lot of joint injections with ultrasound guidance. And let's see if we can get you out to a year here, okay? So we'll talk a little bit about bones because we're gonna to head towards osteoarthritis here in a minute. This is a lateral view of the knee, medial lateral condyle patella, uh, intertrochanteric uh, eminence, head of the fibula, fibula, fibella, normal limits variant. How do you know that? Well corticated, uh, no soft tissue swelling, no pain. They got one on the other side. When we look for osteoarthritis in the knee, we need to do weight bearing images. It's best to do both knees at the same time, weight bearing, because what are we looking for? We're looking for joint space narrowing. We're looking for osteophytosis. We're looking for subchondral bone cysts. All of those are signs of osteoarthritis. Um, you gotta have adequate imaging. Again, remember, it needs to be erect. And how can I tell that on this image? I can't. Usually there's a little circle. And if it's got three little BB-like things in the bottom of the circle, that tells you it's an erect weight-bearing image. And you cannot evaluate for osteoarthritis in the knee unless you do weight-bearing images. These are weight-bearing images, all right? And what do we see here? We see subchondral sclerosis. We see osteophytosis. We see joint space narrowing. 
we see a vacuum phenomenon uh, where the meniscus ought to be. What is that? <clears throat> Whenever you injure something, it outgasses its nitrogen gas. So that's a sign of severe degenerative change in that uh, medial meniscus. Um, here you can see some osteophytosis, uh, lateral compartment of the knee. And I divide the knee into lateral compartment, medial compartment, and anterior compartment. Um, and again, let's look, what's air look like? Black. What's gas look like? Black. Okay, soft tissues, bone. There's a little bit of fat up here. Same story over here, joint space narrowing, vacuum phenomenon, not as much periarticular osteoporosis over here. There's still sclerosis on either side of the joint space. So you can grade all this, but basically it's how the patient's doing, okay, that counts, all right? Um, this is advanced osteoarthritis. Uh, so what do we see here? Advanced osteophytosis, basically bone on bone sclerosis, side to side. Um, lots of osteophytosis, all right? But I've seen people like this walking okay and not having too much pain. And then I've seen people with normal images having severe pain. So make your diagnosis clinically, all right? Um, if they look like this and they've been having pain for a year or so and they're failing physical therapy, uh, it might be somebody you'd want to send to your favorite orthopedic person. That's the end of the story. Um, Thank you, Dr. Erbacher. We do have one question. Uh, for lumbar spine, what about flexion, extension, and oblique films for pars fractures and spondylolisthesis? Do you still go, do you still do these or go straight to MRI? Uh, the problem with plain films is they're just not a three-dimensional study. And I know we talked about the plain film, but I would probably do a CT. Um, and depending upon what the clinical story is, um, uh, an MR, all right? Uh, again, flexion and extension are useful to show spondylolisthesis and movement disorders, but I would probably leave that uh, to whoever the spine operating person is, because then they're really kind of asking the question, uh, is this something that needs operative fixation, okay? And I'm going to kind of get on this a little bit, because like I said, I, I, I worked in an orthopedic hospital where they did 120 to 150 procedures a day for a long, long time. And I have a real negative bias towards um, uh, spine fusion. And at least from an osteopathic world, what is the spine? It's a motion segment. And when you freeze up segments, what happens to the motion that used to be in those segments? It gets transferred to the segments above and below. So you end up with advanced osteoarthritic symptoms above and below. And within probably five to 15 years, you're in for your next fusion, okay? So uh, there's, there's criteria for who really needs to be fused. And I think you'll find that neurosurgeons do less fusions than the orthopedic spine surgeon guys. And that's partly, I think, because of training. You know, orthopods, uh, if it's broken and flopping around, you plate it, you screw it, you fix it, you keep it from moving. Um, and, and so it's just the way they think, okay? Uh, the neurosurgeons tend to be I don't know, I, I call them chippers, okay? They do a little bit, they do a little microscopic this, a little of this, a little of that, and try to get by with minimal kind of things. I have a good, well, several good friends who are neurosurgeons, but one in particular uh, said, George, he says, I'll never do surgery for pain. He says, I don't care if they come crawling on their hands and knees to me, and said, I got bad pain. And he said, the reason for that is uh, I'm probably not gonna help their pain. And he says, now that's different. If you've got motor weakness or DTRs or you know definite um, uh, neurologic abnormalities that you can doc document with physical examination, um, et cetera. So uh, it's, I think if you're thinking osteopathically, you really need to, how am I gonna say this? Treat them osteopathically, okay? Get them as far out as you can. Uh, send them to a pain specialist. Uh, do whatever you can, if you can, to avoid fusion. And I also saw a lot of people, still do, BMI is 30, 35, 40. Um, my daughter is married to an orthopedic surgeon, and he says that you wear out your joints, including your back, seven times faster if you're overweight. 
So a lot of these people, if we can help them with weight loss, and that's not, hey, you, you got to lose weight, okay? It's like, send them to the nutritionist, get them on a weight loss program, you know, have them come into your clinic every month and, and weigh them. And, you know, I always tell people that, you know, uh, being overweight is a lot like diabetes or hypertension. It's a disease. You need help. Your doctor needs to be engaged. And so when we're talking about musculoskeletal problems, we're really, that's a huge part of it. And so if we're being holistic and real osteopathic physicians, we have to look at their whole body. And, you know, it's not my knee osteoarthritis, it's my BMI that's 45, okay, and all the other stuff that goes with it. Remember too, that when you get those high BMIs, then we're starting to get into diabetes and microvascular disease and, and cartilage that's not vascularized it, since it is a microvessel disease. And a lot of people are now thinking that joint disease, especially knee, is not menisci, but cartilage degeneration, okay? So, uh, which is why a lot of the meniscectomy and, and meniscal repairs things really don't work because it's really a cartilage disease. So um, I know you asked about something simple, but uh, um, uh, I think hold off on those flexion and extension views and all that other stuff uh, in terms of plain film. If you're really concerned, uh, just to reiterate, uh, uh, CT of the lumbar spine. All right. It'll, it'll tell you what's going on. Um, if you've got neurologic abnormalities, MR is the study of choice. So, and, and I know you can't do the motion studies that are part of that, but again, I would leave that up to somebody that would be evaluating them for surgery. Thank you, Dr. Erbacher. And, uh, thank you, Dr. Erbacher for getting our, our morning started. Uh, be sure to check out our exhibitors by visiting the convention event webpage or the YAP app. Uh, one of our exhibitors, Northwestern Mutual, is dedicated to partnering with their clients with financial planning that serves and protects physicians, their families, businesses, assets, and well-being. They'll be joining us uh, this morning at 10 a.m. for an exhibitor connection. Our next speaker is Benjamin N. Abo, D.O. Dr. Abo is an emergency medicine physician in Naples, Florida. He received his medical degree from Toro University, California College of Osteopathic Medicine. He specializes in emergency medicine and EMS education, international EMS system analysis and development, international and clinical medicine, humanism and mentorship, airway management, wilderness austere medicine, toxicology, and venom medicine. He has worked for various TV and movie productions, including Shark Week episodes from 2017 to present, also National Geographic shoots. Uh, please welcome Dr. Abo. How about now? Can you hear me now? Awesome. I was trying to use the call in just to help with the Wi Fi there. Um, so I apologize for that. I was trying to help with the stream. As you can see, it's I'm doing a wilderness medicine talk. So why not be outside before my shift, huh? Um, interestingly, um, I caught the, uh, quite a bit of that last lecture. And what I'm about to talk to you about. Um, dealing with um, patients and species that actually have anywhere between 40 and 600 vertebrae um, to kind of tie that in there. But let me go ahead and share my screen here. Let's get started. So as I said, and I appreciate the, the warm welcome and all, I'm here to talk to you about, uh, while I do a lot of osteopathic medicine, um, actually in the wilderness and austere environment with the disaster teams and TV production, I'm here to talk to you about one of my passions being venom care and what happens when you're on the wrong side of the wrong side of the snake, wrong side of the fang rather. There's actually a lot of um, important stuff that our relative specialties, whether it's family medicine, primary care, surgical, emergency medicine talks, you know, there's a lot of misnomers out there, and I really want to get the right information out there. And it's really a, an approach that we need to take uh, from all of our fields and the follow-up and all. So um, we're going to dispel definitely some myths um, and take it from there. 
that is not for the record a venomous snake that I'm holding. Um, that is a, at the Miami Zoo. It is a 97 pound python um, that was very hard to hold to take that picture. Um, but I appreciate being here. So venom is a big important part of my life. Um, I am not a board certified toxicologist, I'm a toxinologist. So I deal with toxins from living things. So basically a venomologist. Um, appropriate that here I actually am wearing my Venom Life uh, hat when I was filming my TV show. And uh, one of the most toxic uh, species, which is two inches big is a blue ringed octopus that will kill you in five to 10 minutes. Um, if you pick it up how cute it is and let it bite you. Um, so I thought that was a nice juxtaposition. Um, and I didn't even realize that the last snake bit that I was treating, I was wearing my Venom Life t-shirt. I wear a number of hats as said, um, including street response, disaster response, and of course my Venom team, which I'm gonna get into and where I kind of come back from. I have not had an obsession with snakes. I do not have any pet snakes. Um, I have always had a healthy respect uh, for the venoms um, and wildlife. In fact, I had a major phobia uh, until just a couple of years ago. Um, better respect, the venom is very important. Wildlife is very important, but actually a lot of our uh, medicines and tests actually come from the venom of different species. In fact, breast cancer uh, treatments, most of them come from copperhead uh, venoms. Um, Eastern Diamondback is stuff. Some of our blood pressure medicines are things that we're trying to use to help get our BMI down to to less than 30, as we just talked about. You know, come from some of these different uh, snakes and species. Um, so, I'm the medical director of Venom One and Venom Two. Venom One is the largest. It used to be the called the largest civilian venom bank in the uh, hemisphere, but then I realized that the military started consulting me and they don't really have much. Uh, so I realized it's actually the largest venom bank in the world, which I'm gonna show you. And that's down in Miami. Um, we actually treat bites all over, mostly Florida um, and Florida man, but I actually just treated a cobra bite uh, in Tulsa. Um, and then I started a couple of years ago, Venom 2 and being the medical director of the two of them, that makes me cobra commander. Um, but as you can see, it's not complete without my good old hair. So, um, I write a lot about the different aspects and uh, a lot of textbook chapters. There's a lot of great information out there and I'm in this about an hour gonna give you the, some of the important things, um, but I'm always reachable and you can reach out to any of these textbooks or chapters or Medscape articles to, to get some more information and some misspelling. Um, I am writing a couple books. It should be easy, The Snakes of Ireland, The Venomous Snakes of New Zealand. These are all the species are nice and of course the venom snakes in Alaska. Um, if you have a phobia of snakes and you uh, want to figure out which state to live in, um, either a state of denial or state of Alaska, otherwise no matter where you're at there are venomous snakes and uh, yeah so that's just the reality of it, just less likely in different places being smart. Okay so I'm a fan of the movie Pulp Fiction, and sometimes I like to start at the end, and I'm going to come back to this list, but this is the list of the do's and don'ts, and I'll gladly send this slide out. Um, I'm making new posters. You can take a screenshot of it, um, but the things that you do want to do for, for care is uh, immobilize, uh, keep it level of the heart or higher, call a venom or talk specialist. That might be the poison control center. It could be me. It could be someone else who's a vetted uh, no pun intended for being a veterinarian, but a vetted specialist. Uh, note and mark the leading edge and the time of swelling or skin changes and tenderness. Don't be afraid to give pain medicine, all right? Analgesia, opioids, ketamine, um, just not NSAIDs for the theoretical risk of, of bleeding because we're already worried about that. And by golly, leave the snake alone. It doesn't need to be killed. It doesn't need to be caught. It doesn't need to be brought in. I'll be able to figure out uh, what it is and what antivenom we need just by clinical signs. There is no shocking, no tourniquet, no excisions. Don't go to Bass Pro Shops or REI or something and buy some venom extractor kit because sucking and extracting does not work. It actually makes it worse. Do not put ice on it. Do not wait for symptoms and assume and hope that it's a dry bite. 
and do not prophylactically do any fasciotomies or NSAIDs. In fact, there's never an opportunity where it's appropriate for a fasciotomy. And I should put on there, uh, for the most part, um, is keeping surgeons away um, until later, 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 uh, possible debridement. But fasciotomy is never an answer. And uh, overall, envenomation used to be considered a surgical disease, but it's not. Envenomation is a traumatic disease, but not surgical. This is all about medicine. So overall goals is understanding that prevention of, and education, of course, are key. The urban legends are what it says in the textbook or what you've always been taught or what the nurses say is policy uh, are, are dangerous. Um, again, there's no need to bring in or kill it or catch it. Um, I have had snakes brought in by helicopter, by ambulance. Uh, I even got a phone call in the middle of the night because a nurse put the snake in the tube up to the ICU because the fellow thought that he needed to see the snake. Um, understand that denial is not just a river in Egypt. And I want you to know who to call and how to call. And this is not only for the active envenomation or what if, what am I supposed to do? But also what about follow-up care? Uh, I've been going on this sort of rampage for proper um, follow-up care. And I do it myself. I don't really run a clinic, but um, I follow up with all the patients because where I give consults to because a lot of primary care, they, they don't know what to look for um, and how to get these people back to full functioning lives. Um, and understand that when we need to, we need a carpe remedium, which is seize the cure, not to be mixed up with carpe donut, which is seize the donut. Um, like I said, I have a lot of respect for these danger noodles um, and the venom and the things um, that are associated with it. Uh, and I hope that others do as well. Um, this is a handout that we have from the, our venom unit here. And it actually shows the indigenous snakes to here in Florida that are venomous. Now, in the United States, 99% of venomations are by pit vipers. And we'll kind of get into that. And then in the US and the South, we do also have some coral snakes. Uh, three species. I'll get into that in a moment. Um, but overall, it's mostly pit vipers. And the pit vipers include whether they have a rattle to warn you, and they twerk to warn, or it's a cottonmouth or copperhead. Cottonmouth and copperhead are two subspecies, um, and separate species that uh, don't have a rattle to warn you. They might try and act like it. Um, they might twerk and shake their tail, but it's not going to rattle. Overall phone numbers of Carl, which I'm gonna bring up this at the end also, so you have that access. If you look at the statistics for the nation, um, that's what we have here. We have 90% male. I'm just gonna leave that pie chart there for a moment. What can I say? 50% uh, are between the ages of 18 and 26. 96% are in the extremities, 50% of which are in the hands. Um, and these are the national statistics, and 90% between April and October. Um, things shift a little bit um, within the state of Florida, uh, but you do have indigenous snake bites by you as well as, as you can see, some uh, exotic with Tulsa. Um, I do have to thank Florida Man for keeping me busy, but it's not just people messing with snakes. It's not just if they're drunk or you know, uh, things like that. We have kids that are playing on playgrounds. Basically, the we're not, we're in their backyard. They're not in our yard. So the, the Venn diagram of that circle of a snake's life and our life is just overlapping more. And it definitely happens a lot more during these warmer months, April to October. Uh, the snakes are more active because they're cold-blooded and they tend to be physically more active, not to mention we get in a storm season. And with the storms, it's a lot more likely that we're gonna have a run-in. And that's statistically proven when a, the snakes are rained out of their homes or they're following the food, um, or we're cleaning up debris or putting on storm shutters, we're a lot more likely. Not to mention we're out doing things like camping and hiking and things like that. To give you an idea of, and hopefully not scare you away from coming from Florida, but every state's a little bit different in terms of having pets. Um, every blue dot here, uh, listed is someone that has a venomous reptile license legally. Um, it doesn't mean that they have one snake. It means that they can have, you know, as many as they want. They just legally did it. Um, so 75, I know some people that have 150 snakes and it's just a hobby. Um, they're just pets. 
which is pretty interesting. Depending where you go in Michigan, every county is based. So people that have uh, a thing for keeping venomous snakes, uh, they will actually move to certain counties so that they can legally have these. There are people that do it right. Uh, this is my friend Cody. Uh, his wife actually works at Animal Kingdom um, and they started RPI, the Reptile Pres Preservation Institute. Um, there's only one snake in their entire collection that is not venomous. Um, and you can see the, in the bottom picture that green sticker. And we have a whole coding system just for safety, um, never do anything alone. And if someone is bit, we have a whole game plan and safety plan because we need exotic anti-venoms and things like that. So people do have good, take good care of these snakes or do certain things um, other than just having some creepy hobby. Um, also in Florida though, which is also similar, on the left, you see a picture of a typical Florida home. Um, with the Spanish moths. Um, and on the right is a typical Florida man. And this uh, house and picture are famous because this is where the Ocala Cobra um, got on the loose. Ocala is a town just south of the city of Gainesville, University of Florida, by about 45 minutes. And they couldn't find the Cobra, um, got on the loose. Meanwhile, the fire chief, while they're trying to look for it, said, what do we do if one of my guys gets bit? They said, just intubate him and send him to Dr. Abo and we'll send you the anti-venom. So, which I'll get into our venom bank just very briefly. Um, that cobra is still in the loose. If you do have Twitter, uh, the Ocala Cobra has a pretty funny Twitter feed and he and I go back and forth a little bit. I keep inviting him to Disney World with the giant rat um, or giant mouse um, to see if I can catch him, but uh, he hasn't joined me yet. We'll see. Um, several years earlier, um, we actually had a king cobra on the loose. In Orlando, this was somebody's pet. They get about 18 feet long. It was found a couple days later underneath the neighbor's uh, clothes dryer. I already don't like folding laundry, but the thought of this happening uh, puts me off from doing laundry also even more. Um, he was not found at Disney World, like I said, it was the neighbor. So in the US, and you ask about the incident, only five or six people die from snake bite envenomation. Uh, that's very different than globally, where you can see here in my, you know, uh, Ascubia Snake Bite Foundation, which is a nonprofit that uh, some other colleagues and I started. You know, globally, most people die. I mean, we're, there are estimates, and it's grossly underestimated 600 to 800,000 people die per year globally. In the US, five to six. Um, so, why are we bothering talking about this? Well, we're trying to prevent not just death, but we're also trying to prevent permanent pain, permanent disability, permanent disfigurement. If you are working, a working person, I want you to be able to get back to work. I don't want you to have to be stuck on pain meds. I don't want you not to be able to, and I will show you a couple of particular great cases. And that's why it's really, 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 really important to not be afraid of the appropriate care and have the appropriate follow-up, right? Uh, we're all either, uh, osteopathic students or osteopaths, I believe, that's uh, on this. Um, and we all know how important everything plays into each other. Uh, even from the fact if I have permanent pain, permanent disability, um, because I lost function of my right foot, that's going to change everything, how I walk, can I work, I'm going to have permanent pain, go by the sink, I have dysfunction. I, I deal with this all the time. And really, we can avoid a lot of this if we give the proper care. The only treatment to venom is anti-venom. End of story. End of story. Um, Benadryl, different meds, doesn't work. That's all just a supplement you need to give anti-venom. Um, and there are specific ones on there for it. We've actually had a pretty well-known anti-venom that was good for all North American snake bites. You can see this is quite an outdated bottle. This is a bottle of the original. It was made by Wyeth, um, first Mulford and then Wyeth. Um, and until 1999, this product was very famous for side effects. Real, real, it's horse derived where basically they take some venom, they inject it in a horse, it doesn't die, um, but the horse is big enough that it's able to make antibodies and we take those antibodies and we inject them, uh, separate them down and inject them into humans. Um, so there are side effects, there was serum sickness, there was allergic reactions, but once we came out with other newer anti uh, anti-venoms, um, it's a lot safer. But 
a lot of those misnomers of, oh, the treatment might be worse than the problem is, is just absolutely not true. I get this question a lot, so I decided to make a picture of it, slide. Um, people ask, is it anti-venom or anti-venin? It really doesn't matter. It depends if you're um, French or English, ver British versus American English. Um, as long as you don't hyphenate it, you're spelling it correctly. This is my venom bank, uh, what I was talking about. So most of these, these are in Miami-Dade. Uh, if you can see the fridge on the right that mostly has all the boxes that have boring black and white print, those are FDA approved anti-venoms for domestic snakes. So that includes the North American coral for Florida and uh, Crofab um, for our pit vipers here in North America. Everything else is over 1500 vials um, covering 54 anti-venoms from jellyfish to snails to spiders, black widow, um, everything in here made from all over the world. Hospitals cannot keep these. They are not FDA approved, um, but because we don't have cobras, we don't have cobra anti-venom, so therefore we have to have a means to do it. So I'm able to deliver it and get access to people. We used to actually have to call around a zoo and be like, do you have this? Do you have that? In fact, the snake, first snake bite I ever treated was in Pittsburgh when I was a paramedic. Cobras um, are not indigenous to Pittsburgh, although uh, penguins are if you're a hockey fan. And uh, we called the zoo. Once you finally get a hold of somebody, they don't even have any cobras, so they don't have cobra antivenom. So we had to fly it from uh, Philadelphia Zoo. Brings the costs way up. Um, interesting article after 9 11 in 2001. Someone was bit by a Taipan. You can Google this story. Um, the only civilian plane that was in the air was a medical uh, jet from Venom 1. Um, they chartered it out to bring Taipan anti-venom. They had to get presidential clearance and they got a fighter jet escort. Um, that was on September 12, 2001. So all these other colors, um, nice pictures of the snakes. It's in Thai, it's in English. You know, really nice pastel colors or really reminds me of Easter. Um, a lot of things that are out there. Some of these are specific um, to snakes, to a particular species, like just like our coral antivenom. And some of them are general and broad. So we're really lucky because we can just grab one antivenom if it's not a coral and just use it all over the US. This is uh, Florida. We have three poison control centers and you can see where I have the venom banks um, distributed. Um, and I already mentioned about how the statistics, I was deployed with the disaster team to uh, Hurricane Florence up in the Carolinas. Um, and they were making it seem like you're gonna get bit, there's snakes flying around with wind, it's like Sharknado. And I countered them and said it's snake a cane, but it's not like that. As I mentioned earlier, you're just more likely to. So just be smart when you're out hiking, be smart when you're prepping for storms or cleaning up after. Um, look under rocks, use a stick, in fact, especially in Florida. I don't do planting or going to nurseries or Home Depot or anything like that without looking at the plants with a little stick um, or you know, a yardstick just to make sure there isn't a snake hiding in there. You can see here, um, this is a pit viper, which is the most common. And that's what you're gonna mostly deal with. Um, pit vipers um, all have these retractable fangs. The retractable fangs are just inoculation needles um, to put the hurt juice into whatever their prey is. They don't want to prey on us. In fact, if they use their venom on us in defense, then that makes them harder to hunt. Um, so they're not going to be able to eat. So they don't want to have to, but it's usually us that's doing something to them. So you can see the now Captain Seifert um, showing us these retractable fangs. Um, if you're close enough that you can see the retractable fangs um, on the same side of glass, you're probably too close. Um, I mentioned how everyone thinks you either just bleed to death or you're paralyzed. And there's all these different ways that snakes kill in the hunt and things like that. Um, and it gets a lot more complicated. But overall, what we're worried about are heme toxins, neurotoxins, and cytotoxins, literally just eating away at the tissue. Now, this snake is not, this is a pit viper. It's not from the US, but I just really love the picture. Um, sorry if any of you are squeamish, um, but this is a pit viper. And I always ask, how else do I know that it's a pit viper? Well, the first thing that you can see are those little holes or pits in front of the eyes, and those are the heat sensing pits. Um, 
That's why we call them pit vipers. If you're close enough to see those heat seeking pits, you were way too close. The next thing I hear a lot of people say as well, you got to look for the elliptical eyes. Um, quite frankly, um, the elliptical eyes, yes, if you're close enough to see them, it's, you're usually too close. Not to mention they can actually dilate their eyes as you can see here. These are both copperheads, they're both venomous pit vipers with no rattles on them, but you can see that they can actually dilate their eyes. They're not doing it to try to trick you. It might be like in this case from light or copulation. Um, so you really don't know. So don't use that rule. How oh, else? Well. Oh, sometimes they say, oh, the little shield over the eye. Um, if you're close enough to see that, you're way too close. Um, and then you, if you look for the striping or if the head is really big and bulky or a triangular shape. But as you can see here, one of these snakes is venomous, the other is not. Uh, the top one is a harmless Nerodia water snake. Um, he will flatten himself out to try and make him look more like a water moccasin. His head is triangular. Um, how do I know? You know, both, both of them have big triangular heads. Um, if you get really close, when you're an expert, you can see that he actually has fully round eyes with no shield. Um, and next to his mouth, he has the vertical lines. I see these killed, unfortunately, all the time because they're like, this was near my dog. Um, and that they're, they're harmless, right? As opposed to the bottom, which is a venomous species, still shouldn't be killed. Um, they'll usually just go away, but that's the cottonmouth or water moccasin. But they look very similar. So I was telling you about those retractable fangs. Don't think that you're quick enough. Um, to be able to grab it behind its head. Some snakes will actually start to open its mouth and put its fang through its bottom jaw underneath the mandible to enable to free itself. Again, that there's inoculation needles. Now, we all know or have heard about how snakes can kind of unhinge their jaws, kind of like my ex to swallow their prey. But in reality, they're very pliable. I, this on the bottom is an Eastern Diamondback and I'm going to show you this video. Um, you see the anatomy or the fangs, are, but look how pliable it is. They don't have their arms um, or legs, but they're very pliable. In fact, their skulls um, never really fuse. Um, I know I've never done cranial sacral or anything like that, um, osteopathic manipulation on a snake, but they can actually pivot their skulls. The other thing too is their fangs can move almost like chopsticks and kind of move things around. So very pliable, you need to be very careful. This video here is in fact in slow motion and he's not forcing any venom out, but look at the amount of venom and the toxin that would be injected into your hand or your foot, right? The power of it just bouncing off that glass. Um, and this is just from one snake, right? And now you can go ahead and notice the kid's face in the background. Um, I did film this while I still had a phobia. Uh, I was kind of like this, looking really scared taking it. But I feel that people need to understand um, this because so many people are afraid of treating this. But this toxic substance is literally being injected into you. So, oh my goodness, snake, what do I do? You know, like I said, your textbooks, board exams often will say they're either heme toxic or neurotoxic. It's not that simple, it's combinations, as well as, you know, how are you bleeding? Is it because it's using up all your clotting factors and so you go into DIC, or is it keeping things from working appropriately? This is somebody who is actually bit, granted this is in Africa, um, but he was bit on the foot and altered mental status, signs of herniation, his LP, I'm not saying you should normally do LPs, um, but we didn't have CAT scans and things like that. Um, his LP on the left, which is just pure blood, um, then he got antivenom and beautiful clear CSF and he walked home five days later because he had the appropriate treatment. So venom works in a variety of ways. Publix happens to be a uh, supermarket chain down south here, but uh, like it's no venom is created equal. In fact, if, uh, I have a twin brother and we're both Eastern Diamondback rattlesnakes. Uh, we're from the same litter, we're twins. Uh, our, you analyze our venom, it's actually going to be different. 
um, based on geography, what we're eating, um, time of year, it, altitude, the venom composition changes. Now, I don't like many words on my slides, that's personal, but these are just some of the ingredients and the different toxins that are in venoms, and neurotoxins, myotoxins, procoagulants, anticoagulants, um, nerve growth factors, there's all different sorts of things. And some of these toxins in this cocktail are, work symbiotically with other ones and make them worse. So no venom is created equal and they're all like cocktails. And even though you're getting the Eastern Diamondback Mai Tai cocktail or a Caparina or a Mojito, you don't know what kind of rum you're getting. You don't know what kind of juice you're getting. So it can all work a little bit differently, but they have a lot of clinical similarities. And that's why it's really important to involve a specialist um, and have some humility because we're, we're just here to help. This was actually a girl um, who was on vacation that uh, was bit by a fertile ants in Belize, believe it or not. Um, and she initially was hypertensive, unresponsive seizing, uh, this is a pit, this is a huge rattlesnake, and you can see there are barely any swelling, any marks, any bruising, um, but she was, she was bleeding out until she got the antivenom. Um, when she was transferred to Fort Lauderdale, Miami, she went to see her, the nurses thought that um, it was just the sedation wearing off when she was extubated, that she wasn't really moving one of her sides. Turns out she had an ischemic stroke. She went from bleeding out to having ischemic stroke, so I remember this um, as my reminder and teaching point that you're coagulopathic on top of the neuro issues and everything else. Um, this case was actually discussed on Netflix, um, 72 Dangerous Animals, Latin America version, um, but she did do well. She was 12 years old, uh, gymnast, and had to learn to walk and talk, and but did, uh, did great. This was actually an interview from either Dateline or 2020. So the actual effects, I hear that there's, people say that there's always swelling, there's always pain, there's the bleeding, you're gonna to bleed to death. You know, so I don't have any, unless any of you wanna volunteer, uh, Jonathan, Audrey, um, I don't have a picture of the snake actually latching on. Um, usually they like to bite really quick and get off um, and they'll actually then follow their prey um, until whatever happens or they try to get away from us. But, so you do have the fang marks, <laughs> um, I got multiple hard passes uh, there in the chat. Um, cool, <laughs> noted. So you do have the thing marks because you're getting jabbed, but let's say, you know, you say something mean about my hair. I love my hair. Um, I will get very defensive. And uh, my headphones I'm told are not, uh, gonna keep my charge, we'll see here in a moment. Um, you're gonna have the fangs, uh, fang marks there, but it's not gonna swell, it's not gonna bruise. You're not gonna have, I have patients that have huge swollen feet and they're like, well, it's a trauma from the bite. This isn't even a dog bite, right? It's just the quick fangs. But if there's venom, then it's gonna swell. If you have venom, then it's gonna be those blood blisters that you see in the top or the redness or the swelling that you see there at the bottom. But just because you don't have it doesn't mean that there's no venom. Okay. Here you can see um, this is a, uh, somebody that was bit by a water moccasin while uh, they were out golfing. Um, you can see the blood blisters, barely any swelling, right? As opposed to this child here on the left who was bit by a water moccasin. I don't know if on your screens you can appreciate how swollen and echomotic the hand is. And it was swollen um, and echomotic up about halfway up the arm. But you see the other lines that I put there, and that's because the kid was smiling as long as sitting still. But as soon as I, I walked my fingers down the shoulder, and once I got to the elbow, it started screaming again. And that's because the pain was there. There was venom there that's spreading lymphatically. So you need to do a full assessment. And remember, of course, that there's a difference between pain and tenderness and not just spelling, right? If I invoke it or inflict it, that's something I'm doing, then that's tenderness. Pain is, oh, it just hurts here. This is a girl who she was a dancer, she was in Ocala National Forest and she was bit by a water moccasin. It took about an hour and a half to uh, get out of the park. She gets to the hospital, the hospital's like, all right, well, maybe you need anti-venom, but they're a little afraid. Well, just send her to Dr. Abo, 
in Gainesville, which is a two hour drive, but you also had to set up the whole transfer. So it took five and a half hours before she got to me. And this is the picture. Um, and that was a big delay. They're like, well, why bother using it? So you can see how echomotic her ankle is. Um, you can see the lines that I have in terms of the S for skin changes and then T for tenderness, P for pain and the time. And the time progression is really my vital signs. Um, she didn't even really have a cankle. It went from thigh to ankle, which I guess would be a thankle. Uh, but so this damage is permanent, right? We're trying to stop the progression. The only things that are reversible are systemic effects and lab effects. Um, but this skin changes is, you gotta stop it. Time is tissue, just like with the heart, just like with the brain, with heart attacks and strokes. She actually from now on has to buy two pairs of shoes because her feet are completely different sizes, um, which is gonna definitely throw everything off. Some more of the skin changes. But again, you can see these are all pit vipers and they don't all look the same. Right, so you don't have to have the major swelling. This person already was a vasculopath, as you can see just under the dog's head. Um, he actually has a AKA. Um, and this gentleman, they, they, he was bit by a diamondback and his hand was swollen and they marked skin changes and swelling up to his elbow and you can see there, but they completely missed the fact they said, well, it's a bloody toxin. Well, he was seizing and fasciculating above um, where it was swollen. So they missed those neurological signs because they didn't look. And then this is actually not my picture, um, not my toes and not my patient. However, um, this is something that was bit right around Oklahoma, Nashville, somewhere up in there. And they were bit by a copperhead. And there's a lot of debate, do you need to even treat a copperhead? Well, day one, you can see the red toe, slightly swollen, extremely painful, pain going up the foot. Discharged after just four hours, they thought it was a dry bite, um, pain got worse. Two days later, they follow up with their primary care doctor. It's getting more red, the red swelling, the pain is worse. Uh, so they start no fevers, they started antibiotics. The next day, the whole foot swollen, um, the, pain, the toe is just excruciating in pain, still no fevers, they change antibiotics. Well, the toe on the right um, is the same toe at day seven. Um, and all of this could be completely avoided if they um, just treat it appropriately and recognize the envenomation. So I get it, it can be a little tricky, um, but you can't be afraid of the cure. This gentleman who was raised, he's a blue collared worker, works with DPW. Um, he was cleaning up some storm debris, gets bit by a giant rattlesnake, a cane breaker, timber, and he goes to the hospital that's five minutes away. He goes to triage, says, I've got bit by a snake. The nurse looks at his hand, doesn't see any swelling, and says, go sit in triage. As he goes to sit down, he passes out. He was transferred to me, intubated on three pressors, heart rate of 160 on three pressors, his blood pressure with an A line was still 50 over 30. Um, and you can see the, the gross blood coming from his uh, Foley, not only blood thinners or anything like that. But you can see there's not even any swelling. There are no skin changes here, but he's still envenomed. And so the, that education is just, this is why I get on this and then why it's so important. This is him two days later. Uh, he had syncopies and that's why they cut on his face from his glasses. Uh, but the anti-venom just turned it all around, uh, off the pressers within an hour, extubated the next day, feeling great, Tylenol only for pain. This is a different guy who didn't get treatment right away, and you can see how swollen it is, and even the, the bite marks are oozing. He also, um, his IV sites were oozing blood through it because he just couldn't uh, control. He did survive. Um, we did get the anti-venom into him. Um, he just has some permanent problems um, from the skin damage. We do, of course, need to talk about a Florida man. Everyone asked me about it. I do have a white coat that says Florida manologist. Um, this is a kid, a teenager who was a lot thinner than me um, that went to kiss his pet copperhead, not copperhead, water moccasin um, that he was keeping in a pillowcase under his bed, hiding from his parents. Um, all that swelling, it, that is possible, um, could have been a real airway nightmare for him, as opposed to, and this is a little bit of a disturbing picture on this next one, I get a phone call from a fire chief saying that I have a 29-year-old male 
bit on the tongue by a rattlesnake. And first thing I said was, yeah, right. But he was telling the truth. Um, you can see, I'm hoping, I got an alert that my uh, headphones are dead. So hopefully you can hear me, right? Yeah, good. So you can see here his tongue very swollen. All that blood in the nose is not trying to nasally intubate him. That's just because he's bleeding out. Within 45 minutes, he's in DIC, basically. In fact, within 45 minutes, his first set of labs right here, if you take a look at his platelets, and he's got one platelet or a thousand platelets for every dwarf with Snow White, seven platelets. Um, he got the antivenom, and that picture on the right in the background is him actually 24 hours later. So what's the cure? After 1999, which actually the known snake bites in the United States went up by 243%, um, that we know by poison control, um, we had a very safe product that sheep derived um, that works for any pit viper in North America. This was until recently the only one that you could use. FDA approved, very safe. The worst side effects um, would be a, up to 4% of severe allergic reaction but if you actually look at it, the severe allergic reaction was not anaphylaxis. It was actually just severe hives in urticaria, which a little bit of Benadryl takes care of. Um, even if someone is in full anaphylaxis, they still need the antivenom. So you just treat the anaphylaxis and then continue. So Crofab, I like this old ad. I only have it in there because in the ad, if you look at the typography, I like the art of typography. And, um, but it also tells you all the things that the venoms can do, necrosis, loss of digits, ecchymosis, permanent sensory loss, coagulant abnormalities, pain, hypotension, and the whole point is to stop that progression. Now, there is another um, antivenom on the market. For the past two years, we also have, um, this is that serum sickness, that rash um, there. Um, we do have another one called Anavit that's on the market. Um, proud to say that actually the part of the reason why there's orange on the box is because my favorite color is orange and they heard how I complained that most of our medications in the U.S. are just black and white print but um, this is horse derived um, theoretically it's going to last in the blood a lot longer a longer half-life like 72 hours as opposed to eight um, and initially was only approved for rattlesnakes so if we didn't know what snake species it was or um, if it was a water moccasin or copperhead, we couldn't use this. Um, just April 1st of this year, um, FDA granted temporary approval of it. So I, at first, I didn't know if it was April Fool's joke. Um, personally, I just have not had the opportunity around here to use it um, on any of these others, but I'm a little iffy on the safety profile versus what I've been using for hundreds of bites um, the past few years. But when you use it, the, the research that it should work theoretically is there, but we can get pretty technical from including research that I did for Venom Week with Cobras, whether theory and test tube science is the same as clinical science. Now, if you call Poison Control Center because you have an envenomation, they're going to text you or uh, send you this algorithm. This algorithm was made by a bunch of really sm much smarter than me people, and it's the consensus on a unified algorithm how to treat pit viper bites across the US. Um, nice and easy, but you know, unless you're really familiar with each step of it uh, ahead of time, it can be very daunting looking at it. But overall, it's really important to assess. Are there signs of animation? Yes. Treat it an hour later. Check. Do I have control? And that's where a lot of people mess up. They don't have control and they think it's just a dose. This isn't 25 milligrams of HCTZ. This isn't just I have V-fib, so I do 300 milligrams of amiodarone or 100 milligrams of lidocaine. This is we're trying to gauge because the snakes don't come with meters. You can't flip the snake over and say, oh, he injected this much venom. Um, you're probably going to get bit if you try to do that. Um, so we're clinically trying to match it based on the labs and clinically what's going on and any systemic effects. But I do highlight that it says when to call a physician expert. Um, so you can call poison control. There's a hotline that's based out of Rocky Mountain Poison Control in Denver, um, specifically for CROFAB. You can call me or any other known experts. I'm just going to briefly get into um, coral snakes just in case, because this is another example of misnomers. Just because we've been doing things in medicine a certain way doesn't mean it's true. 
um, I can get into where backboards came from with orthopedic surgeons in the 1960s. And now we're realizing they're bad. So coral snake, um, there are three types in the United States. Uh, there's Florida, Texas, and Arizona. Arizona is not even medically significant. In Texas, where usually everything's bigger in Texas, um, you're, and they creep up a little bit into the, uh, sometimes in Oklahoma, but um, we only treat it if it's a severe envenomation. And Florida, if you even think that it's a coral that scratches you, you go ahead and you treat. I'm going to show you why. So on the left here is one of my lieutenants from the Venom team properly using gloves and a hook, and he's trained how to move these snakes, as opposed to Florida woman on Facebook picking up a snake and then saying, can anyone identify this snake for me? By golly, you shouldn't be touching snakes anyway, but especially venomous ones if you don't know what it is. Here are, uh, one of these snakes is the coral snake and the other is a, a known scarlet or milk snake um, mimicker. Um, the coral is the one on the right. Um, ironically, this is a bike rack near my old apartment when I used to live in Gainesville. So I only would lock my bike on the uh, left side of the screen because um, it's safe, right? Safety third. So, but there's, you know, a lot of things and a lot of people are going to say, well, Red on yellow, kill a fellow. Red on black, friend a jack. And that rhyme is not going to work. That rhyme, ugh, just stop using it. There's actually a video of these kids trying, holding a coral snake, and they're trying to say the rhyme. And they say the rhyme right while holding a coral snake. And then it bites them. And they needed anti-venom at $6,800 a vial, five vial dose. You do that math. Um, but that rhyme, red and yellow, only works on North American coral snakes. And only 90, and not even all of them, about 97%. So these both here are also coral snakes. How do I really know? Well, because I'm an expert on it, but they have the black tip and then yellow. But it's really hard to see their snout sometimes, especially they're coiled. So just don't mess with it. So that whole red on yellow, here's a better rhyme. And I know um, Kara's heard this. Uh, roses are red, violets are blue, don't touch the snake. Or you'll get somatic dysfunction. There you go. Didn't say it was a good poem. Just don't mess with the snakes. There's a lot of misnomers that they have to latch on and chew that is absolutely disproven. Um, they have to latch on for a long time. Not true. They can even just scratch. The thing is, these are a lapid, so they're in the same family as uh, cobras. So they have short fixed front fangs as opposed to those giant pit viper ones that retract. Um, and so they don't have as good of a mechanism, um, but all they need to do is is kind of scratch. There's a lot of people that are like, well, it can only bite here because the webbing in your fingers or your hand is the only thing small enough that it can bite unless it's a kid's toe. And that's, they're only usually bitten on the hand because it's somebody that's messing with the snake that they shouldn't be. So this here is 12 drops of coral snake venom. Um, so this is enough to kill six full grown humans um, if it had an easy mechanism to get two full drops in. Um, there's a lot of people that say that there is no anti-venom. There is. It's harder to get. Um, only three hospitals in Florida carry it, and otherwise that's why the venom response teams, we just bring it for free um, to help treat people. Um, but I had, this is a great example of a kid, because um, some people are like, well, maybe not use it, we're not sure, um, and then you wait. And all of a sudden, 12 hours later, they're suddenly paralyzed. Um, like, well, just put them on a ventilator and wait for the venom to wear off. Um, but that can be months. And this kid, this is Garrett. Um, his mother and he are very excited that they're part of this lecture. Um, he loves snakes, and he picked one up in a net. And then, as his mom said, uh, the snake is faster than Google. And it bit him uh, twice because he was starting to drop the snake, and he didn't want to hurt it. Um, immediately he's vomiting and retching and retching for hours despite a bunch of Zofran. They come right away. Um, there's a delay in, he's an hour and 20 minutes from a freestanding ER. Um, and then he's transferred, um, given a little bit of undance, Tron Zofran. And there was a delay in getting him anti-venom. I wanted him to get anti-venom immediately. Um, there's a lot of the things that happened and there was a major delay. Um, and he didn't get it until nine hours later. He was fine in the ICU, getting a nice neuro exam every hour, 
playing video games, and all of a sudden, at 11 and a half, 12 hours, this was his exam. Now, you can see here, he can barely keep his eyes open. Look up for me. I'm trying to do UMI. And what you're going to see on this next video, other than he can't keep his eyes open, is watch his eyes. He complained about double vision, but watch the double vision is because of what's called dysconjugate gaze. So symptom double vision, diplopia. Sign is dysconjugate gaze. Watch oh. his right, All right follow the finger compared to his other. He looks like an, uh, a right, chameleon it separates out. Up, down, over. Boom. Only one eye moves. Did you see it? This is what we call So that's what we call dysconjugate gaze. Um, he got antivenom, but this went on for a few days. This is him a couple days later, still unable to really open his eyes much. And a month and a half later, I had to bring him a T-shirt from the team. Um, went to revisit him, and he looks pretty good. But he said with his cute accent, he goes, Dr. Ben, you know what? I said, what, Garrett? He said, I still can't run full speed. And I'm like, can't run full speed? What are you talking about? You weren't, like, muscle wasting or anything like that. Well, subconsciously, when you're running, you always look down. And so when he would look down, he had for seven months – paralysis of one of his eyes just in looking down so whenever he would run and look down he would fall he couldn't run and play a recess for seven months so this is what i'm talking about where we're really trying to make a difference of permanent pain permanent dysfunction permanent disfigurement all right um we do have plenty of cobra bites um in the united states like i said i just helped treat one um in tulsa um, and I had to help them get antivenom um, shipped in uh, from other parts and places. Um, if you've seen the show Miami Inc., this gentleman was messing with the King Cobra, gets bit. Um, he sent me the picture. He survived. He was intubated immediately. We got him antivenom on board. We extubated him eight hours later. Um, he did end up losing half of his finger because of the necrotic stuff. Um, and interestingly, um, during his hospital stay, whenever he was symptomatic with ptosis, he would go into that ventricular rhythm of bigeminy. Um, so, of course, uh, physicians uh, didn't know what to do with this healthy, otherwise 29-year-old male um, who was in bigeminy. So they consulted cardiology who said, we're not cathing him. Um, and that was it. They wrote their consult note and they earned their boat or whatever they were going to pay with. Um, but you get a lot of wound issues. Again, not just neurotoxins. Here's the cytotoxins and cardiotoxins, right? And the last kind of case I want to show you is Taz. Now, I want to show you this particular. This is a, a monocled cobra. He's albino. That's monocle like the one circle on his back. And he bit this guy that was doing self-immunization. Now, he was bit with two fang marks. And this is a picture he took right away. Horrible pain. Um, and tingling. Um, on one of the fang marks, he used a venom extractor, the, that little fake commercial device, right? So this is an hour later, and you can see the separation of one spot um, towards the top of the screen where he did not use a venom extractor and down below. And look at this progression. He gets antivenom, the swelling goes down, um, it starts settling away. He's able to give me a thumbs up, but you see that little necrotic tissue um, that's all just because of the venom and the venom extractor continued through and he ended up with permanent dysfunction dysfunction on his dominant hand of the muscle tissue. He ends up with a big hole there, um, nerve damage, no feeling. So it's really important. So as I leave you at these last couple of minutes, um, what to do for an envenomation? Again, don't kill it. Don't bring it in. This guy actually was upset that he was bit. He killed it, and then he was so upset, he grabbed the top jaw and bottom jaw and tried to rip it in half, um, and he got envenomed again. So he got bit on both hands. Um, I don't need you to bring it to the hospital, especially if you they think that it's, it's dead. It might not be. They thought it was dead. Only he's bleeding. And uh, a biohazard Ziploc bag is not good enough. Oh, my gosh. This is when I was deployed for Hurricane Harvey in Texas. That is a copperhead. Oh no. Oh no is right. You know, so I, 
I know how to treat these without seeing what the snake even is. They can take a picture, fine. But like I said before, immobilize, keep it the level of the heart or higher, call a specialist, and note that leading edge. And I'm going to show you here what I was talking about, right? So the circ you try and take off the jewelry. I need to redo that picture. I, I get it. But um, put a circle at the time of when they were bit. And then see where there's any skin changes or swelling. And so let's say it goes halfway up the hand. So I put a line and an S with the time. Then I tr take my finger, after I do the pain also, it's pain about halfway at the wrist, put the P for pain. Then I take my finger and I go down. And once they start grimacing or they say, ow, I put a T for tenderness. Remember that difference between pain and tenderness. And I'm gonna do this every 15 minutes until I get control. These are the vital signs of envenomation and it can really tell me is the progression stopping is it slowing down or you might give antivenom and all of a sudden it's only tender in the down by the wrist and you see the re the reverse okay this a uh, couple snake bites that i recently had um and you can see the time going down and changing the spread and really gives me a lot of information as opposed to circumferential i have a number of different tricks um but this is what i'm talking about they're bit on the hand the hand is over the wrist, wrist is over the elbow, the elbow is over the shoulder, and up. Otherwise, you can flip them in the ICU bed, I don't care, and have their foot up in the air. Um, it just needs to be elevated to keep that concentration away from that limb and that swelling away. But don't shock it, don't use a tourniquet, don't excise it or any of those venom extractors. The ice, absolutely not. It vasoconstricts and concentrates the toxins there. Don't wait for symptoms and don't do a fasciotomy. Um, I recently had a seven-year-old girl who was bit, I think I already talked about this, but I don't know if it was when I was recording my backup, but um, she was bit on a Friday, gets antivenom given incorrectly. It's supposed to be given over one hour. Um, or if you have a little reaction to slow it down an hour and a half, but it's given to her over six hours. She's tr transferred to another hospital never gets maintenance dosing like she's supposed to. She then on Saturday, it's bulging, it's painful. Um, she's in a ton of pain, it's swollen. So the surgeon does a fasciotomy on her dominant hand. Um, they discharge her the next day. And on Monday morning, the swelling was worse, the pain was worse, it's oozing. And the fasciotomy where the sutures were, nice clean lines was just bulging like a hot dog in the microwave or on the grill. So the grandmother saw me on the news contacting me this is a few days later. She, I tell her, come to my hospital um, where I'm about to walk into right now. <laughs> um, and uh, I saw her. She's in horrible pain. I give her pain medicine. Within 30 minutes of giving her just six vials, that first dose, she went from being screaming horrible pain, bulging, bleeding, oozing, to playing with her Nintendo Switch and texting. Um, time is tissue. Time is relevant, but it's never too late. And you can't be afraid of giving the treatment. Um, so with that, I open it up um, if any of you have any um, questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Abo. That was uh, very uh, entertaining and educational. And I have to, I have to say, coming from uh, Northwest Oklahoma near Winoka, the Little Sahara Desert, we have an annual rattlesnake hunt. I think uh, you may get an invite to that this next year. Maybe we could do a, a wilderness med CME on site with some rattlesnakes. How about that? Yeah, sounds good. I, that I'm would be fun. Wilderness, but especially this, I would absolutely love to. That would be a lot of fun. Well, I appreciate you joining us. I appreciate the uh, material. And thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, I, do, uh, I do say see one um, comment. You said earlier that if a patient has anaphylaxis, they still need antivenin. If patient is severely allergic to horses and has history of severe asthma, do you have non-horse derived antitoxins for most venoms? That is a great question. Um, so I'm one of those people that's severely allergic to horses. Um, I've actually ridden more elephants um, in my travels than horses. Um, severe asthma, um, which has gotten better for me at least in case you're wondering, but um, the we can make antivenoms right now um, with horses, dogs, sheep. The only way this pain go by just through the skin here. The only available antivenom that um, exists 
um, that is not horse derived is crow fab, which is sheep derived. Um, unfortunately, and all the exotic stuff, and that's because horses produce so many antibodies and so much volume of blood. Um, even so, I would still give them the anti venom. There's a couple times where if I know that they're so allergic to to it that I will give them some epinephrine IM beforehand. But um, still, there there's no true contraindication to anti venom. But that's a that's a great question. That's that's the only one that exists, and uh, it is very expensive. But if you use it earlier, you end up using less. Um, so the overall cost of disability and everything's less. And I will say also, we extract the venom, we send it to Australia, which is a big island where they don't have mad cow disease. They use the sheep there, that and the sheep get better health care than I do. Um, here in Florida, um, they take their blood, the antibodies, they send it to the UK. They cleave the arms off the FC proteins, and then it comes. That's why it's so expensive, but it works so well and has like no reactions. Pretty amazing. Well, again, thank you so much, Dr. Abo, for, for joining us. Really do appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And um, yeah, I'm going to go fix my somatic dysfunction from leaning over my computer and go take care of patients in the ER. Again, I really right. appreciate you all and take care. Have a good day. Thank you. Our next speaker, Phyllis Arthur, we had at our summer CME and she had rave reviews, so we feel very fortunate to have her back. Ms. Arthur is Vice President for Infectious Diseases and Diagnostics Policy at the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. In this role, Ms. Arthur is responsible for working with member companies in vaccines, antimicrobial resistance, molecular diagnostics, and biodefense on policy, legislative, and regulatory issues. Prior to joining BIO, she worked in numerous marketing and sales positions for Merck and Company Inc. in their vaccine division. Over her 16th year career in vaccines, Ms. Arthur launched several exciting new vaccines in the United States and internationally, including the first HPV vaccine, Gardasil. Ms. Arthur received her BA in 1987 in economics and international politics from Goucher College and her MBA in 1991 from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. Please welcome Ms. Arthur. I'm really glad to be back with the OOA. We had a really great conversation before and I'm looking forward to updating you on what's happening with the COVID-19 vaccines. I'm sure you're all following this very closely and you know a great deal is happening uh, since we last chatted. So what I've prepared are some slides that go through some of the key activities that are happening for the COVID vaccines from the scientific and medical perspective. And then at the very end, I'll touch a little bit on some of the work we're doing at Bio to, make, to help make sure that people have confidence in the vaccines as so many different things are happening with these products and some of that can be can lead to questions, uncertainty, and we want to make sure people feel confident that they're getting a product that is working with them and is safe and effective. So obviously many of you know we're not through the pandemic yet. So I, I used this slide from a recent CDC meeting just to summarize where we are with the epidemiology of COVID-19 in the United States. The incidence is, is still quite high, 710 cases per 100,000 people. Um, younger women actually have the highest incidence of new infection. Hospitalizations, again, are still high. What's good to see is the proportion of hospitalizations in over 65 is going down. This is obviously extremely important for the patients, most likely have very serious consequences and death. But as you all know, there are certain geographies in the country where we're seeing an increase in hospitalizations of younger people under 50 and even under 40. And so we continue to need to vaccinate to keep those patients out of the hospital. Um, again, mortality and death is three in 100,000, still higher, of course, than we would like. Um, but again, deaths are decreasing in those people over 65. And the goal now is to keep people out of the hospital. Those who are infected get them treated more rapidly with some of the novel treatments out there. And of course, achieve very high immunization rates across the country so that we know people are protected and we can stop the transition of the virus into infections. So, vaccination in the US is going well. I think we should be very, very proud of how the health departments, governors, states are all handling this extremely important logistical, healing effort that they're doing. 
getting vaccines out in multiple different ways, getting them out through mobile clinics and FEMA set up sites and all the different pharmacies and hospitals and doctors' offices. And we've achieved a very good immunization rate across a host of different uh, populations of various ages. So you're seeing we've given, we've delivered about 300 million doses and vaccinated two, over 237 million, million doses have been given. Remembering that obviously the preponderance of these doses are the two dose Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. Most of this, at least Pfizer is probably about 10 or percent more of those doses than Moderna, but very high numbers of the two dose vaccines have been given. And what's exciting is to see the very high rate of the US population over 65 who have had at least one dose, 82%. We're really doing well in vaccinating the very high risk seniors. That's where a lot of the underlying conditions are that lead to hospitalization and death. And we're starting to see increasing numbers in those 18 to 64, but that's where we're going to have to do a lot more work in immunizing those populations. So I wanted to actually touch on the development that's happening still for COVID-19 products. Um, and we use this slide, it comes from our COVID pipeline tracker. I think I shared some data from the pipeline tracker when I first met with you. Obviously, as you all know, in late, uh, in, in late 2019, I think we're going to say 2019, in late 2019, we started to see this new um, acute respiratory illness of the virus come out of China and other parts of the world. We literally we, we started to see the sequence that was for this virus, gave it a name. That sequence was published, and very rapidly when that happened in January, companies started to work on various products to see if they could either prevent, treat the virus itself, or treat that maybe important consequences of viral infection. And you see this fantastic steep curve of companies around the world trying all the different kinds of products. To see if they would help with one of those one of those issues, and in particular, we had vaccines that were, were were able to be made quickly, get a really viable vaccine candidate, and start to look at clinical trials. But there are more vaccines behind the ex excellent vaccines we already have that could actually be new technologies that could be repurposed for the variants that could have easier use. Uh, so no one is done doing research on vaccines, antivirals, or treatments. We you see over 900 products around the world, a great majority of those actually being developed and originated in the United States. <laughs> I think it's important before I go on to the rest of the science and data to just reaffirm the commitment of the industry that I work with to the, the, the industry commitment to the scientific rigor, transparency, and of course, clinical diversity. And I think those are very important points to make sure we talk about and that the companies are very open and aware about their commitment to those issues. So in September of last year, another vaccine company CEOs actually did a public pledge published in the New York Times, uh, talked about on TV, where they pledged to always make the safety the well being, the efficacy, and the quality of these, these vaccines, their top priority. That the safety of the people who are going to receive these was the most important thing that we wanted to focus on as business leaders and as scientific leaders. These companies together have actually developed, launched, sold, manufactured, and researched over 70 novel, different novel vaccines, including the smaller companies that may not have products that have gone to market, but have products that were in the clinical research program beforehand that had at least hundreds if not thousands of patients in the So the, the company wanted to make sure they were demonstrating their, their, their commitment to clinical diversity, to the safety systems, to be transparent. And you saw a lot of data therefore, even leading up to their authorization on how many people in different racial and ethnic groups with different underlying conditions were included in the clinical trials so that every American can see themselves in the data. And that was the key goal. And each company that comes to have the data can see each other. So we're very fortunate we have several important EUAs or emergency use authorizations already in the United States. And I want to say that several of these, not just the vaccines, because it's important to know their products to both 
treat and handle the virus, and of course, treat some of the more severe consequences. How do you focus on the vaccines and antivirals for this sector? As you all know, three vaccines have been made. Um, the, the, the first two are um, mRNA vaccines, one from Pfizer and BioNTech, one from Moderna, and then the Janssen J &J vaccine is an adenovirus vaccine uh, that uh, has a different approach, but it is only one dose. In addition to antivirals, we obviously have remdesivir, which actually treats more severe um, when you're more severely infected with, with virus. And then you have the Regeneron and Lily Salara and Lily Lily Genshi monoclonal antibody, which are actually meant to treat earlier disease. So when you get that diagnosis that you are positive for COVID 19, very quickly after that diagnosis or, or uh, very early in the onset symptom, these patients actually can have a relatively short infusion of an alcohol antibody, and those antibodies have been shown to reduce the likelihood of hospitalization by between 60 and 80 percent. So, a very important option to treat later stage disease, but more importantly, to treat earlier stage disease and keep people out of the hospital, um, thus saving those, those, those severe consequences and the severe costs, and leaving space in the healthcare system for those who may need to be hospitalized. In addition, there's two other vaccines, as you know, behind the three. The AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine is also an adenovirus vaccine, that is two doses. And then the uh, company based here in Maryland, Novavax, has a protein subunit vaccine. It's meant more in the way that the HPV vaccine is made with nanoparticles that emulate the virus. Their phase three is completed. Um, both of these vaccines are planning to submit their emails in the short term. And they've also been sharing data on how they perform against the various companies. So just to show obviously worldwide, more vaccines even behind these, I need to actually add some other new vaccines that come on our team that are looking at putting multiple variant strains into one particular uh, vaccine. Some of those vaccines are starting to enter the clinic. And so I think we will see in the next year vaccines that might have multiple strains in them, like the Orange to the vaccine, or that could be offered up as boosters on top of vaccination to cover the variants of the So I, I want to, of course, touch on one of the key issues that happened most recently with these vaccines, which is the evaluation of an adverse, a serious adverse event with the Janssen J &J vaccine. I'm sure as a medical professional, you've been answering lots of questions, you want to have these questions yourself, about how this, what is happening with this vaccine and, and how you should be talking to the patients about it. So obviously in mid-April, the CDC and FDA released a statement announcing the cause of, of the use of the Janssen J, J vaccine while they evaluated some data around a rare blood clot issue that was showing up with the vaccine. Um, what's unique about this particular side effect was it, it's not this kind of blood clot that you see with COVID-19 cases. This is more of an interesting combination of two relatively uh, counter issues. Uh, a, a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, a PDFC, coupled with low levels of blood platelets or thrombocytopenia. The reason they released the cause, therefore, was to make sure clinicians knew how to treat this. Doctors seeing a CDST without the low blood platelets might actually treat it with heparin. And in actuality, heparin was exacerbating the problem and leading to uh, adverse consequences. So it's very important to stop, take a look at the data, understand the, how the cases are presenting, understand the time and the relationship to the timing of the J&J vaccine. Where was this happening? Was it happening early after vaccination? Was it happening later after vaccination? And understand the subpopulations that might be impacted. To do that, the CDC convened two, um, two meetings of the advisory committee on immunization practices, the ACIP. They met twice, they met right after the pause, and they met uh, last week, and really did a deep dive on the data. They had about 17 or 20 internal meetings in between these two meetings to make sure they had views of the data, looked at all the possible cases within the um, adverse event reporting system in the US, and that they could really understand what were the similarities, what were the in the end, that evaluation led to new clinical guidance for physicians, um, new information that needs to be shared with patients for what to look for after vaccination, but a recommendation to continue the use of the vaccine 
in person or over 18 years old. And they had a conversation about whether or not they should say, of, like, you're of old years over 15, or women should be more cautious. And they decided to go with the straightforward recommendation because the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risks. I have touched the information on the cases thus far. Remember, we've seen these cases, um, 15 cases in 8 million doses of the vaccine delivered in the United States and did it. So it is a rare but serious adverse event, and it's important for certain patients to be aware of what to look for and to take the appropriate action if they see the side effects, generally nine to 15 days after their dose of the vaccine. And it's important for physicians to know how to treat. And so I included in my slides just a couple of, of key uh, documents people can look at. I know the slides to see the page. These things are you know, for your use. Um, the FDA has changed the document that's given to providers and patients to reflect this information. So, it, and it talks about both how many cases there were, the ages, as well as what doctors and physicians should look for in terms of evaluating patients and treating them. And I also included a document from the American Society of Hematology that specifically lays out the management process for these kinds of patients, particularly if they show up with the sorry, side effects that you have a plot. Um, you take the actual platelet factor and make sure you understand if you're having the other part, the low platelets, consult hematology and treat them with non heparin coagulants and potentially remove them. So we need to change. The pause, while certainly disruptive to everyone, was an important opportunity to evaluate the data and recommit to the vaccine with a clear direction on how to use it and how to So, I'm going to transition to some data that's uh, just sharing some data with you on what's, up, what's showing up as the vaccines get more used. These are obviously the most important questions we all have. How are we looking at the duration of our human immunity? And I've included press releases. Or, or links to articles done by the various companies on these issues. As you know, companies are continuing to study all this data as are independent analysts. Um, Pfizer and BioNTech at the beginning of April actually confirmed that they have safety data and efficacy data for six months of those two. Um, that they, looking at the efficacy, they're seeing that it still retains the strong efficacy saw at launch. 91% against severe standard COVID-19 cases and 100% effective against severe disease. Moderna published a study in the New England Journal that actually looked at the persistence of the antibodies, uh, the neutralizing antibodies, and found that they had similarly very strong robust antibody persistence post those two up to six months. Then you'll see many more publications like this from these companies as they continue to track patients within the clinical trials. For long term durational protection. And this work is part of the overall work going on with, um, the, with the government to establish hopefully a form of protection for these vaccines so we understand the duration of immunity and the protection model. Obviously, we have a lot of questions about when will we be getting the vaccine in those under 18 or 16. So the Pfizer product is uh, authorized down to 16. Moderna down to age 18. Both companies are aggressively doing clinical trials in younger ages. Pfizer actually has already submitted an amendment to their authorization to the FDA for 12 to 15 year olds. And then we'll pursue clinical trials in younger patients. Moderna has enrolled, are enrolled in March, their study of pediatric patients six months to 12 years old, and also has studies of, of 12 months to 18. So we will see in the next couple of months quite a bit of data around the performance of these products in adolescents. This particular trial from Moderna, six to 12 months old, they are actually looking at those ranges in that study to see whether you can achieve the same high immunogenicity but with a lower dose of the product. So I think we'll see quite a number of really good results from these products in younger ages, potentially over the course of this summer and in so I think one of the other issues that everyone obviously focusing on is the variants of concern and the variants of interest. These are something I think what was something we didn't really factor in how much these coronaviruses 
would evolve in the short time that we would experience the pandemic. Historically, coronavirus has not been shown to vary that much, not like flu, but I think many feel that because of the high level of cases, the long individual period, the long time period when these people are sick, the, the virus itself has this opportunity to mutate, and the advantageous um, variants that are more transmissible or more real, more virulent or more serious tend to then start to dominate. You see, I, I, I use this slide because you hear people talk about these variants by both number and by both country of origin. Um, I'm showing them this way so you see them in, in both plates. And then I'll share a table with you that looks at them by number, knowing that um, the UK variant, the South African variant, and this New York variant are three that are particularly of concern and are showing up in different locations. So the CDC is tracking the variants, they're sequencing uh, the, the virus from cases to make sure we understand not just which variants are rare and the predominance of them in the country, but also so that over time we can do the real world efficacy calculation for how the vaccines perform against these variants as the epidemiology shifts in the United States and worldwide. So you see the UK strain, the B1117, is the predominant strain, but other strains like New York, um, vaccine slash six, and um, African and South African still have a pretty serious hold in the US and, and are important variants of concern to watch over the next. To that end, the companies therefore are sharing information about how we perform, uh, how the efficacy performs against these various variants. Knowing that all of the companies are doing their clinical trials globally and continue to do so, we have a combination of data on their clinical trial performance against these, these different variants, but also obviously the real world evidence looking at cases as the vaccines get used in areas with different strains as the dominant strain. So there are multiple different studies demonstrating both in vitro and, of course, in, in real world evidence the, 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 um, the high efficacy maintained by the Madeira and Pfizer BioNTech vaccine against the New York and the South African variants. Madeira also shared data in a publication about their um, efficacy against the UK and South African variants in January. So while there was some reduction in neutralizing antibodies against the South African variant, they still had. They still have um, high level comparable to Pavlov's classes. Pfizer just published a study in February in the journal about their neutralizing antibodies against the South African variant, but it's also very interesting. The Janssen JJ team, actually, at the most recent ACIP meeting, also shared data on their pivotal studies. At, which were done worldwide, and in particular, were done in countries where other variants of concern were predominant, were more predominant than the wild virus or the UK strain. And they found that they also had very strong um, efficacy of the vaccine against severe COVID and against um, confirmed cases uh, in the presence of the South African and the UK strain. So, uh, one dose BJ vaccine still provided 100% protection against hospitalizations, both in South Africa, um, as well as in other countries. And so I think we're seeing right now that these vaccines still are quite protective against the strains and the variations that we're seeing. And that is very encouraging as we try to get immunizations up to the early years. Still, I think the companies and the CDC and HHS realize it's going to be very important to start to plan for potential boosters for these vaccines. We have about six or seven months of immunization data. And so Pfizer and Madeira in particular are actively looking at different variations of their vaccine for either boosting the wild type vaccine we all just received or making variant specific vaccines if needed. And I think the goal over time would be to essentially, like I said, for flu, have multiple variants in a vaccine and boost people to make sure uh, immunogenicity and protection goes on the long term. So Pfizer announced in February that they're starting two H cohorts with uh, a booster regimen. Um, Moderna has four different experiments. So 
boosting as well as boosting various specific vaccines and a combination of vaccines. And this is allowing them to also test using a lower dosage of the vaccine in that booster. So again, this year we'll see a lot of data on these boosters because we need to be ready in case we need to start manufacturing boosters in addition to the base vaccine to give to everyone who's been vaccinated. I think it's exciting as well to see the real world evidence that we're getting out of countries that have reached a high level of immunization. So as you may know, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine was used in Israel um, and, and they've achieved a very high level of immunization such that they are actually going back to um, normal activity. When you look at the single shot activity, uh, the first dose uh, and how that was protected as well as the protection soon afterwards, and found that even the first dose of the vaccine was highly protective against any infection measured by the blood sample, symptomatic infections, of course, hospitalizations and severe disease. And so we are starting to see that the number of cases in those countries that have achieved high levels of immunization are really dropping dramatically. And you're seeing not just prevention of disease, but some data starting to show prevention of asymptomatic infection and potentially transmission. Indeed, we will see many more publications on this issue from those countries that are achieving high rates as they look to see if the vaccine can really interrupt the spread of the virus itself, which would be extremely encouraging in terms of our ability to go back to full normal life. So I presented a lot of data and I hopefully you'll have questions and, and there'll be some data that you can continue to explore as well. And I think all of these changes and all the movements of all this data can make people feel anxious and concerned about vaccines. And certainly the pause that happened for J last week caused many to rethink whether they want to get vaccinated. Now, it's, it's, it's very incumbent on us, I think, as people who believe strongly in the data and vaccines, to help people get through the questions, answer their questions, and help them ascertain the risk benefit of, of getting any, any of the free vaccine. Um, in the presence of the continued presence of, of, of the pandemic and surges in certain geographies of So what we did at Bio is actually partnered with a, a, a 12 or 15 um, multicultural or uh, age-based organizations that really are trusted messengers to key populations. And those groups have been doing educational activity, building content, and actually doing outreach in local communities to make sure that people have the answers to the questions that they need and that they're getting them from trusted messages, whether that's a faith based organization, um, organizations representing communities of color, organizations representing advocacy for those in Asian communities. These different groups are out there making sure they're providing lots of information um, from doctors, nurses, pharmacists. And, um, and regular neighbors to people that they can trust and that they can see and, and that they can back believe. We've also launched a website, and I'll leave this as our last slide. It's a resource that we certainly hope you'll use. Um, it, it actually launched in December. It's a website called covidvaccinefacts.org. It's set up with questions and answers. Uh, so the answers are written in kind of like a high school level and a little less. And it's meant to help people just get answers sourced uh, on their key questions and add questions as the data is forward. We also have several videos that explain the side effects. We have animations, and we have videos of experts answering key questions. We have a few nurses and a few doctors just explaining the side effects, explaining um, how the vaccines work. And these, are, these things are meant to give people an easy place to go to get the information they need um, so they will be. Of your comfortable getting the vaccine. So I'll stop there. Uh, I know I've sent you a lot of information, but I hope that you see that we're making excellent progress in getting the, the long term data around these vaccines and they are enduring in their side effects, safety, and their efficacy. And I um, But the M why are they, someone asked why are they calling mRNA blood cell vaccines? Um, so I'll try to 
I think actually mRNA is an interesting platform. I hope I'm answering the question correctly. You know, mRNA can also be used to create therapeutics um, for immuno-oncology. Uh, it can be used both as a preventing and as a treatment. And so you will see, um, if you look at the portfolio of those companies that have mRNA-based products, you will see that they have products in their portfolio that can be used as a treatment for, um, for, for uh, a certain kinds of cancer, but also could be used to teach the body to uh, make antibodies to prevent against against infectious disease. It is a highly flexible platform that can be used both as a drug and as an vaccine. I hope that answers the question. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Arthur. Um, very, very informative. Um, appreciate you joining us again for this. And um, I'm sure that uh, uh, many, many things to learn, many, many questions, but uh, you've answered you've answered a lot. I appreciate that. Thank you. And the slides are available. I tried to source them. So please feel free to look at the various press releases and, and journal articles as well. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you very much. Well, next up is Kelly S. Andrzejczyk Beatty, DO. Dr. Andrzejczyk Beatty is a psychiatrist in McAllister, Oklahoma, and is affiliated with the Choctaw Nation Healthcare Center in Tallahena. She graduated with honors from the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine in 2010. Welcome, Dr. Andrzejczyk Beatty. Hello, I'm Dr. Kelly Andrzejczyk Beatty, and my presentation today is Do No Unconscious Harm, Implicit Biases in Medicine. Disclosures, I have no actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this program or presentation. Our objectives today, number one, is to identify implicit biases in medicine. Number two, explain how implicit biases can influence medical decision-making and medical outcomes. Number three, identify ways to decrease implicit biases in medicine. Okay, I'm gonna start off with this little riddle. Many of you might have already know or have heard of this. The father and son get in a car crash and are rushed to the hospital. The father dies. The boy is taken to the operating room and the surgeon says, I can't operate on this boy because he's my son. How is this even possible? The answer to this is his mother is the surgeon. So if you actually miss that, which totally stumped me years ago, the first time I heard that, which is interesting because I'm a female physician. This is why we're talking about implicit biases today. This is, this is a reason why this needs to be addressed because these types of things are just ingrained in us. We don't even think about it. So we're gonna do another little exercise too. So I want you to imagine this scenario. You're getting off work and you're rushing. Let's say you're going to a conference. You're, you're rushing, you get off work a little late. You grab a taxi to go to the airport. You get to the airport and you realize it is so, so busy. You barely think you're gonna make your flight. You hear them paging you overhead. You get through security, you get down to the gate. They let you board. Immediately as you're boarding, they close the gate. So you made it on the plane, you get in there. You walk into onto the plane and you're greeted to, by the pilot and the flight attendant. You take your seat, you arrive at your destination. You have such a hectic day, you decide to go to a really posh restaurant for dinner. And at the restaurant, you're sitting there and you overhear the couple next to you celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. Okay, now I want you to think about the scenario that we just talked about. What race or gender was your taxi cab driver? What about the flight attendant? Was the flight attendant an African-American male flight attendant? What about the pilot? Was it a female Caucasian? Was the couple at the restaurant a biracial gay couple? The answer to those are probably no. You probably thought or tend to imagine what's familiar to us or most like us, most similar to us, or a stereotype. Does that mean that we're racist? Not necessarily. It means we have these ingrained responses and it's, they're just unconscious. And so we need to make them conscious. We need to become aware of it because those unconscious 
thoughts and responses can influence our attitudes and treatment of people. So here we're gonna go over the definition and the history of implicit bias. We're gonna go over explicit and implicit. Explicit, exactly what it says. It's conscious, you're, it's, you're aware of the prejudice. It, that's overt racism and racist comments. I mean, it's pretty no, it's pretty out there. Implicit on the other hand, it's this ubiquitous, autonomic, reflexive, unconscious response. These feelings and beliefs can differ from the actual explicit bias and conscious attitude. So you can say explicitly, I'm not racist, but implicitly actually have some racial biases. So what does this mean? This actually means that good people can discriminate. Good, good intentioned people can have prejudice that are unconscious to them. So we're gonna go over the history of implicit bias. So why do we even have Im implicit bias? Why are these ingrained things in us? So according to evolutionary psychologists, they believe that we developed the implicit bias as a protection, protective mechanism. So back in the day, if you were out hunting and you came across an animal that you've never encountered before, they would, you would just assume it was dangerous. So either you would fight it or you would flight. And so anything that was unfamiliar to them was automatically labeled suspicious or dangerous. And the problem is that can still occur in our heads to this day. And implicit bias can begin at a very, very young age. So even at age three, they've shown that there's pro-white bias in children that are age three and older. And that's because of repeated reinforcement on social stereotypes. So they're overhearing these things, mom and dad, other people, and it kind of gets ingrained, even though they don't even understand it. And simply knowing about a stereotype can distort the processing of information about individuals. So, and that actually has been proven in multiple randomized controlled studies. So let's talk a little bit about the history of implicit bias in medicine. It's, it's interesting and shocking. And, and so I don't know if anyone's familiar with this picture, but um, this depicts Dr. Sims, you know, the father of modern gynecology. Uh, he's been known to, he created the uh, speculum, the modern day speculum. Um, the Sims position is named after him. And he was best well known for repairing uh, vesicovaginal fistulas. And how he would do this is he would operate on enslaved women. Now, back in the day during slavery, some women, some slaves were just producing babies left and right. They were having babies, the babies were growing up enslaved um, on the farm. And so they were, they were just producing more workers. And so if there was something wrong with these women that were pretty fertile, that were reproducing, they wanted to get them fixed so they could continue to use them in such a way. And so what happened is back then when Dr. Sims was a physician and many other physicians of that time, they would do operations on slaves without anesthesia. You heard me right, without anesthesia. Back then, many physicians believed that African-Americans had a higher pain threshold, and so they didn't need analgesics. And one of these women, the woman pictured here, she's named Anarka. She apparently endured 30 procedures under the hands of Dr. Sims. And once Dr. Sims perfected the fistula reconstruction, he ended up moving to New York and opening a practice that provided the surgery for Caucasian females, but they were given anesthesia. The Tuskegee syphilis experiment, I'm sure many people have heard of this, lasted from 1932 to 1972. So, <laughs> What they did is back in 1932, there was no known treatment for syphilis. And then they recruited 600 African-American males in Mason County, Alabama. And they were enrolled because they were promised free medical care. 
And of those 600, 399 men had latent syphilis and 201 had no disease at all. And so they were monitored by healthcare workers, but they were only given placebos like aspirin and mineral supplements. But 15 years into the experiment in 1947, it was already determined that penicillin became the recommended treatment for syphilis, but the participants were not given penicillin, none of them. Instead, in order to track the disease's full progression, researchers provided no treatment for the African-American. And even if they were experiencing severe health problems like mental impairment, blindness, and then some succumbed to death, they still didn't receive penicillin as the treatment. This study was done by the government too. And years later, the government apologized for it. And the last survivor was, the survivors were given, um, they actually went to court and everything and they were awarded money, but it's just, from that time, because of this study, a lot of uh, ethical things in research have, have, have come to fruition because of that. But, okay, the last part of the history of, meta, of implicit bias, I'm actually gonna bring a more modern look to it. This is Serena Williams, and a lot of people know Serena Williams, a famous tennis athlete. And she had a postpartum complication. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because she made a big deal about this and shed some light on the prejudice within the medical care system, especially with African-American females and the postpartum phase. So postpartum, Serena Williams was telling her nurse that she was short of breath and she went up and said she needs a CT scan and a heparin drip. I know as physicians, we love to hear patients tell us what they need, but the reality is back in 2011, Serena suffered from pulmonary embolism and was hospitalized. So she was already a high risk and she knew the warning signs. So her nurse thought she was confused on the pain medication and tried to redirect her and finally got the doctor to come in and they did a Doppler. And she kept saying, I don't need a Doppler. I need a CT scan and a heparin drip. And she kept saying that. And so she finally got the CT scan and a heparin drip because she did have a pulmonary embolus. But the thing is, she fell within the 50,000 women, which this is estimated, research actually thinks it's on the lower end, 50,000 women in America who deal with dangerous or life-threatening pregnancy-related complications. Black women are dispor disproportionately likely to face these complications, and they're also more likely to fall victim to America's ongoing maternal mortality crisis. There's three to four times more likely than white women to die from pregnancy related complications. So that was a close call for Serena, but she has spoken openly to a lot of different venues in regards to her experience postpartum. And this is a well-known athlete, wealthy, and she really had to, to fight for her medical care or for someone to listen to her. So different categories of implicit biases in medicine. There's race and ethnicity. I have that highlighted because that's the one most of my examples are going to derive from. I do have some other examples, but this is, we could probably talk for two full days just on that. And then sexual orientation is another implicit bias. Gender, weight, age, social, economical status, disability, height, mental health diagnosis. If someone comes in with a mental health diagnosis in their chart. So here's an interesting thing. The, in 2020, the New England Journal of Medicine published a paper called The Hid Hidden in Plain Sight, Reconsidering the Use of Race Correction in Clinical Algorithms. So we're gonna go over some of these clinical algorithms that have a race correction, and we're gonna discuss whether or not these should still be in place or what the reasoning is behind it. So in cardiology, the American Heart Association get with the guidelines heart failure risk scores. So it predicts the risk of death in patients admitted to the hospital for heart failure. What it does though, you automatically get three points added to any patient identified as non-Black. So if you're a Caucasian, if you're non-Black, you get three points added, which then increase your risk and you become higher risk potentially. So does this mean that all Blacks are low risk for heart failure? 
the American Heart Association doesn't have a reasoning as to why they're three points added. So in 2019, a study demonstrated that Black and Latino patients presented to a Boston ER in heart failure, and they were less likely than white patients presenting in heart failure to be admitted to the cardiology services. Okay, nephrology. We have race-corrected EGFR. And this is the rationale behind this is simply because African Americans have more muscle mass and therefore they secrete more creatinine in their blood. And so we have to correct for that. But why is it that African American in our country have a higher rate of end stage kidney disease and death due to kidney failure than the general population? So are we delaying their care and treatment because of the corrected GFR? That's a great question. And again, there's, it's thought that they secrete more creatinine in their blood, but are, are we looking, are we doing these studies again? Are we checking into these things? I understand that at one point, we probably don't want to send people to specialists if they don't need to, because it's, the calculation is incorrect. But then what about when they're actually the ones that are suffering the most because of end-stage kidney disease? So are we actually not catching these patients anymore because we're correcting for it when really we're doing them an injustice because it shouldn't be corrected at this point? And medicine evolves. I mean, we change. Most of us are overweight. Things have changed. So I do think that these things need to be taken, taken into consideration again and maybe reevaluated. So obstetrics, obstetrics, the VBAC algorithm. So a vaginal birth after cesarean section, there's an algorithm and it predicts a lower likelihood of success for anyone identified as African-American or Hispanic. So non-white US women continue to have higher rates of C-section than white women in the US. And if we know that, then there's more potential for complications because of the C-section, because it's surgery. Other things on that scale mention if you're married, uh, what your stat income status is, and those are factored into the algorithm for VBAC. Urology, they have a stone score. Stone score predicts the likelihood of kidney stones in patients who present to the ER with flank pain. And there's a section labeled origin slash race. And that factor will add three points to a patient identified as non-Black, again, giving you a higher score that you're at a higher risk for predicting kidney stones. So again, it looks like the Caucasian patients are getting rated higher and or the African-American and Latino patients are getting rated lower Either way, we are missing something because if African-Americans are still succumbing to these issues and not getting the medical treatment early enough, the interventions early enough, then maybe we should take a look at these algorithms. Also in neurology, there is a new model for predicting UTIs in children, and it assigns, again, a lower risk to those children identified as fully or partially Black. So some examples of implicit biases in medicine, in cardiovascular disease in African-Americans. So African-Americans are less likely to receive evidence-based care for stroke, heart attack, and heart failure. Pain treatment in the emergency department for African-Americans and Hispanics. African-Americans and Hispanics are less likely to receive pain medications than whites, even for acute injuries like bone fractures. When they do receive analgesics, they are at a lower dosage than white patients, despite having higher pain scores. Suicide risk assessment in the elderly. Suicidal elderly patients, physicians actually, all across the board, physicians are less likely to address and take seriously suicidal ideation in this age group, even though those 85 and older have the second highest rate of suicide of any age group. Joint replacement in women, Women are three times less likely to be referred for a total knee replacement than men, even when clinically indicated. 
COPD diagnosis in women. Women are less likely to be diagnosed with COPD than men, despite having similar histories and medical exam findings. They're told that they're given the diagnosis of asthma. Maternal and child health out outcomes in African-American females. We talked a bit about this already, but African-American are women have worse outcomes in maternal and child health than white women. Even so, there was a study that showed that black women with the highest education income and wealth still receive and, and have worse outcomes than white women on the lowest end of the socioeconomic strata. That is, that says something, something is going on. So when I talk about this implicit bias, I'm talking about not just physicians, nursing staff, everyone, everyone in the medical field needs to do this implicit bias training. And then there's psychotic disorder diagnosis in African-American and Latinos. So African-Americans are three to four times more likely to be diagnosed with a psychotic disorder than Caucasians. And Latinos are three times more likely than Caucasians to be diagnosed with a psychotic disorder. So it wouldn't be 2021 or, it just, if we didn't mention COVID, it just, it just doesn't even seem right. So we have to bring up some COVID numbers. So I'm gonna talk about COVID-19 a year ago, almost exactly a year ago in March and April, the numbers for some larger cities. And then we're gonna talk about the most recent numbers that was posted uh, over by the CDC. So COVID-19, so African-Americans, this is a year, a year ago, African-Americans were more likely to be, to die uh, of COVID-19. And so in Chicago, 50% of the COVID-19 cases and nearly 70% of the deaths involved Black people. But at that time last year, Black people only made up 30% of the population. And deaths were concentrated in five neighborhoods on the South side. And in Louisiana, 50%, I'm sorry, 70.5% of the deaths occurred among Black people. But they only represent 32.2% of the population, of the state's population. And then in Michigan, 33% COVID-19 cases and 40% of the deaths were in African-Americans. But the state population in Michigan was only 14% of African-Americans. So something's going on there. And that was again last year's when it, we were kind of getting into the peak of things. And then John Hopkins University and American Community Survey, they, they showed 131 predominantly black counties in the US and the infection rate was 137.5 per 100,000 and death rate was 6.3 per 100,000. That's more than three times higher of an infection rate than predominantly white counties. So underrepresented minorities are developing COVID-19 infection more frequently and dying disproportionately. Another thing to kind of go along with COVID, and this isn't really an algorithm, but it's something that we use all the time is a pulse, pulse ox. So pulse oximetry. So there was a new study that came out and it showed that the pulse ox can actually overestimate the oxygen levels 3.6% of the time in whites, but it overestimated the oxygen saturation 12% of the time in black patients. So again, more, more than three times as often in blacks than whites. So is this part of the problem too? Are we getting faulty readings for, for one reason or another? Do we need to look at our technology that we're using? Do we need to update it? Do we need to see, or, or at least be aware of that so that when someone's presenting and they're short of breath and they're, they have labored breathing, but you're saying, well, no, your pulse ox is totally fine. You're, you're fine. They did this study and they were, then they did ABGs and showed that it wasn't. And so that's the big thing now is pulse oximetry, a thing we're using to measure we're, we're using it as an objective measurement is incorrect. Is that adding to the fact of COVID-19 deaths in African-Americans or people of darker skin? 
So here's the most recent COVID-19 and race information. This what came directly from the CDC website, uh, and this was updated April 23rd, 2021. And so it shows it's all, all of this is in comparison to white non-Hispanics. And so it shows the cases, amount of hospitalizations, and the death rate. As you should, so we have American Indian or Alaska Native non-Hispanic persons, Asians, Black or African American, and then Hispanic and Latinos. And you see the cases actually have gone up for two times likely Hispanic, 1.6 times more likely than Caucasians for the American Native population. And then we look at the death rates. American, American Indians have really had a high death rate um, since COVID started at 2.4, 2.4 times greater than Caucasians death rate. Asians is one times more likely, Black or African Americans 1.9, and then Hispanics and Latinos 2.3. These numbers are pretty staggering. Okay, I know what you're gonna say, but doc, I know, I know I'm not biased. I just know it. I'm telling you, I'm not biased. Has anyone ever taken the Harvard Implicit Association test? If you haven't, I strongly, strongly encourage you to do so. So I took this test. And so Harvard, Harvard will actually, if you fill out the form and they keep track of who's an MD and DO because they're trying to extrapolate this data and they're trying to get some better numbers on implicit biases in physicians. And they ask you your gender and everything too and your age. And you, then you log on, you, you pull up and you get to choose which type of test you wanna do. So there's multiple tests. There's, there's race, there's gender. I did a few of them. And the first one I did, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do gender. I mean, I'm a working female. Why would I think the female should always stay at home and do all the, the house things and this and that? So I log on and I do, I do the test and the results come out that I, I am somewhat implicitly biased. And, I, and it just, I couldn't wrap my head around that because I thought that doesn't even make sense because that's not, nothing that I believe, like consciously that I believe. So just to give you an idea what this looks like. So what they do is they give you different categories and they have you use your keyboard and hit a certain button on the right or the left. And it'll say, when you see a good, this is for the race one. So this is showing African-Americans versus European-Americans. And it's good, bad, African-American, European-Americans. And so you'll go through and it'll say, hit the button on the right or the button on the left if you if you see a good word or a bad word and, and then you alternate. And then if you see an African-American face, you know, hit the left button. If you see a Caucasian face, hit the right button and then you switch it. And then they pair them. So they pair them like this bad or European Americans, good or African Americans, and you press E or I, and you have to do this as fast as you can, because that's the thing. That's how it's tracking the unconscious, right? You're not sitting there thinking about it. They want you to do this as quick as possible. And so whatever pops in your head is what, what you do. And so I really, I cannot encourage you enough to log on there and try this because you'll be pretty, pretty surprised. I thought, Okay, well, I don't, I don't consider myself racist. I don't consider myself, I didn't think I had implicit biases, uh, especially towards race. I'm a psychiatrist. I see all walks of life. It doesn't matter your, your age, your gender, your race, your none of that stuff. Your socioeconomical status doesn't, doesn't matter. And it showed that I was slightly, had a little implicit bias. So it'll show the rating. I should have taken a picture of that. It'll show you on a little spectrum. And so right down, dead set in, in the middle is neutral. So you don't have a, an, an implicit bias at all. And then it'll show like just a mild, moderate, severe, and it'll show you where you rank along there. So again, I really, really think that it, it's very interesting to kind of get in your psyche and, and see these things that you aren't even aware of. And But to bring it to the consciousness so that then we can deal with it and address it and be more cognizant of it and pick those things out. And so they did some participants. Of, one of the studies showed 2,535 website participants who reported to have a medical degree, an MD or a DO, and they took the Harvard Implicit Association test. 
And the presence of pro-white bias was significant among physicians of all racial groups, except African-Americans. African-Americans were neutral. While women showed less implicit bias than men overall, they were still not neutral. African-Americans, female or male, were neutral. Okay, so what do we do as individuals? So now that this is made aware, now that we're aware of this, what do we do with this? What Awareness is a big part, okay? Now we're bringing it to our conscious. That's the first step. And then there's some accountability. So let other people know you are aware of your biases and ask them to call you out or identify it if you're falling into that and not even aware of it. Or ask them if they're seeing that the way you're treating a patient or someone else, it's different than another patient. Ask them, be, be accountable for our actions. We need to sit down and have these crucial conversations. They're uncomfortable, yes, but they're needed. This will also help inspire other people to be accountable too. So education, so we think we'll just do this little lecture, this will be enough. However, that's not the case when it comes to implicit bias. We can do as much education as we want, but we have to actually do things. And we can be, it's made to our awareness, but we then have to follow through with it. So they, but they did do, it can, it can help somewhat. So the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, did a study on this that 25% of the faculty, when they attended a 2.5 hour interactive workshop on gender bias, that there were a significant increase in self-reported actions to promote gender equality at three months after the exercise. So at least we're getting it in our brains. We're starting to think about it. We're starting to process this. Another thing is perspective taking. Find a common shared interest with your patient. Try to find some commonality. Uh, really try to get in their head or walk in their shoes. Think to yourself, what did it take for the patient to get here? Does he or she have to take public transportation? Do they have to take time off of work? Do they have to find childcare? That can help you develop some empathy for them and appreciate what they're doing to try to get to see you. This reminds me of when I was in residency, I worked at a free clinic for one of my rotations and the free clinic, one of my patients was running late all the time. And she told me the one day she takes, she would have to take three different buses just to get to the clinic, even though she only lived probably six miles away. She had to take three different buses because the routing system, I was in Cleveland, Ohio, it just, it was all over the place. And then if they're running late, then she's gonna be running late. And in those situations, I, I always saw the patient. I didn't care how late they were. I just, I can't, they're trying their hardest to get to me. I can't put that against them. And then to counter the stereotypes. So, we may have some stereotypes already in our minds. What do we do with that? We can start spending time with people that we have these stereotypes about, getting to know them, spending time in order to gain understanding of your differences and the challenges that they face. But I believe here, starting now, we can start right now with our training. I really do believe that as physicians, we are educators. We are helping build a foundation with the future of medicine with training the medical students and the residents. It, I do believe that we can make a change and that we can, we can start this. We can start this early on too. So interventions. I'm looking at it at an institutional level. There's medical school, there's residency and the attendings. And the reason I made an upside down triangle is because if we start in the beginning, as early as possible, in medical school, making them aware of their implicit biases. Then hopefully by the time we get we get to attendings, when they get to be attending, they will have a lot of those under control or have a better understanding and won't need as much education or reinforcement of that. So we, if we start early, we can really make an impact. So the medical school level, I think every medical student during orientation should take the I, IAT, plain and simple. And it will be shocking. When you guys take this, you will be very shocked, I think. And 
diversifying school faculty. So here's the thing. If we diversify our school faculty, we're going to we'll look more like the general population, right? We have more physicians of different races. If we, we just, we need to mix it up. And if we diversify the faculty at school, we're gonna then get that exposure with different cultures and races early on in our medical training. And then diversify the student body as well. So the student body, we need to make sure that we're getting a good mix of students. I always wondered, and it always bothered me, when you had to apply for medical school, you had to submit a picture. And I always thought everyone should just get assigned a number and you shouldn't have any gender identifying information. You shouldn't have anything that tells about your age, your gender, your race, your ethnicity, none of that. We should just all be assigned a number. And I always thought if one year they just assigned numbers and did interviews, somehow not maybe through Zoom and fading out your, your face and changing your voice, I was always really curious what our classes would look like, not knowing the gender or race of anyone. Okay, what about residents? So residency, so again, take the IAT test. Guess what? You can take this over and over and over again. Like you can keep taking it, you can keep taking it. And hopefully things will change. That would be the goal, right? So they did a study with internal medicine and ER residents, and they took the IAT test, and they showed a significant pro-white bias despite no explicit preferences, which, again, I'm not surprised about. So what if we diversify the, the residency class as well? In 2018, 4% of the 2,197 cardiology fellows were African-American and 4.8% were Hispanic and 22% were female. That's not really the general population spread, right? And then, oh, sorry, 22% female pediatricians, allergists and dermatologists. So they're more likely to be females. And are we nudging females into this field? I'll tell you as a female, people have come across and just assumed I want to do psychiatry because I have a good work-life balance. And it's really because I love psych psychiatry. I was a neuroscience major. And, but I, I understand that. I understand that because we hear a lot of that in training, not intentionally though, I don't think either. People are like, oh, you want to have, you want to get married? You want to have kids? Well, you should, you know, how are you going to do all of that? And I think we should have, we, could, we should encourage open discussions and, and didactics pertaining to implicit bias. So I have a story. So back when I was a third year medical student, you know, measly little third year on my second internal medicine rotation, terrified. I remember rounding on this elderly Latina patient and we rounded on her. She didn't speak a, speak a lick of English and the resident goes and writes a note and he writes that she has no complaints or concerns and she's in no acute distress. And I'm sitting there kind of biting my tongue. I should have spoken up, I should have spoken up, but I was terrified too. And what happened, I went back in and spoke with her. I minored in Spanish. Now it's been years since I've used the Spanish, but I was able to converse enough with her and she was explaining to me how she felt that there was someone coming into the window at night. And I thought, uh-oh, she made me delirious because she's elderly, she's by herself, she doesn't, she doesn't speak the language, she doesn't know what's going on. They're trying to figure out what's wrong with her. And she couldn't communicate any of her basic needs though. So I went in to make these little index cards and on one side, I put it in Spanish and the other side, I put it in English. So it was like, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, this hurts, I have to go to the restroom, all of those things. And so she could use it and communicate with the nursing staff. But I thought simply because we, we didn't speak her language, does that not mean she deserves the same medical care? And I was in Erie, Pennsylvania at that time. And we have translators available. I mean a lot of places have policies about translators. Like there's a reason why we have a policy because how can you give medical care to someone that you can't, can't communicate with? 
Okay, attending and faculty. So again, take the IPT test, of course. Diversify faculty. So again, our physician workforce is, doesn't even come close to representing the diversity in our country. I'm gonna talk specifically about letters of recommendation and introduction to brand round. So this actually has to pertain and it kind of goes full circle. So you know, as an attending, as faculty, we'll be asked for medical students for letter of recommendations or for residents and for fellows. And they did this, they did a few studies on letters of recommendation. And so when the next time you're writing a letter of recommendation, I want you to look at the wording, look at the words you're using for this particular candidate, especially for females versus males and African-American students versus Caucasians. So there was a study about the letter of recommendation and it showed 86% letters were written by men, men physicians. And when it was written by men, the letters for the male applicants were more likely to have higher word count, standout adjectives such as exceptional and references to awards, achievements, ability, hardships, leadership, all that stuff. They also use the applicant's name more often throughout the letter. Whereas female applicants had more positive general terms like delightful and hardworking, caring, like soft descriptive words, supportive. None of those disparities were evident when women, when a woman physician wrote the letters for a male or a female. Introduction to Grand Rounds. Mayo Clinic, they did a study, Grand Round speakers on 321 speakers. So we always introduce our speakers. So when women were introducing the speakers, nearly all of the women used professional titles for the speaker, whether it was the male or female. Whereas when a man introduced the speaker, there was only a 50% chance that this, the speaker would be introduced as a doctor who was a female. But when it was a male, they were all introduced as doctor. So the American Society of Clinical Oncologists found similar gender biases when women were introduced by males, as well as racial biases when black speakers were introduced. So it turned into, our triangle is turning into a circle. We can continuously change this culture from medical students into residents and fellows to attendings. And we just kind of keep going through and keep re-educating and taking these um, Harvard implicit bias tests just to see if we're changing the way we're thinking. It's not gonna happen overnight, right? These are ingrained, they're unconscious. They're brought to our consciousness, but even so they're still there. They, some of them can be there since we were three years old and we've been practicing medicine for how many years or just on earth for how many years. That is going to be hard to change, but it can be done. It can be done. And it's going to take work. Okay, so I want you to close your eyes again. And I'd like to, to imagine this scenario. You leave work, you're in a rush. You got to go to the airport. You catch a taxi to the airport. Once at the airport, you realize your flight's about to depart. So you're rushing through security and you board right before they close the gate. You're greeted by the flight attendant and the pilot. After arriving to your destination, you have dinner at a posh restaurant where you overhear a couple celebrating their wedding anniversary. Open your eyes. Hopefully your picture is more diversified this time. I'm just gonna end with this quote by Martin Luther King Jr. Of all forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhumane. Thank you very much for your time. And hopefully this was eye-opening and interesting and getting you to think about things and you can hop on. If you just Google Harvard implicit bias test, it pops up. I really strongly encourage you guys to do that. And thank you. Questions? So we have a few questions, um, Dr. Dracek Beatty. I think you're unmuted now. Did you see the questions in the Q&A portion? Yes, I did. Great question. So um, we'll start off with the first one. 80% of Black population has low vitamin D, higher percentage of obesity and over 50 population, high, higher hypertension, diabetes associated with obesity in Black population. You know, how is this factored in? So that's a great question. And I, and I forgot to even mention that 
in this uh, systematic review that they, they looked at all the research, they, they corrected for those things. So they took into account things such as socioeconomic status, the general health of the patients, also placism. And that's a term I'm not sure if people are familiar with, but placism is, um, it talks about how an African-American or, or Latino or someone else of a different race uh, can have a life expectancy that's 20 years less than those of uh, living in a different area that are Caucasian, let's say. So about the, the idea of like where you live affects your longevity. But they've done studies showing that if you move people to where the higher uh, you know, longevity is, it's still not going to correct for that. So they even took into account what we call placism as well. So, uh, so that they did take all those factors in and it still showed that there was a big discrepancy and, and, and the reasoning is there's something, there's something, this is a hard topic, okay? This is a very hard topic to talk about. And uh, at first I was almost very emotionally charged. Like, what are you talking about? I have a bias. I don't, I don't think I do. And, um, and, and it's just really getting us to kind of look deep down. Are we treating patients a little differently? Because a lot of the research will show that Latinos and African-Americans will say they spend less amount of time with their primary care provider, well, physicians in general, their length of appointment seems shorter. They feel rushed. They feel that they're spoken over to um, or not allowed to speak as much. So there's other factors that, that they're bringing to the table too and saying that they feel that something is different as well. But the Harvard implicit bias test, lots of questions on that, um, which is great because no test is perfect. Uh, it's kind of really like the gold standard is what we have right now. And, uh, but again, there are some, some things that obviously can be approved upon. One is when I first took it, I thought I have to almost have a practice run or get familiar with it because it's, it's just, it's odd The E and I you're using. It's just, it just, I don't know. I thought it was a little different. So that, so there, um, some people are scrutinizing the validity of it and, and, so they say maybe we should have some practice trials first so we get familiar with the format of the actual exam. And then caution with the stimulus that they're presenting to you to make sure it's, it's very clear cut. There's, it's not ambiguous at all. And then the time, the, the big part of that is the timing, your reaction to it. And that's how they get to see if it's you know, unconscious or not implicit. And things can change that. You can get distracted, you can, just not pay attention. You can hit the wrong button, even though you meant to actually push the other one because you were just, so maybe you're right-handed versus left-handed. I wondered that too, if you're a little bit uh, faster with the right hand, depending on what's in there versus the left. So uh, those are things that are under scrutiny with, with the implicit bias test. So uh, is there any, what were the other questions? Let me scroll down here. Um, oh, another thing too, somewhere along here, I read one of the questions in regards to how do we know if this is the case? So they did, there was a study by Green and colleagues back in 2007, where they took medical residents and they, they did the implicit bias test, but then they also gave them different scenarios, just fake scenarios, computerized scenarios. And the, the students that scored higher on the implicit bias test tended to treat the African-American patients differently as far as actual treatment. So these are all hypothetical patients. And so it was pretty standardized in that sense. And, uh, and there was a big discrepancy in the whites versus the African-Americans treatment. And this was things for um, thrombolysis and, and along that, that nature. So. They've done a number of those studies too, uh, with re with residents, with medical students, and ER versus internal medicine to see if there was any difference. So they've started doing those types of things as far as hypothetical scenarios. Uh, okay, uh, oh, I didn't see this last one. Uh, let's see. So we talked about the implicit bias test, some significant inconsistencies. Uh, again, we kind of talked a little bit about how 
that could happen. I would hope though, if you take it and at least it makes you think that it would be different the next time that will, as far as an improvement. Um, and then let's see, even someone who, gen so the last anonymous, uh, not sure about the reliability of Harvard test, but I think implicit bias is real, even as someone who generally does not have any conscious racist feeling. That's exactly. I remember one time when I was reading up on a patient before seeing them, and there was concern for non-accidental trauma and a lot of psychosocial issues in the family. And when I went into the room and the patient was white, I realized that I was surprised because when I was reading the chart, I pictured a black patient. And I was horrified at this realization. This is an example of implicit bias. That's that's great. First and foremost, like recognizing that is 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 a wonderful thing that we're in. We're open to that, and we're not going to get offended by it because really. I think it's very striking when you, when they do the implicit bias tests and the African American physicians are very neutral. I mean, I think that has to say something that we're these things are ingrained at, at a very young age that we're not even aware of. So as long as we're bringing it to our awareness and willing to listen and willing to work on it, I think uh, and and have these discussions with our medical students, with our attendings, with our residents, with our with our fellow colleagues. Any others? I know we kind of ran over. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Drazik Beatty. Did I say your? I have to be able. Yes, and Drazik. Yes, yes. I just, just don't look at the name when you're trying. Okay, to, it so throws you off. <laughs> I have to do this because this whole time I've been thinking um, the implicit bias that you may have looking at me right now. I need you to answer a question. Am I am I wearing matching navy trousers, khakis, or? Maybe we just don't, we don't really know yeah. what people are wearing, okay? So yeah. you're implicit. I mean, I have sweatpants on, so I mean, hey. <laughs> it's COVID Zoom times. <laughs> we are, I am hey, assuming everyone is just dressed professionally here on up, so. That's right, <laughs> right, we want you to assume. So, hey, it's a whole new world and I wanted to keep with the theme. So yeah. uh, thank you for your implicit bias. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. We're going to be taking a lunch break here shortly. Okay. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. So, Bye. Well, join us now for the AOA update with Joseph A. Jimo, DO, FACOI, FCCP. Dr. Jimo is an AOA board certified osteopathic internal and pulmonary medicine physician in private practice in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. In addition to his work in pulmonology, Dr. Jaimo specializes in various forms of sleep medicine, including treatment of insomnia and hypersomnia. He is a fellow of the American College of Osteopathic Internists and the American College of Chest Physicians. Dr. Jaimo has served the AOA in several capacities, including chair of the Department of Affiliate Affairs, Department of Business Affairs, Department of Education, and Department of Research. He is also a past president of the Florida Osteopathic Medical Association, and the American Lung Association. In 2017, Jupiter Magazine recognized Dr. Jaimo and his wife, Shannon Kate, as a power couple making a difference in Palm Beach. Please welcome Dr. Jaimo. Hello, Oklahoma. I'm Joe Jaimo. I'm the president-elect of the American Osteopathic Association. It truly is a pleasure to be here with you to spend some time during your meeting. Unfortunately, we're all virtual today. I really have looked forward so much to bringing my family out to visit with you all, and I hope we'll get a chance to see you all in the future. Today, I'd like to spend a few moments during your meeting here to give you an AOA update and talk about what the American Osteopathic Association has been doing this past year. On behalf of the entire American Osteopathic Association, President Ely, our CEO, Kevin Clower, and the entire board of trustees, I'd like to say how privileged we are today to get a chance to speak with you all. First of all, I have no financial or conflict of interest to report today for our talk. If you have any questions regarding anything we're going to speak to today, you can meet us, reach us at member services at osteopathic.org. It's been a very difficult time this last year for all of us. The healthcare landscape is continuing to evolve. 
COVID-19 has changed so much of what we do. Just the meeting today, how we're doing this virtually and how we've changed so much in our lives. It really is had a huge impact. More than 93% of physicians use telemedicine in the last year. 77% of them for the very first time. COVID has also taken a huge financial impact on our practices. 95% of surveyed DOs report a decreased practice revenue in the past year. And certainly, most importantly to all of us, our patients have really suffered. They are really looking for what we offer as osteopathic physicians. They know we can treat them when they're sick, but they want us to keep them well, and the preventative care is really what they're looking for these days. And so, how is the AOA pivoting and helping in this time? We're expanding the osteopathic community. Support for DOs and osteopathic medical students during the pandemic and beyond. We're supporting the future of the profession by an expansion of our osteopathic recognition. And we're enhancing the public health mission, focusing on addressing health disparities and the physician shortage. Lessons from COVID, it has shown us all so much. We're really unfortunately seeing the gaps in our healthcare system. And these are some of the lessons that the AOA has learned from during the pandemic and we're forming bridges to fill these gaps. We're supporting DOs during the COVID pandemic. In response specifically, we're advocating at the federal and grassroots level for financial relief and liability protection. We've developed an on-demand library of over 30 COVID seminars and webinars. We've offered member savings programs for PPE and free hotel stays for our frontline physicians. As an organization, we've reassessed our goals. We're expanding our osteopathic community, again, promoting AOA membership, but also creating more member value propositions. We're reviewing the AOA brand campaign so it better reflects a greater understanding of who and what we are as a profession. And we've developed collaborative agreements with a number of our affiliates, most recently the Choose DO program with ACOM. Also, we're supporting the future of our profession with osteopathic recognition in GME programs and also collaborating with our partners at SOMA to enhance the AOA's support of our students. We're enhancing the AOA's public health mission, identifying public health initiatives, promoting health research within our osteopathic communities, and developing resources to help address these healthcare disparities. We've had decades of growth. We're getting stronger, we're getting larger as a profession. In the last decade alone, 63% increase in osteopathic physicians. And over the last three decades, 300%. That is just incredible. We're getting stronger, we're getting larger, our voices are being heard. There's a new era now. With the single accreditation system, we've ended our five-year transition in June of 2020. Since that time, it's established a number of issues. First of all, there's a consistent method for evaluation of our programs and of the residents. We're enhancing opportunities for our trainees. One accreditation system means transparency to the federal government, licensing boards, credentials committee, and the public we serve. The cost savings certainly is eliminating any duplicate accreditation services. And most importantly for all of us, this assures the preservation and protection of osteopathic medical education. We have a bright future of DOs. The postgraduate trainees are doing incredibly well. 99.3% of the 2020 graduates seeking GME placement found programs. Also in 2021, 
over 6,597 DO medical students and our past graduate DOs matched in training positions, a net increase of over 359 compared to 2020. We're also working to ensure fair treatment of our graduates and our medical students, creating a fair evaluation in residency opportunities and a transition during the single GME accreditation system. We've developed a CBS ambassador program. This was launched in February and ambassadors focus on a number of things. First of all, cultivating that personal relationship with program directors in targeted reg residency programs to help facilitate the understanding of what osteopathic training means. Ensuring program directors understand the benefits to our AOA board certification and building an awareness and preference among the program directors for AOA board certification when discussing options with the residents. We have over 250 programs with osteopathic recognition. That's more than 2,700 residents are in training in these designated osteopathic positions. That includes 121 allopathic positions. We're promoting the value of our recognition. Osteopathic recognition promoted, get recognized. It's incredible the number of residents and fellows we have, and we're so proud of them and we promote them. We're evolving our osteopathic board certification. Our goal is to establish AOA board certification as the certification of choice for all DOs. We're building on an 80 year tradition of excellence. Osteopathic certification is a respected marker of clinical distinction. We are innovating to add increased value and convenience and accessibility. We've heard what you're saying. We're adding more remote testing locations. Our longitudinal assessments are being updated with OCC. We have an early entrance pathway for initial certification. And we're welcoming home all of our osteopathic colleagues who were ABMS certified. And by that, I mean members who were board certified before November the 21st of 2020 are now eligible for a reciprocal board certification issued through a corresponding AOA specialty or subspecialty board. They take no initial certification exam. They have no initial certification fee for AOA members. There is a nominal fee of $299 for non-AOA members. If you'd like to learn more about this, come to certification.osteopathic.org. Also, we're legislating for you at a grassroots and federal level. Our state and government affairs continue to work on scope of practice issues, licensing issues, and liability protection in your communities. Our regulatory affairs look for physician payment, quality reporting, payment models, HIT and telehealth services. And congressional affairs we continue to work on teaching healthcare center GME programs, prior authorization reform for Medicare Advantage programs, surprise billing, liability protection, and debt relief, to name a few. And at a grassroots level, we continue to assess access to care, entitlement reform, physician workplace, and, and scope of practice issues. As part of that during this last year, as you're aware, we've had to have a virtual DO day, and we've pivoted with that to enhance what we offer. DO Day 2021 introduced a leadership development and advocacy summit featuring more membership and advocacy training, customized tracks for our students, physicians, and affiliates, and the ability for anyone to participate in all three of those tracks. High quality, CME programming and professional development sessions. And as always, an opportunity to meet with your representative and represent the profession at congressional meetings with your lawmakers. The voice of our profession has been strong. DO Day attendees met with members of Congress to advocate on behalf of our osteopathic profession. We met 
about the Dr. Lorreen Green Healthcare Provider Protection Act, the Teaching Health Centers Graduate Medical Education Program, the Medicare Sequester COVID Moratorium Act, and we had advocacy wins. Congress included a $330 million in additional funding for the Teaching Healthcare Graduate Medical Education Programs in the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. This was signed into law on Thursday, March the 11th. We continue to battle on, metal front, on many fronts. Our communications department has had media corrections and follow-up articles as we continue to defend the profession. We are no longer passive when people attack us. We aggressively pursue and try to make people understand who we are. Under direction of Dr. Ely and Dr. Clower, we've taken significant strides towards this with over 731,000 social media impressions, 53,000 social media engagements in support of our osteopathic profession, plus number of media corrections in the Washington Post, LA Times, and Kaiser Health News. In case you missed it, there are a few other headlines that we've had. Osteopathic medicine ranks high in several US news and world report rankings. Our Journal of Osteopathic Medicine has a transformation and continues with a new website at www.jom.osteopathic.org. Our House of Delegates and Board of Trustees meeting has had a call to meeting. As you're aware, our House of Delegates will be virtual this year. We look forward to your participation. Our marketing campaign highlights osteopathic physicians as we continue to work towards educating the public and improving osteopathic medicine. We've developed a strategic plan and we're charting a new course. The new mission for the AOA is the professional home for osteopathic physicians, students, providing education, board certification, and is the champion of the advancement of our distinctive osteopathic philosophy. Our vision aspires to be the North Star of osteopathic profession by advancing the interest of osteopathic physicians, students, and promoting excellent and patient care consistent with our distinctive osteopathic philosophy. We've had a value statement guide implementing seven core values to implement as part of our strategic plan. Selfless service, integrity, transparency, innovation, advocacy, collaboration, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'd like to thank you for the time we've had here today, and I'd like to stay on and answer any questions you may have. If you'd like to reach me, you can reach me at my Twitter handle, at my email address, or through membership services. Thank you so much for your time today. I look forward to seeing you all in the future. I hope you have a wonderful conference. Thank you, Dr. Jaimo, and thank you for joining us. Um, any further comments you'd like to suggest or uh, share with us? Well, uh, you know, thank you for the time today, honestly. I mean, it, it's nice to get a chance to, to at least see, see colleagues now. Uh, I'm looking forward to coming out and visiting you hopefully soon. I'm sorry to hear about your, your space there, the office space and, and those, the damages there. I imagine that has to, to set you back a little bit. I mean, uh, we're in, um, you know, we're do doing a lot of changes now. Uh, our practices are all changing. The, the way we approach medicine has changed. In the last year, uh, all of us have had to pivot and adapt a lot. And I think that uh, meetings like this really help uh, bring us together as a community. Uh, we get our osteopathic family together. We get a chance to, to talk about some of the things that have worked, uh, how we've experimented with telemedicine and how we've had a chance to try to integrate that into our practices, how we've managed to, to pivot educationally and, and take care of our members and, and have uh, good educational programs how to advocate for all of us. So I, I think it is a different time, um, but it is a very challenging and rewarding time for all of us. And I'm looking forward as we evolve and come out of this pandemic and get back more to our history and our culture about where we need to be. Very good. 
Well, thank you once more. Um, appreciate having you. It's an honor to uh, hear from you. And uh, uh, thanks again. We look forward to having you in Oklahoma next time with us. Thank you so much. You all, all right. take care. Have a wonderful conference. All right. Thank you. Uh, I would like to welcome our next presenter, Scott Jelfin, PhD, JD. Dr. Jelfin is a tenured professor and head of the Department of Philosophy at Oklahoma State University. He received his PhD in philosophy from the University of Maryland and his JD from the Georgetown University Law Center. His research is focused primarily on issues in biomedical ethics and research ethics. Most recently, he has written several papers discussing two ethical problems associated with the physician-patient relationship, the problem of nudging and informed consent, and the problem of the nocebo effect. Please welcome Dr. Jelson. Okay, beautiful. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, as the introduction stated, I am a philosopher at Oklahoma State University. I, sit at, I also sit on the IRB, by the way, at the uh, Health Science Center for OSU. My interests are both philosophical and practical. And what I'd like to do today is talk to you about a problem that ethicists in the philosophical literature have been addressing for seven or eight years now. It's also though a very practical problem. Uh, some of you may know Mark Fox and Mark Fox and I have published a number of papers addressing this problem. So let me just begin. A nudge and a wink is the name of the talk. And what I'd like to talk about is something called the nudge or nudging. So what is a nudge, first thing? And I'm going to talk about nudging more generally. And then what I'd like to do is actually focus it on an issue in healthcare. So a nudge is defined by Richard Taylor and Cass Sun Sunstein as any aspect of the choice architecture that alters people's behavior in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing economic incentives. Crucially, a nudge may circumvent the rationality of the chooser. So first, let me talk about a little background pertaining to the nudge and then give you an example. In 2008, Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler wrote a paper entitled Paternalism, Libertarian Paternalism. And most political philosophers and ethicists consider paternalism and libertarianism to essentially be an oxymoron. The idea being that paternalism by its very nature limits the freedom of the chooser for her own good, whereas libertarianism is concerned, of course, with protecting as much freedom as possible. What Thaler and Sunstein argued essentially is that there's a certain way in which we can set up choice situations, whether we're talking about going through a cafeteria line, whether we're talking about organ donation or informed consent, there's a way in which we can set up the choice situation such that libertarians and paternalists or welfareists would be satisfied. Essentially what they were thinking is there's so much political division in the United States. There's so much practical division in the United States. Might there be a way whereby we could come up with policies that would be acceptable to people on both the left and the right of the political, um, yes, of the political continuum. So let me give you an example of a nudge. This shows up in the introduction to Thaler and Sunstein's book. Cafeteria workers have to put the food somewhere. That's obvious. What we know is that if cafeteria workers place healthy foods at the beginning of the cafeteria line and put it at eye level, people are more likely to choose the healthy foods. Now, what makes this a nudge? Well, one thing that makes it a nudge is that we can predict that creating this choice architecture placing the foods at eye level at the beginning of the line is going to increase the likelihood that people are going to choose healthy foods. But crucially, we can increase people's willingness to choose these healthy foods without making the healthy foods less expensive or making the unhealthy foods more expensive. 
And furthermore, we don't limit the choice set. So it's not as though we take the apple pie out of the line or the cherry pie out of the line. Okay, so this is what makes it a nudge. Another example of a nudge, in their book, they have a section devoted to healthcare. Another example of a nudge has to do with organ donation. Most studies show that in the United States, the percentage of people who actually are donors is much lower than the percentage of people who say they would like to be donors. Experiments from the United States and around the world have demonstrated, and these experiments are maybe not exactly clear, but they seem to demonstrate, let me put it that way, that if we create a different choice architecture than the choice architecture that we have right now, then that it would increase the likelihood that people would opt to be organ donors. Right now, as you know, the default is non-donor. By the default, what I mean is if somebody does nothing, a person is not a donor. In other countries, however, we've learned that if the default is changed from non-donor to donor, there's a much higher percentage of people who, quote unquote, agree to become organ donors. Again, notice, we are not making it more expensive or less expensive to become an organ donor if we change the default. We are not limiting anybody's choices. They still have the choice to be a donor or a non-donor. But proponents of the nudge would say that by using this nudge, we increase the likelihood that people make a choice that is to be a donor or not be a donor that's consistent with their own value. Okay, let's move uh, forward. Nudging and informed consent. Shlomo Cohen is a physician and an ethicist. And he and I have been kind of exchanging a number of papers addressing A, the issue of nudges and B, a second issue, which we may talk about depending on whether or not we have enough time. In an essay in which Shlomo Cohen is supporting the use of nudges in healthcare situations, Cohen explains that empirical research reveals that patients are more likely to consent to a surgical intervention if, I'm sorry, are more likely to consent to a surgical intervention which has certain costs like pain if the costs associated with the procedure are not incurred at the time that the person consents to the procedure or intervention. In other words, we might not know it now, but I know that whenever I've gone in for a surgery or any you know, moderately complicated intervention, more than let's say going to a dermatologist to have a wart taken off, we actually sign the informed consent form the day before, or two days before. Well, studies demonstrate that this actually increases the likelihood that people are going to consent to a surgical intervention. Another example of a nudge, we know, we know based on other research that it's likely the case that patients would be more likely to consent to a surgical intervention if their physician is wearing scrubs as opposed to a simple white coat when the physician is obtaining informed consent. Finally, we know that a physician can nudge patients toward or away from consenting to a treatment if the physician chooses to describe the treatment in terms of the success rate as opposed to its complementary failure rate. Now here's where we can see that rationality seems to be circumvented. In other words, if you tell a patient that there's a 90% chance that this treatment will succeed she's more likely to consent to the treatment than if you tell the patient there's a 10% ch chance that it will fail. But of course, as we know, whether there's a 90% chance of success or a 10% chance of failure, there's really no difference. Now, what Cohen argues in his paper is that physicians ought to use this information that we know about choice situations, about choice architecture, in a way to nudge patients toward the treatment or procedure that the physician believes is in the patient's best interest. 
Here's the ethical dilemma. Physicians have an obligation of non-maleficence, that is the obligation to do no harm, or an obligation of beneficence. Physicians also, on the other hand, have the obligation to respect patient autonomy. Usually the obligation to obtain informed consent is thought of as being grounded in the obligation to respect patient autonomy. The dilemma, now that we know this about nudges, we might not have even had this dilemma until we learned about how people make choices, is that physicians can either respect the duty of non-maleficence or the duty to respect patient autonomy, but they can't do both. Consider a physician who believes that treatment A is superior for the patient. If the physician describes treatment A in light of its success rate, the physician increases the likelihood that the patient will choose, um, will choose treatment A. If the physician describes it in terms of its failure rate, the physician increases the likelihood that the patient will choose treatment B or will not choose treatment A, let's just say. But again, the issue here is, is that notice by obtaining informed consent, by telling the patient about the success rate or the failure rate, the physician is essentially putting the patient in a situation whereby her rationality is circumvented. In other words, her choice is a function of something other than a rational decision. How to manage the nocebo dilemma. In the philosophical literature, several proposals have been made in an attempt to address how to manage the, uh, the nudging dilemma. One of the proposals is basically to claim that there is no dilemma whatsoever. To basically say that a physician's duty of non-maleficence, a physician's duty of beneficence, in other words, the duty not to harm or the duty to help the patient, completely trumps the duty to respect patient autonomy. That's the argument that Shlomo Cohn puts forward. And actually in a paper that I wrote with Mark Fox, we stated something very similar. Basically what we argued is that when a physician comes to a patient, the physician is essentially recognizing, whether it's explicitly stated or not, that the goal of the physician is to try to help the patient, that the physician is, in, is the expert in the room, and that the physician will, will thereby try to convince the patient to opt for the treatment that the physician believes is best. Of course, Mark and I were concerned with the fact that it's one thing to convince a patient to opt for a sort of treatment if the patient is choosing based on some sort of rational deliberation. But if the patient is choosing based on something other than rational deliberation, this might be problematic. Shlomo Cohen furthermore argues then nudging is unavoidable. Essentially what Cohen says is, whether we talk about the cafeteria line or the other um, example that I gave you, but let's start with the cafeteria line. You have to put the healthy food somewhere. You can put the healthy food at the beginning of the line. You can put the healthy food at the end of the line. But since it's got to go somewhere, a physician is in a position, well, in this case, a cafeteria worker, is in a position whereby she can't not nudge. Similarly, we could say something like the physician has to wear scrubs or a white coat or nothing. But regardless of whether the physician decides to wear clothes at all and whether the physician wears scrubs or something else, at the end of the day, this choice is in fact going to have an effect on the patient's choice. It's gonna have effect on the patient's rationality, that is, it's gonna circumvent the patient's rationality, but there's nothing else we can do about it. Finally, there's an approach which I've been talking about in the literature, which is, I call it the meta-nudge. And basically what we're doing is essentially nudging the nudge. 
nudging the nudger or yeah, I guess nudging the nudge. And the idea is we might be able to undermine the power of unavoidable nudges, assuming nudges are unavoidable, by telling patients how nudges work. Notice that the first two prioritize the duty of non-maleficence or beneficence, while the third prioritizes, prioritizes the duty to respect patient autonomy. So let me just explain the third a tiny bit more. The idea behind the third is we know, based on research, that we can undermine the power of framing if we tell a person that the frame is in effect. We know for example, that if we have vanilla, the scent of vanilla in a store, that people are more likely to spend more time in the store and they're more likely to buy things. But research indicates that if we say to the person in the store, research indicates that the smell or the scent of vanilla is gonna increase the likelihood that you are gonna stay in the store longer or buy clothing, that the power of this frame actually dissipates and people actually revert to the behavior that they would have had without the vanilla scent being sprayed in the room. And we have many other experiments that demonstrate that this is how we undermine the power of a frame. So one of the things that I have been thinking about and looking at research is to see might nudges work the same way in other words, might it be the case that we can tell patients something like, when I tell you that this has a 95% chance of success, it's going to increase the likelihood that you're going to opt for it. On the other hand, if I tell you there's a 5% chance of failure, it's going to increase the likelihood that you're not going to opt for it. I think you need to know this before you make a choice, something like that. Now, obviously, as I said before, at the bottom of this slide, this sort of approach is the approach that one might take if one wants to prioritize autonomy. I know that all of you have different approaches with respect to how you balance autonomy on one hand and the duty of beneficence or non-maleficence on the other hand. And to a certain extent, depending on whether you want to put more weight on autonomy when you deal with your patients or some sort of paternalistic approach or an approach which is really grounded in non-maleficence or um, ben beneficence, will to some extent determine whether or not you think that there is some sort of argument, let us say, for minimizing the power of the nudge in order to increase the likelihood that patients will in fact make a choice that is not circumventing their autonomy. Okay, that's the first topic that I wanted to talk about. And what I was thinking was, if there's any questions or comments, we can address them and then see if I have time to talk about a second ethical dilemma that for about the past two or three years, it's been in the philosophical literature. But again, it also has, I think, important applications in any sort of medical or healthcare practice. So I assume that there is a way for us to take questions if there are any, maybe by the chat. Is there anyone who's hosting who can um, tell me about this? Okay. And I, before you go on, Dr. Gelfin, I actually have a question too. So Richard Thaler that you pointed out, he, um, he was kind of the guy with uh, behavioral economics. Is that correct? Exactly, yes. Yeah, in fact, so, that's where their work started. Okay. And this is something I've had a chance to talk to patients about is behavioral economics, the reason that, you know, prices are a certain way that, uh, you know, they end up choosing certain things based on, uh, upon the way that it's presented to them. So um, I do appreciate that. That's, that's good. Yeah, I mean, again, I think you, you may have given what you just said, you know, originally they were actually really looking at behaviors of both corporations, governments, and people, primarily with respect to financial decisions. For example, one of their studies involved, um, quote unquote, forcing people to open savings accounts. 
with accounts. What they did is that they said to the employees, if you got a raise, would you like to save 50% of the raise or would you rather not save any of it? And 80 or 90% of the people said we would like to save half of it. So then what they did was they broke it in, they broke essentially this group of employees into two subgroups. The first subgroup, they actually opened a savings account for them. And when they got their raise, 50% of the raise automatically went into a savings account. The other 50% remained in their paycheck. Whereas in the second group, they didn't do anything. And of course, you know what obviously happened. The first group ended up with a sizable savings account at the end of the year. And almost everybody in the second group never even opened up a savings account. Now, crucially, what Thaler and Sunstein argue is that nudging is ethically permissible only in those instances in which we're nudging somebody in a way which increases the likelihood that they make a choice that's consistent with their own values. In other words, if it were the case that most people said they did not want to open a savings account, Thaler and Sunstein would argue that nudging in that case would be unethical because you're not increasing the likelihood that people end up in a situation that's consistent with their own values or conception of what constitutes a good life. The nocebo effect. We all know that the placebo effect is a beneficial effect produced not by a drug or treatment, but by a patient's belief that the drug or treatment will produce a, a beneficial effect. The nocebo effect, which is something that we've heard far less about, is the mirror phenomenon of the placebo effect, whereby the likelihood that a patient will experience negative side effects from a drug or treatment increases if the patient knows about the possible side effects. Again, Shlomo Cohen is the person who really started this conversation. Um, and Shlomo Cohen and I have kind of been writing back and forth with each other about this issue. And what Shlomo Cohen pointed out in this 2014 essay is that he looked in the philosopher's index and quote, it yielded a striking zero result. None of the bioethicists up to that point in time were writing essays about the nocebo effect. Several years ago, the American Journal of Bioethics actually published a, um, one journal that was exclusively devoted to the nocebo effect. And subsequently, there's been quite a bit of research and literature focused on the nocebo effect. So let me just give you a couple of examples. Empirical studies, these aren't things that I made up. Beta blockers. We know that beta, block, beta blockers, which are used to lower blood pressure, may have a side effect, erectile dysfunction. Basically, a study was conducted whereby three groups were created. In group A, the patients were not told the name of the medi medication or the side effect. They were basically told, you have like high blood pressure, take this. And 3.1% suffered the side effect. In group B, patients were told the name of the medication, but not the side effect. Again, in group B, the difference between group B and group A is that people could go on the internet and they could read about it. Five times as many people suffered the side effect, 15.6. In group C, patients were told the name of the medicine and the side effect, 31% suffered the side effect. 10 times as many people suffered the side effect. Let me show you another empirical study. A second um, nocebo effect example was a study in which there were two groups. The basic point of the study, at least as far as the group participants were informed, was to see about the effectiveness of aspirin to treat angina. Now we know that there are some possible side effects of aspirin, namely gastrointestinal problems. In the first group, they did not inform the participants that gastrointestinal problems were a possible side effect. In the second group, group, they did inform them. Six times as many people in the second group withdrew from the study claiming, complaining of gastrointestinal sy symptoms. So again, we see that the nocebo effect is real and 
far reaching. Now, let me talk to you about the problem. We have another sort of dilemma here, and this one may be more obvious. On one hand, as I mentioned before, physicians have a duty to respect patient autonomy. Usually this is um, carried out through informed consent. Physicians also have a duty of non-maleficence or a duty of beneficence, a duty not to harm and a duty to contribute to the well-being of the patient's health. The dilemma, I think it should be clear, is that if the physician acts in accord with the duty to respect autonomy, that is, if the physician tells the patient that there is a chance that he will suffer erectile dysfunction if he takes beta blockers, he is not acting in his accord with his duty of non-maleficence. That is, by obtaining informed consent, he is actually increasing by 10 times the likelihood that the patient will suffer the side effects. Of course, the opposite is also true. If the physician decides or believes that the patient would be better off not knowing about the side effects because you'll decrease significantly the likelihood that the patient will suffer the side effects, the physician has to essentially not meet her duty of respecting patient autonomy. So let me move on. So what do we do with this? Most of us who have been writing about this would say that there's no way that the nocebo effect is going to go away. There's actually one way, one philosophical move that people can use. I'll mention it briefly. One thing that people could basically say is that the duty of non-maleficence, the duty of do no harm, includes the duty to respect autonomy. In other words, there's no independent duty to respect patient autonomy. But because I have a duty not to harm my patient, one way that I don't harm my patient is by respecting patient autonomy. Most ethicists would say that this is just a non-starter. Most ethicists would say, no, that these are in fact two independent duties. Each of them has independent power. And rather than try to explain away the problem, what we need to do is recognize that there's a problem, recognize that there is a tension between the duty of non-maleficence and the duty to respect patient autonomy and try to manage the duty, try to balance the duty. And we might balance different physicians again, depending on how much you value autonomy versus how much you value non-maleficence are gonna balance this differently. In any event, Shlomo Cohen basically comes up with a very complicated way to manage this, this conflict. Um, and basically what he said, I'll just give, I'll talk to you about it quickly, but most ethicists have said, you know, it's surprising that Cohen would come up with this solution because it's a solution that's so impractical in a real medical practice. But basically what Cohen says is what we need to do first is look at the likelihood that a medication will cause nocebogenic effects. Of course, given all of the different medications and all of the different treatments already, this is a non-starter. Then what Cohen says is what we want to do is look at the specific patient and see whether a patient is likely to suffer nocebogenic effects. We know, for example, that there's a high likelihood that certain patients patients who are subject to suggestion are more likely to suffer nocebogenic effects than other patients. We furthermore know that people who are more likely to benefit from the placebo effect are more likely to suffer the harms associated with the nocebo effect. Given the lack of practicality, what I'd like to do is talk to you about a second approach which has been getting a particularly more, particularly more attention. And basically what these physicians say is that informed consent should be handled after the, init the initial treatment. And there's some, this isn't something that is unheard of. 
In the literature, people have talked about getting informed consent after the treatment. And I'm not just talking about in those situations in which people can't give consent because of their condition. And their basic idea is that what you would want to do, for example, with let's just say um, the gastrointestinal effects associated with aspirin is not talk about the effects to the patient at the time that you tell the patient about the treatment, but rather after the fact, there should be some sort of follow-up. And if you believe that, for example, a patient is likely to suffer some sort of side effect, obviously it depends on the severity of the side effect, rather than suggest that this may be a side effect, afterwards you would call the patient and basically ask, are there any side effects or anything that you've noticed? At that point in time, let's go back, let's say to the beta blocker, if the patient says something like, you know, I've noticed that since I've been on this medication, I have suffered from erectile dysfunction, that's when the conversation can be had. Whether this is practical or not, I'm not sure. Again, I'm a philosopher. Um, I usually do write with, or frequently write with physicians who are in practice. Um, so I'm not sure about the practicality of this, but it certainly would be a way to respect patient autonomy and at the same time, not increase the likelihood. I mean, again, when I think about myself, for example, and I think about if I know that I was gonna get prescribed a medicine and if the physician told me that there was 10 times, and I knew in the back of my head, that there was 10 times the likelihood that I would suffer erectile dysfunction, for example, or maybe even nausea or something like that. I'm a person who takes autonomy very seriously, but I have to say, I think I would rather hear about it after the fact rather than increase the likelihood that I would suffer from it. There are a number of different other approaches. I've been working on a more complicated approach, but that would take a little bit more time to talk about. And given that I've been talking for uh, close to 30 minutes, I think, um, I'd like to stop and see if there are any questions or comments or suggestions, assuming that we have a few more minutes. Yes, we have, we have a couple minutes and uh, we do have a couple questions or uh, one question and a comment. First question is, how can I overcome the nocebo effect when prescribing statin therapy to increase patient compliance with therapy? And I'm presuming the uh, myalgias, the right. so, muscle aches associated. I think what I'm hearing, but tell me if I'm getting this correct, is the issue patient compliance? Because that, I mean, that is part of the discussion. I'll reread it just for a moment. How can I overcome the nocebo effect when prescribing statin therapy to increase patient compliance with therapy? Right, so I take it the idea is, is that if I talk about the side effect of a medication, there's gonna be a greater likelihood that we're gonna have non-compliance. I, I think that's what the, what's being stated. That's how I read it. If mm -hmm. that's what's being stated, certainly the Fortunato and colleagues um, approach might be something that would work, which again would be trying to have a follow-up rather than suggesting that there's a side effect I think there's another thing, though, I may as well talk about it now since the door is somewhat open. I wonder if part of what we ought to be doing is thinking about not only our own values, how much do I value autonomy, but how much does my patient value autonomy? How long a conversation this would be, I'm not sure. But the idea is I would imagine, oh, I don't would imagine, I know this, that there are certain patients that really don't value autonomy and basically would rather have the physician tell them what to do, aren't very concerned with knowing everything, especially if knowing everything would decrease the likelihood that they are going to have a successful outcome. Um, I would imagine that in cases like that, what we would want to do is not talk about the side effects. On the other hand, there are these people who would say something like, as far as I'm concerned, I want to know everything. And even if I know everything, it might be the case that knowing everything isn't good for me physically, but it's good for me psychologically, it's good for me emotionally. 
Now, one thing is, is that this gets even more complicated because research has demonstrated that depending on the sort of condition that a person is being treated for, the value that they place on autonomy differs significantly. So certainly if we were gonna take an approach like this, we'd have to do a lot of research. But let me just throw out one final piece that I've been thinking about. Maybe you all even have some help for me. One of my thoughts was we all know about the, chain, the universal pain chart. Would it be possible to have something that's analogous to that, but it would be with respect to patient autonomy? Again, we don't have to use the word patient autonomy, but if we know about nudging and we know about the nocebo effect, would it be the case that perhaps sometime during intake that in the same way that for some physicians might ask, you know, are you a zero or 10 or point to where you are on this universal pain scale, that there could be a pain scale, I'm sorry, that there could be an autonomy scale, not using that word, which basically is zero, I don't wanna know. I wanna get better. I'm busy doing philosophy. I'm busy teaching my classes. I don't wanna get on the internet. I know that's dangerous. And then all the way on the other end, you might have like the picture of the same person sitting in a library, books all around that person. And that person says, I wanna know everything. And then the physician based on her own values and based on the values of the patient could attempt to balance when full information trumps the duty of non-maleficence or vice versa. Very good. I have one other question here. What do you say to the plaintiff attorney when they say you should have told him that could happen or what could happen? Yeah. One thing you do is blame it on Gelfand. <laughs> but again, this is an ethics talk. Um, I used to be an attorney, as you saw. So I obviously take the law seriously. My belief is, again, that we have to have a conversation. And you see this. I also sit on an ethics committee. And frequently, you have the attorney in the room as well as the ethicist. And that there does need to be a conversation between the ethicists and the attorneys and eventually the legislature, with the idea being, I, presumably, that we want to have a set of laws that's consistent with either the true morality or the morality of the community. And I think that what we wanna do is have the ethics talk, maybe this is because I'm an ethicist, have the ethics talk first, maybe simultaneously, with the, again, the idea that we wanna to try to get the ethics right. Once we get the ethics right, then of course we can get the legislation right. I mean, it would be no different, I suppose, than trying to introduce, um, pain and suffering caps when it comes to negligence lawsuits or medical malpractice lawsuits. I take it that the idea is not that the people who are asking for these caps are greedy. I, I take it the idea is, is that they realize that in medicine, there are gonna be mistakes. You could be the best driver in the world, but you may get in an accident. And it's unfair to have such a huge judgment given the reality that physicians are doing their best. Now there, of course, might be some cases where someone does something outlandish, but no one's talking about that. Again, what I'm trying to point out is, is that once we get the ethics right, then we could at least try to change the legislation. But right now, again, yes, this is just ethics and ethics coming from the ivory tower but someone who leaves the ivory tower all the time. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gelfand. It was uh, a pleasure. Uh, thank you for inspiring us to think, think deeply and um, appreciate the, the uh, conversation. Also, I can tell by watching you, we need to get you on a stage. So we will keep you in mind. <laughs> We're gonna get you on a stage uh, to present live to us in the future, if you'd be so willing. So, I would um, do it that way. Yeah, I mean, I'd much yeah. prefer to have a whiteboard behind me or a screen behind me. But still, this is really, I so much appreciate the opportunity. Um, as I said, at this point in my career, more and more I'm trying to write for the general public. Um, uh, not write these really esoteric philosophical pieces that maybe eight or ten philosophers read. Um, so thanks again for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.
Bye. Donald J. Kyle, PhD, received a BS degree in chemistry from Chicago, excuse me, from Colorado State University in 1982, then earned a PhD in synthetic organic chemistry from Texas Tech University in 1986. He has worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 34 years. His first industrial position was at Nova Pharmaceutical Corporation, where he designed and synthesized experimental molecules for treating various CNS diseases, including pain, and participated in the development of high throughput screening and combinatorial chemistry for drug discovery. He pioneered structure-based design approaches to novel bradykine and receptor antagonists for pain and asthma and developed computational tools aimed at the elucidation of protein structure for drug design. His scientific accomplishments are reflected in nearly 200 scientific publications, review papers, books and chapters, as well as 95 issued US patents across a wide range of technologies, molecules, therapeutic areas, and commercial products. He is a reviewer and editorial advisory board member for several peer-reviewed journals and has held several adjunct faculty appointments. He is currently an executive director at the National Center for Wellness and Recovery at Oklahoma State University. Welcome, Dr. Kyle. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Don Kyle. I'm an adjunct professor at the uh, Department of Pharmacology and Physiology at the OSU Center for Health Sciences in Tulsa, and I'm a research director at the National Center for Wellness and Recovery at that same location. I very much appreciate the invitation to speak to you all today at your conference and uh, tell you a little bit about the opioid receptor, hopefully some things that you've not heard before and uh, talk about some recent discoveries and some new therapeutic opportunities that are starting to emerge uh, from research in this area. Before I get into the new uh, opportunities and the emerging science, I thought it would be appropriate to start with a little bit of a historical perspective on opioids um, because it's really a class of drugs that have been associated with human existence really since the beginning of recorded history. So it's kind of interesting to think about, you know, where, where, what is the origin of opium? And histor history shows us um, the most likely origination of the opium poppy is um, in, back in the, uh, in the area of the Assyrian Empire which dates back to around 4,000 to 5,000 BCE, which in this slide is, you, is over in this area here in northern Iraq and southern, southeastern uh, Turkey, the uh, region of the Assyrian Empire. Um, historically, this is known as the cradle of civilization. Um, because the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers run north and south through Iraq, um, and drain out into the Persian Gulf, those two rivers form a very fertile area which is known as the Fertile, Cres fertile Crescent, which is shown here, um, that bridges from the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea all the way over to the Persian Gulf. Um, lots of herbal, ancient herbal medicinal recipes are, um, are from this place. And these ancient Assyrian stone tablets, as shown in this picture, and some of the carvings from the Assyrian Empire, in this case showing some sort of a medicine man um, worshipping maybe what looks like a plant, casting a spell or communicating in some way. But if you notice in his left hand, he appears to be holding what looks like a plant that may contain the pods of opium, um, although that's, that's not necessarily known. Um, in uh, in uh, the late 1800s in northern Egypt, um, uh, the chairman of Egyptology from Lipseg University, a gentleman by the name of Professor George Ebers, purchased at an open market a, a papyrus which has been dated back to 1550 BCE. A picture of it is shown here at the bottom of the screen. This is the oldest medical text known in human history listing about 700 prescriptions, including some uh, surgical procedures. Um, but one of the prescriptions in particular, when translated, describes sponges that are soaked in opium for treating uh, post-surgical pain. So clearly, even back in the 
1550 BCE period, and actually even older than that, because that's thought to be this is thought to be a copy of an original. Um, the medicinal properties of opium uh, were well known and practiced by the Egyptians. Neolithic burial caves, which are in the southern coast of Spain and the southern coast of France and even over it toward Italy, have been uh, excavated recently and um, what they find in those burial chambers are opium uh, poppy capsules from the plants and seeds from the opium poppies. And in an article published last year, uh, about mid-last year, a multinational uh, research effort led by French and Swiss uh, academic groups did radiocarbon dating on the seeds that they found in these caves and they compared them to seeds that were found further north in Poland and Romania and, uh, and Germany and uh, concluded that these, these seeds also date back to like the, the uh, 3500 to 4500 BCE period. So the general consensus I think in history is that the opium plants originated in the Fertile Crescent in southern Turkey, northern Iraq um, through trade routes and other uh, mechanisms, they found their way over to Egypt and then ultimately across the Mediterranean, probably through Greece and Rome, uh, up into southern Europe. And then they were either carried or harvested further north up into Europe from that point on. What we know is that the opium poppy as a plant adapts very easily to varying soil types and climates and therefore it's very easy to move around and plant it in new places and the plants do quite well, providing us a rich source for this material which has uh, very good benefits, whether they be recreational, medicinal, or religious purposes. And these are probably all three reasons why these ancient people valued the plant and carried it around. So let's fast forward to the modern time um, and uh, this slide on the, le on the left side of this slide um, is a image that I extracted from a publication from uh, the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, showing the total number of opioid prescriptions in the United States dispensed per 100 people um, in 2019. The 2020 figures are not, not yet released. And then down below in the table, starting from 2015 through 2019, um, there you can see the total number of prescriptions and you can see uh, a very good progress is made toward reducing opioid prescriptions uh, over the past five years. In 2015, it was about 227 million prescriptions, which is about 70 prescriptions per 100 people in the United States. And all the way down here in 2019, we can see it's about 153 million prescriptions and the average for the United States is about 46.7 prescriptions per 100 people. So number of prescriptions are for opioids are definitely dropping in the United States. And this is a direct result of all of the measures that are being taken in response to the opioid crisis that emerged in the, in the U.S. before this period and, and since this period. Now, Nonetheless, even though the numbers are dropping, you can see that it's still over 150 million prescriptions in the United States, and that's a lot of opium, uh, opioid uh, prescriptions, and why? Why are there still so many? A partial answer to that can be found on the right-hand side of this screen, and this is, a, this is taken from a publication in November of last year from the National Center for Health Statistics, um, which has revealed uh, through a national survey that approximately 20% of all adults in the United States have chronic pain, and 7.4% have chronic pain that is high impact, meaning that it has uh, it frequently limits their life or working activities. Um, the average shown here, 20.4, that's what the A on this dark blue bar means, and they differentiated males and females. This is statistically different. Interestingly enough, females have slightly higher chronic pain uh, on average than males. Uh, and then on the right side of the graphic is the high impact chronic pain numbers. Digging deeper into the publication, we find that the percentage of chronic pain increases with age. 
the highest uh, severity being amongst uh, elder folks, not so surprising because of arthritis or uh, you know other uh, maybe cancer pain. Um, but age 65 years and older has a higher percentage of, uh, of chronic pain. Um, no explanation is given in the paper, but interestingly, non-Hispanic white adults are more likely to have chronic pain according to this survey. And the percentage of chronic pain increases as the place of residence becomes more rural. I put these three sub-bullets in here since I'm speaking to an audience here in Oklahoma because these three sub-bullets really define the state of Oklahoma. Um, the statistics here in your state of, of approximately 4 million people, about 15% 15 15 of them are 65 years and older. The non-Hispanic white adult population is probably around 75% or so. And of course, I think everybody who lives here, with very uh, a few exceptions, I guess, but it's a very rural state. So Oklahoma hits these three high percentage uh, points quite high, which means that Oklahoma is at risk. And that may be a, an explanation for why when you look at this map, you can see Oklahoma is one of the states that's colored in this flesh colored, meaning that it's in the, it's not for, it's not the national average of 46.7 prescriptions per 100 people, but it's actually 66.7 um, sort of back at the 2016 national averages. So uh, cons considerably higher opioid prescription rate in Oklahoma than the national average. But then again, these three bullet points that I showed here may be a partial explanation for why that's the case. So I made this flow diagram to um, just talk about pain for a minute um, because at, at the National Center for Wellness and Recovery, we're very focused on ending addiction and managing pain through research and, and treatment programs. But we have to understand pain and its mechanisms. And this little flow chart is just an interesting uh, diagram. So working from left to right, you know, a patient may come to the doctor's office. Actually, it's the number one reason why a patient goes to a doctor's office is because they have some pain. And the doctor has to consider whether or not to prescribe them a pain management drug. And in that decision, it's an evaluation of the risk benefit, which are illustrated here in the green and pink boxes. The benefit, of course, would be because of the biochemistry and the pharmacology of, of a pain management drug, and in particular now I'm talking about opioids, um, there are pharmacological changes that, depending on where the opioid receptors are located, in this case in the brain, um, the activation of opioid receptors alters mood, it alters behavior, and it alters perceptions, uh, most notably the perception of pain. And so, you know, uh, diminishing the perception of pain is a benefit for somebody who is in pain, and that's one side of the equation. However, uh, long-term use of the opioid to manage pain brings on these ri some of these risks, and they're associated with um, con other considerations. For example, how, how long is the patient going to be on the opioid? What is the duration of use? At what dose? is the opioid going to be prescribed, even which opioid is going to be, which opioid is going to be used. And then there are some other unknown factors, uh, for example, people's genetic composition, what is the expression level of opioid receptors, are they fast metabolizers or slow metabolizers of opioid drugs, and uh, do they have a genetic propensity for opioid use disorder. Um, environmental conditions, for example, um, stress uh, can increase the risk of uh, opioid adverse events, including opioid use disorder, and then other unknown factors that we just don't know, um, but hopefully can discover in the future. Um, these are some considerations that lead to uh, long-term use of opioids leads to anatomical and biochemical changes in the brain, which manifest ultimately as a substance use disorder or an opioid use disorder, and even opioid overdose, which is the hallmark feature, of course, is the severe respiratory depression associated with that. So we have some urgent needs here to try to uh, improve the decision-making uh, when evaluating this risk-benefit for prescribing. 
One of the urgent needs is that we need alternatives to the classical opioids for pain management, things that are not inherently addictive or cause the other adverse events that uh, opioids cause. Um, unfortunately, finding alternatives to classical opioids has proven to be technologically very different, difficult, even though many laboratories and many pharmaceutical companies have, uh, have worked on this for many, many years. Uh, in the last 25, 30, even 40 years, um, there are very few new mechanism-based uh, pain medications that have been discovered. Um, the reasons for that are multiple. Some of the key ones are that pain perception is subjective, and so when a patient is self-reporting in a clinical trial, it's a very qualitative and personalized assessment, making the statistics quite difficult and often dif difficult to differentiate from placebo. Along those same lines, placebo effects are also quite common in cl clinical trials. When a subject goes to the hospital and participates in a clinical trial, you know, there's a very friendly nursing staff and they're getting very good care and um, their mood improves and often that manifests as an analgesic effect even though they're only getting a placebo. And with a big placebo effect, it also makes it difficult for the test drug to then differentiate from placebo. Uh, so this is another very common problem in uh, pain research. And then of course, a lot of the early pain research is done in animal models, particularly rodents in the early stages, rats and mice in particular. And what we've learned is that, um, you know, there's historically very poor translation from what's observed in the animal models into the humans. So um, for all those reasons and more, the discovery of new pain medications has been somewhat disappointing, even though there's been a lot of effort that has been attempted. In terms of um, the risks, uh, again, the physician is evaluating the risk-benefit profile for every, every patient uh, when, when considering prescribing an opioid. And what we need are better risk assessment tools and pre predictive tools that might be quickly used in a new patient to assess their propensity for um, having a problem with opioid use disorder or severe opioid uh, unwanted side effects. Um, since we don't fully understand the genetics or the environmental factors, and there still are a lot of unknowns here, um, there's a lot of room in research for risk to, to develop risk assessment tools and predictive and translational biomarkers that could be easily measured in a patient that might provide the physician with a more informed assessment of the potential risks of using an opioid on an individual base, basis. And then finally, for those folks who uh, maybe they've already overdosed or maybe they're already struggling with a opioid use disorder, um, we need better tools and a more diverse toolbox for prevention, treatment, and even reversal methods to um, help folks um, either reverse an overdose, obviously, to save lives, but for somebody with an opioid use disorder condition, to reverse the anatomical changes that have occurred in their brain back to some normal baseline to help them heal back to a normal lifestyle. These are very complex mechanisms associated with addiction. We know some things, we don't know a lot of things. Um, uh, it's not well understood and there's a lot of room for research here. And again, it's genetics research, biochemistry research, and behavioral research to try to figure these things out. I mention all of these because these are all areas of focus for research at the National Center for Wellness and Recovery in Tulsa. For today, what I'm going to do, though, is really focus on the left side of this, which is some of the work that we're doing to discover alternatives to classical opioids, because that would be a major benefit to physicians and their patients. And I'd like to share with you some new uh, opportunities that are emerging in our labs uh, and in other places in science. Before getting into that, um, I thought I would just introduce what I'm, what I'm calling the classical opioids. The classical opioids are molecules that are typically derived from opium. And uh, the opium latex, this is an opium capsule shown here. All the way back to those Assyrian tablets that I showed you earlier, back around 5800 BCE, there's recipes in there 
where the Assyrians could slice these capsules with a small razor blade and uh, come back a few hours later and the opium capsule will be uh, sort of hemorrhaging these white latex material that you can see in the picture. Those are known as poppy tears and uh, that's what contains the, uh, the active ingredient morphine primarily. And that can be harvested from these, um, you know, from these capsules. For a long time, that was just used uh, straight out of there. That's opium, that's raw opium. It contains a lot of chemicals. One of them is morphine, but there are a lot of other things in there. It wasn't until 1804 that Frederick Sir Turner, his photograph is shown here, um, doing some isolation work in his pharmacy in Germany, he was able to isolate a white powder, which he named morphine or uh, Morpheus uh, from opium, and really for the first and really started the first pharmacology, the field of pharmacology here, because for the first time in his pharmacy, he was able to measure out specific amounts of morphine um, to be used therapeutically rather than guessing how much morphine might be in that opium latex, which of course would be variable depending on the season when the uh, opium was harvested. In 1874, uh, Charles Romley Wright, working in a laboratory in London, uh, essentially cre took this morphine and uh, converted it into heroin, and uh, ultimately that was licensed to the Bayer uh, Pharmaceutical Company, and was marketed for a number of years as a cough suppressant. In 1916, oxycodone was discovered, uh, or synthesized for the first time, rather. In 1920, hydrocodone. These are two very well-known opioids that are still used today. Um, probably hydrocodone is probably the most commonly prescribed opioid. In 1925, um, Robert Robertson, um, elucidated the chemical structure of morphine, which is shown here for the first time. And then that led to the formation, really, of the explosion of organic chemistry, where people started trying to make synthetic modifications of morphine structure to try to improve its analgesic properties, but minimize the unwanted side effects, including its addictive properties. This led to the synthesis of uh, less complicated structures. This one has five fused ring systems that if you look carefully, you can see them in there. Some of the, some of the less complicated structures included the synthesis of meperidine in 1932 and then fentanyl, which is shown here in 1959. You can see that's a much simpler chemical structure than what's shown here for morphine. Other researchers went a different direction and they tried to make the structure more complicated for example, buprenorphine has six fused, ring, uh, fused rings, and down here at the very bottom, you see this large extra hydrophobic area, which is, there's nothing there in morphine, so it's kind of a, a much bigger structure. But buprenorphine was discovered in 1965. I refer to this period of time from 1804 to 1965 as the era of chemistry, because this is when all of these classical opioids that are still used on the market today were discovered and tested in either tested by the chemists who made them on themselves uh, or their students <laughs> or um, tested in animals. The era bi of biology didn't really start until the 1970s and in 1970 Professor Solomon Snyder at Johns Hopkins uh, isolated the mu receptor, which is the, tar the biological target for these drugs, and isolated the en an endogenous agonist, the encephalins, and uh, that was published in 1970. And from 1970 until the present, of course, we have all kinds of biotech advancements with the instrumentation that we have available to use in our laboratories, our, our ability to visualize at the atomic level the, the cryomicroscopic structure of the mu opioid receptor. Uh, or which is a G-protein coupled receptor. Ways to study signal transduction, meaning when an agonist binds to this receptor, what pathways within the cell are being activated and how strongly and which second messenger systems are engaged and, and things like that. What's very interesting though is that the era of biology does not overlap in time with the era of chemistry. And what that really means is that all of the prescription opioids that were used today 
that are used today were discovered without the benefit of any of these modern drug discovery technologies that we would use on any other project. Um, and the, so these opioids are really quite old. And the question, the scientific question that we ask is, are they really as good as we can make? Are they really optimized? And it's based on that question that we launched into some new research to look at new molecules aimed at the mu opioid receptor that might give us um, better safety margins, less addiction potential, but maintaining the analgesic profile. And I'd like to um, show you some of that work now. So here's, the, uh, here's a flow chart um, of how we normally think about things. Um, classical opioid pharmacology, so an opioid drug shown here in yellow binds to the mu opioid receptor, which is shown here in orange. It's an integral membrane protein, so the lipid bilayer of the membrane is kind of shown in gray, and the mu opioid receptor is sort of woven into the membrane like a serpent. It's a one, one long strand of, of protein, but it, uh, it sort of is stitched like a needle and thread in and out of the membrane, crossing the membrane seven times, forming seven transmembrane domains, having an extracellular N terminal domain and an intracellular C terminal domain. When the agonist binds to the receptor, the receptor undergoes a conformational change, a three dimensional structural change, which is subtle but it's enough to trigger certain intracellular signaling pathways. And depending on where these receptors are, um, that signaling can manifest in an analgesic effect. For example, if the mu opioid receptors are postsynaptic or presynaptic on DRG neurons or, or in certain places of the brain. Um, if they're in the gastrointestinal tract, you know, activation of these mu opioid receptors can cause an inhibition of GI transit time and produce constipation. In the brain stem, they slow down the breathing rate. They cause respiratory depression effects. In the nucleus accumbens of the brain, they, uh, they disinhibit inhibitory GABA neurons and allow dopamine overflow, uh, leading to a euphoria effect. And this is the, associated with drug reinforcement and uh, ultimately drug-seeking behavior. When we look at this picture, though, what we can see is that all of these effects, whether it's the desirable analgesia or the undesirable effects shown in red, they're all mediated by the same mu opioid receptor. So it's very easy for us to think that all opioid drugs that bind the mu receptor are going to cause analgesia, but they're also going to cause these side effects, and they're not really separable because they're being mediated by the same receptor. And that position was true for a long time, up until about, I would say, maybe 10, 12 years ago, where some new research revealed a slightly different possibility. And this research involved um, digging deep into this cellular signaling uh, situation and identifying two major pathways in, this, in the neurons. One of them is known as the G protein coupled, uh, the G protein pathway, and the other is known as the beta arrestin pathway. That's all I'm going to really say about those for now, except that in animal experiments, researchers were able to make genetic knockouts of the beta arrestin protein, meaning that an opioid agonist binding to a mu receptor in those knockout animals, they have no way to signal through the arrestin pathway they can only signal through the G protein pathway. And in those animals, it was discovered that the classical mu opioid effects, including respiratory depression and, and GI effects and so forth, they were significantly reduced in the beta arrest and knockouts, suggesting that this pathway is kind of associated with unwanted effects of opioids. So if we could find a way to make a drug that could bind the receptor but only stimulate the G protein pathway, we might have a good analgesic, but we could avoid or minimize the unwanted side effects. In fact, our labs were able to figure out how to do that, our chemists, and these are known as biased opioid agonists. Biased because when they, they're biased in the way they, they cause signal transduction. They only signal through the G protein pathway, not the beta arrestin pathway. And these are very interesting molecules that uh, we have at the NCWR. We're looking at them in animal models now. They show uh, good analgesic efficacy in these models, comparable to morphine, 
but with significant reductions in unwanted effects. And I'd like to show you some examples of those right now. This molecule, which I'm going to refer to as NCWR2, is a novel biased mu agonist. And this is its in vitro pharmacological profile shown in green. Now, the top panel here, which is labeled GTP gamma S, let's just assume, let's just call this the, um, the G pathway that I described before. This is the one that's associated with analgesia. analgesia. The beta arrestin pathway, which is the one that's largely associated with unwanted side effects, is shown here in the bottom panel. The positive control is a, is a unbiased agonist known as DAMGO. It's a small peptide, and, that, and its curves are shown in blue in both panels. This is a dose-response curve, and the way you read this is, starting from left to right on the horizontal axis, as you move across, we're increasing the concentration of drug on the cell, and we're measuring the effect on, on the G pathway. And as you can see, at very low concentrations, there's no effect. But when we get up here around 10 to the minus 8th molar or so, we start to see as we increase the dose, we get an increased response or an increased signaling in the G pathway all the way up to a full response of about 100%. DAMGO is a full agonist in the uh, G pathway as shown here. NCWR2 has a similar profile. As we increase the concentration, we see an increasing response, but it's only about 50% of the maximal response that we get from the reference DAMGO. So NCWR2 is actually a partial agonist of mu opioid receptors in the G pathway, but that's still significant enough to cause an analgesic effect. But contrast this profile with what we see in the beta arrestin assay. Here we see DAMGO has a very similar profile as it did before in the G pathway. As we increase the concentration, the dose response curve goes up and we get a 100% maximal effect of DAMGO in the arrestin pathway. In other words, DAMGO is a full agonist in both the G pathway and the arrestin pathway. In the arrestin pathway, looking at NCWR2 though, you can see that no matter how much we increase the dose, we really don't, we have a flat liner here. There's really no dose response, very, very minimal effect, uh, even at very high concentrations of NCWR2. It does not activate the beta arrestin pathway. So it is an agonist, it is a partial agonist in the G pathway, and it is a, 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 non, uh, a not an agonist in the arrestin pathway. Therefore, NCWR2 is what we call a biased agonist, and this is the in vitro pharmacology to prove that. If we check this molecule out in an in vivo model of pain, and here I'm just showing you the hot plate, and there's a lot of data here, but we don't need to look at all of it. This is a classical hot plate test where the animals are dosed with a drug, and then 30 minutes later they are put on a hot plate at a certain temperature, and we monitor when they start trying to escape from the hot plate, or start licking their paws, uh, indicating that they're, that they're uncomfortable with the temperature. Um, although it's not burning their feet, it's just uncomfortable. Um, anyway, the latency, which is shown here on the vertical axis, is the time to, before they start to have escape behavior. So uh, a higher latency would mean that there's a stronger analgesic effect, they're not feeling the heat, and they're willing to stand on the plate for a longer period of time. The positive control here is morphine, dosed at 10 milligrams per kilogram. That's the black circles, which you can see here. And we have the, we've measured this at the one, three, and five hour time points. So you can see looking at morphine at 10 milligrams per kilogram, the latency is pretty good at the one hour time point. 25, it's 25 seconds compared to vehicle treated uh, animals. And uh, we have a pretty good, a very good morphine analgesic effect at the one hour time point. By three hours though, you can see the morphine analgesic effect has dropped off pretty significantly, almost down to baseline. And that's because morphine has a fairly short half-life and it's cleared very quickly from the animals. If we compare that to uh, this biased agonist, NCWR2, which we've dosed in three different groups with three different doses, either 3, which is green, 10, which is light blue, or 30, which is sort of the light purple milligram per kilogram dose, you can see that at the one-hour time point, 
at least at the 10 and 30 and, uh, and 75 milligram per kilogram doses, the analgesic efficacy is quite comparable to what we saw for morphine. So it's morphine-like efficacy at the one hour time point. At the three hour time point, since NCWR2 has a slower clearance and a longer half-life, there's still very good analgesic efficacy at three hours and even five hours at some of the higher doses. Uh, in contrast to what we see for morphine. If we run the same experiment um, in a mu receptor knockout rat, we see that NCWR2 has absolutely no analgesic efficacy, um, a flatliner, um, which is basically proving that its analgesic mechanism of action is being mediated by mu opioid receptors. So it's analgesic comparable to morphine strength, but longer lasting. If we look at the side effects now in this third panel, and here I'm looking at respiratory depression in the top, normal respiratory, uh, here I'm looking at partial pressure of CO2 in the blood, and the normal range is illustrated by this gray bar that runs horizontally here. And you can see the vehicle, the vehicle is basically in the normal range, that's the white bar. An eight milligram per kilogram dose of oxycodone will slow breathing causing respiratory depression, and it will elevate CO2 in the blood, which you can see is elevated above normal here in the black bar. The analgesic doses that I showed you in, the, in this previous panel over here of 310 and 30 milligrams per kilogram, however, do not elevate, uh, do not cause respiratory depression uh, any differently than the vehicle and significantly different than oxycodone. So this is a very interesting profile for an opioid with analgesic efficacy comparable to morphine, and yet it doesn't appear to cause respiratory depression in the animals. If we look at condition place preference, which is a measure of drug liking or drug seeking behavior, um, if we look at if we look at the, I won't, I'm not going to take the time now to explain the model, but basically. Um, the high bar shown here in black means that they really like that drug. That's an eight milligram per kilogram dose of oxycodone. So they have a, they have a so-called place preference for that. They'll work hard to get that drug um, as opposed to the white bar here, which is saline, which they, there's really very little value. They don't really differentiate that. Um, so oxycodone compared to saline produces a very strong Plate, conditioned place preference, meaning that there's drug liking and drug seeking behavior there. Again, at analgesic doses of 10 and 30 milligrams per kilogram, NCWR2, using the same color scheme of light blue and the light purple, is significantly less conditioned place preference from what we saw with oxycodone, and it's not statistically significantly different from what was there for the vehicle, although there might be a numerical trend up. Um, so there might be some uh, place preference here, but significantly less than a drug like oxycodone. So overall, what I'm showing you on this slide is a lot of data. I hope you were able to follow me through that. It's actually a very exciting profile for a new generation of an opioid, which we call biased opioid, acting through mu opioid receptors in a new mechanistic way that give us analgesic-like efficacy uh, comparable to morphine, but with minimal or no respiratory depression and significant reductions in this condition place preference paradigm. Another example, a second one that I'll show you here is NCWR1. Um, and I'm showing you a little a data in a little bit of a different way here. This is a dose response curve now um, on a hot plate. Uh, and again, going from left to right as we move uh, from left to right on the horizontal axis, we're increasing the dose of drug that's being given to the animal before they're tested in the hot plate paradigm. And you can see that at, even for morphine at some very low concentrations, um, there's no analgesic efficacy whatsoever. And this is subcutaneous dosing at the one hour time point post dose. You can see that we have to push the dose all the way up to about five milligrams per kilogram subcutaneous and that would be the first point where we see in these animals some analgesic efficacy in the hot plate. A similar profile can be seen for NCWR1, which was dosed orally, and so now we're looking at a three-hour time point. But again, at some low concentrations, there's no analgesic efficacy, but as we move from left to right, increasing the dose, 
we get up around three milligrams per kilograms, which is where we have the minimally effective analgesic dose. So the two profiles look kind of similar when we just look at analgesic efficacy. However, when we look at side effects, we see something quite remarkable. For morphine, at concentrations of drug below the minimally effective analgesic dose, we see respiratory depression and constipation starting to come on. Now, as we increase concentration, the severity of the constipation and the severity of the respiratory depression will also increase together with the analgesic uh, efficacy of morphine. So they truly are not set, they truly are inseparable here, and it's not a great, uh, not a great profile. Contrast that with the side effect measurements in NCWR1, where the minimally effective dose now is to the left of the, of the dose response curve compared to where we start to see hints of constipation. And there's really no evidence for respiratory depression at 100 milligrams per kilogram. And although not shown on this graph, we pushed the dose all the way up to 300 and still saw no evidence of respiratory depression even though checking the blood, we see very high exposure levels of NCWR1 in the blood at those time points. So the onset and severity of these important opioid side effects really differ significantly between a classical opioid like morphine and these novel biased NCWR molecules that we're looking at today. One last thing that I just want to mention, uh, the, 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 the two slides, that I, the, the two panels I just showed you there in the center and on the left, those were done in the rat. The panel on the right is kind of interesting because we're looking at self-administration in a non-human primate. And the best way to interpret this graph is um, the vertical axis as you go high, uh, from, t from bottom to top on the vertical axis, it's a measure of how hard the animal is willing to work by pressing a lever to get more injections. So if they really like the drug, if they're getting a reward from it, they'll work very hard uh, and, and to get injections of that. And you can see on the far right, if fentanyl is the drug that's used, the, the, uh, it's a very tall bar colored in black in the slide, uh, meaning that the animals will work very hard to get injections of fentanyl in this self-administration study. Saline is over here on the far left as a white bar, and you can see the animals won't do very much work for saline at all because there's nothing rewarding about it. Using NCWR1 in this non-human primate model at three different uh, concentrations per injection, we can see that there's no differentiation from saline in this primate model. So um, it is, it is uh, the, the animals treat it like saline, not like fentanyl in terms of self-administration. So these are two very interesting uh, biased next generation opioid agonists that were designed to uh, interact with the mu opioid receptor in a new way to produce better safety margins and minimize the risk of uh, long-term addiction risks and other opioid side effects risks. So at the NCWR, we're, we're advancing the science of biased opioid agonists and we hope that these molecular tools that we have and the research that we're doing will ultimately lead to new options, new therapeutic options for physicians as they weigh the risk benefit of prescribing drugs for their patients to manage their pain. And of course, that would be a direct benefit for the patients as well. Now, mu opioid receptors are not the only thing on cell membranes. Um, I showed you this picture before. Um, there are other things on the neuronal membranes, and for example, there's a receptor which is known as ORL1. And so another approach that we can take is to design polypharmacological molecules, meaning drugs that can bind to two different receptors um, if, they, uh, if they're present in the, in the, in the, uh, in the tissues. So a, uh, a dual-acting drug would be one, shown here as a black square, that could bind to a mu opioid receptor, and let's assume this, this, this blue square, a blue cube, is a, uh, an unbiased agonist. So it's going to bind to the mu receptor, it's going to activate the G pathway and the arrestin pathway, and it's going to produce analgesia plus side effects. But we've designed this molecule in such a way that it can also bind to this ORL1 receptor. 
Now, when that happens, similar to the mu receptor, there's cell signaling that occurs, and ultimately it manifests as analgesia. So we have two different mechanisms producing analgesia here, an ORL1 mechanism and a mu receptor mechanism. Now, whenever there's two mechanisms like that in play, there could either be synergistic or additive analgesia. But in this case, the cellular signaling of the ORL1 has what's known as heterologous uh, crosstalk back to the signaling of the mu receptor side. And so when the drug activates ORL1 and initiates cellular signaling, as part of that process, it has an inhibitory effect on the arrestin pathway that would have been activated when the drug bound to the mu receptor uh, and, and, and activated the arrestin pathway. So this inhibitory crosstalk or heterologous inhibition mechanism leaves you with a net dual mechanism to produce analgesia but minimize the side effects coming from beta arrestin in an otherwise unbiased mu agonist. We're looking at several of these. I'm not going to show you any data for now. I just wanted to introduce the concept to you. Um, these dual acting molecules are under investigation at the NCWR and we're looking at mu ORL1 such as I showed in this picture. We're also looking at mu kappa opioids as well as mu uh, trip V1 uh, which is a, a non-selective ion channel target uh, combination. And again with these new molecular tools researchers at the National Center are at the forefront of another approach toward uh, mechanistically uh, interacting with the mu opioid receptor and a adjunct receptor to uh, improve safety margins, boost analgesia, and ultimately benefit patients. So those are some of the uh, approaches that we're taking for some molecules. Now I want to move on and talk about the receptor itself for the last little bit of my presentation here. And uh, <clears throat> I talked about the, uh, the chemistry of opioids and the non-overlapping biology, the era of biology and the era of chemistry. Let's take a little deeper dive into the mu opioid receptor for a moment. And of course, we all know that the genetic code or the DNA in the nuclei of our cells contains the necessary information for the cells to synthesize proteins um, including the mu opioid receptor plus many other things. And these, these, uh, the DNA is divided into discrete segments which are known as introns and exons um, that get copied when the DNA unfolds and RNA um, tra is, is transcribed from it. And those exons, which are just sections of the DNA sequence, they actually get transcribed into the, into the RNA as well. So exon 1, exon 2, exon 3, they all would end up in the piece of transcribed RNA uh, in this case. Through a process known as alternative splicing, and this is a way the human genome um, creates diversity, uh, one of the ways that it creates diversity, through alternative splicing, um, the, the cell is able to um, join together different exons in different combinations to create different messenger RNA strands. So for example, if you follow along in my picture, messenger RNA strand number one would be the splicing together of exon one, which is green, exon two, which is yellow, and exon three, which is blue. And the introns that are in between them have now been spliced out, and these three exons come together to form messenger RNA number one containing all three exons. Another possibility would be that exon one might get skipped and then the messenger RNA number two would just be a combination of exon two and exon, uh, exon two and exon three as shown here. Two different messenger RNA sequences that largely code for the same protein. Now of course messenger RNA in the is released from the nucleus. It's, it's out in the cytoplasm where it gets picked up by the ribosome whose job it is is to translate the codons that are embedded in the mRNA to synthesize protein. And this, um, this three exon 
containing mRNA is what codes for the seven transmembrane spanning uh, mu opioid receptor, or the so-called classical mu opioid receptor, which I've been talking about throughout this presentation. However, the recent discovery that there's a splice variant possible for the mu opioid receptor that's missing exon 1 leads to the, has led to publications describing a different version of the mu opioid receptor that does not have seven transmembrane spanning uh, 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 helices, but instead it only has six. You'll notice the green one, which is coming from exon 1, is missing in this, in this uh, splice variant of the mu opioid receptor. Now, this is, in, this is important because, you, you know, drugs, opioid drugs bind to these receptors and they cause signal transduction in the pharmacology that I've been describing. If you change the structure of the receptor, it's possible that different opioids could have different effects on different forms of the receptor. And this opens up some very interesting genetic questions about do all people have the same population of the seven transmembrane form and the six, or do certain diseases cause an upregulation of a six transmembrane form and maybe a downregulation of the seven so that different opioids might do different things in the setting of certain diseases? These are very interesting scientific questions that are just now starting to be investigated. Um, and at the NCWR, we have some molecular tools that we're using to look at, at, at some of this as well. But here's a little table that I wanted to share with you. I think you might find this interesting. This is, this is not from our work. This is from the literature. But we already know that these known opioids have differences in their binding affinities to the two receptor forms. It's been shown that morphine exerts its pharmacology exclusively through the seven transmembrane splice variant form of the receptor. If this is knocked out, genetically knocked out in an animal, morphine loses its analgesic efficacy 100%. On the other hand, you could make a knockout of the six transmembrane form of the receptor, um, but morphine would retain 100% of its analgesic efficacy. Buprenorphine is a very interesting molecule, and I put it right in here on the fence <clears throat> because buprenorphine has been shown to exert part of its pharmacology through the 7 transmembrane form and part of its uh, pharmacology through the 6 transmembrane form. So a knockout of one or the other of these two splice variants will diminish some of buprenorphine's pharmacology, but not all. So it's unique. Recently, a molecule which is known as IBN-TXA was, was discovered and published, and this is the first molecule that has been shown to be selective for the 6 transmembrane form of the receptor. It doesn't interact with the 7 at all. The authors of this molecule describe in their publication that there's no evidence for respiratory depression of this animal, no inhibition uh, of animals dosed with this molecule, no inhibition of GI transit, no condition place preference, and yet it has potent analgesia. If you look at the chemical structures here, you can, if you're interested in, in organic chemistry, medicinal chemistry, you can see some interesting things. Buprenorphine's got this large bulky group over here to the right. There's nothing there for morphine. So this large bulky group might be partially responsible for its affinity to the 6TM re receptor. IBN-TXA also has a large bulky group over here that's not present in morphine, so that could be an interesting piece of the structure activity relationship. We also notice attached to the nitrogen, there's a cyclopropyl methyl group here on IBN-TXA. It's also there on buprenorphine, but it's a methyl group on morphine. So this could be another structural component that gives these two molecules the ability to interact with this receptor. So these are some of the chemical principles that we're applying at the National Center to try to design some new molecules that might interact selectively with this six transmembrane form of the receptor to get better safety margins yet strong analgesic efficacy. Um, as I already mentioned, human genetic differences can alter the expression of the two forms of this, uh, of the two splice, splice variant forms, 
possibly contributing to different personal responses, individualized responses to different opioid drugs. That's work that remains to be elucidated. Also, chronic exposure to opioids um, can cause, has, has been shown to cause an increased expression of the six transmembrane form of the receptor so that in cancer patients, for example, who have been on opioids for a long period of time, the population of six transmembrane form of the receptor would be much higher than in uh, you know, other folks. There's also evidence that the six transmembrane form of the receptor can heterodimerize with, a nut, with other receptors in the same membrane producing heterodimer proteins that are actually potential drug candidates for, for further drug research. So as you can see, there's a lot going on in the field of the mu opioid receptor and in the field of drug design against uh, the, the mu opioid receptor that opens up some very interesting possibilities for future therapeutics. I guess I'm going to skip over this slide um, just in the interest of time. I just wanted to mention to you that, you know, the opioid crisis has sort of been characterized as three waves. Maybe I'll make just a couple of comments here about this chart on the right. Um, the first wave was the rise back in, this chart shows on, from left to right the time period from 1999 to 2017. Um, the, first wave, the first part of the wave is the rise of prescription opioid related deaths, which you can see is going up here in purple. Then uh, starting around the 2010 time period, you see the he deaths associated with heroin start to go up. That's the yellow part. That's the second wave. And the prescription opioid death rate starts to normalize off to level. But now we're in the third wave where you see this exponential rise in synthetic op uh, deaths associated with syn synthetic opioids particularly fentanyl and fentanyl uh, analogs, which are often laced into other drugs of abuse without the user's knowledge. Reversing opioid overdose from these fentanyl analogs is quite difficult uh, for a drug like naloxone, which is currently the front line, because fentanyl has a much higher affinity to the receptor, approximately threefold higher affinity than naloxone, making it difficult for naloxone to displace fentanyl once it binds. Fentanyl also penetrates the CNS much more quickly than naloxone, and fentanyl has a much longer duration of action um, than naloxone, typically on the order of four to eight hours, um, as opposed to half an hour to one and a half hours for naloxone. So the naloxone could actually wear off in a Narcan reversal situation, but the fentanyl would still be there to reoccupy the receptors and re-narcotize the patients, putting them back into an overdose situation. So in this age of the third wave of the opioid crisis, we need longer lasting, more potent antagonists than naloxone. And in the interest of completeness, I just thought I'd share with you that at the NCWR, we have discovered some of these uh, molecules. Um, and if you look at their binding affinity, they're called NCWR3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. If you look at their binding affinities here in this column, the lower the number, the tighter the binding. And you can see that NCWR3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, they are all higher affinity binding even than fentanyl by at least tenfold, and in some cases more than that. So on a thermodynamic basis, the ability of these antagonists to displace fentanyl and reverse an overdose are much better than what you could achieve with naloxone. Also, if you look at their lipophilicity, which is an indirect measure of their speed of penetration into the central nervous system, you can see these numbers are ranging from three to five or six. That's more comparable to fentanyl in the four range, so this, these would hopefully speedily penetrate into the CNS, which would be necessary for a reversal and we're currently working on measuring their duration of action in vivo. And if they have a long duration of action, any one of these could be a very good candidate for combating the third wave of the opioid crisis where strong reversal agents are needed to reverse a fentanyl overdose. So um, I've taken a lot of your time here today. Um, I appreciate you giving me the full hour. 
And uh, I figured since I was recording this in advance that um, there wouldn't be an opportunity for questions, so I could just take a little more time and explain things more. And I hope that was valuable and not, not boring for you. <laughs> um, anyway, some key summary points that I would like you to just think about. The human experience with opium dates to the 6th millennium BCE, but the goal of separating analgesia from unwanted side effects remains today as an unmet goal. It's disappointing that opioids, some of them like hydrocodone and oxycodone that I showed you earlier, they were discovered over a hundred years ago and they still remain as the gold standard for pain medication despite the significant technological advances that we've made in drug discovery and biology. It's uh, the discovery of new types of opioid agonists which, which I've described for you as biased agonists and polypharmacological agonists, they show really promising potential as new therapeutics and they're very valuable research tools as we try to figure out the mechanisms uh, that underpin addiction and pain and how they overlap. And then finally, I talked to you about the splice variants, recently discovered splice variants of the mu opioid receptor and even heterodimers of the mu opioid receptor that represent a new frontier for drug design of potent analgesics, hopefully with minimal or reduced un, uh, unwanted side effects. And finally, um, hopefully I've mentioned the National Center for Wellness and Recovery enough that you know that we have some unique assets there. We're engaging in research along these lines. We're currently expanding our research capabilities to further explore the kinds of things that I've shared with you today to advance the science of pain and addiction and ultimately translate it into treatments for patients suffering from chronic pain and, uh, and uh, opioid use disorder. So thank you so much for the very kind invitation. I enjoy speaking to this group very, very much. I wish it was live, that would be fun. Maybe someday in the future we can arrange that, but in the meantime, I'll close it here, and thank you all very much for your very kind attention and invitation to speak at your meeting. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Kyle. Hello, everyone. This is Sherry Moore, Vice President of Risk Management at Plyco. Um, I want to welcome uh, you all and thank the Oklahoma Osteopathic Association for once again partnering with us to provide risk management education uh, to not only our insured providers, but to the osteopathic physicians in Oklahoma. I'm pleased this um, today to be able to actually bring um, some new blood for you all. I know you're probably really have about had it um, with listening to me. Um, so I, uh, worked with some of my staff in Texas. Uh, we, as you know, Plyco is a division of the MedPro group and part of our division includes um, Texas. And I have a risk consultant in Texas. Her name is Sherry Morrison, which I assure you causes lots of confusion when we are covering for each other. But um, uh, so she is going to be one of the presenters and then an attorney from Texas, uh, T. Mark Calvert, will also be presenting. The presentation today is social media do's and don'ts. We have not done anything on this topic in probably about four to five years, and obviously things have really changed um, over the last couple of years related to social media. So we wanted to talk a little bit um, more about um, that information and about some of the risks associated with that. Today, if you are logged in and you stay for the entire session, then you will receive your Plyco Risk Management Credit. If you're interested in receiving the maximum amount of credit of 6%, then you should give us a call. Today's program is worth 4%. So if you're interested in getting the full 6%, give us a call at 405 815 48 Zero 03, and we can talk to you about additional activities that you can do to increase that risk management cre uh, premium credit. In addition, I'd just like to remind everybody about Explore Healthcare Summit. We are supremely optimistic that this year we are going to get to um, see you all face to face. I know that Audrey is ready to see you face to face as well at, at her conferences, and so. Uh, 
Explore is scheduled for August 26th through the 28th, and we are partnering with the Oklahoma Academy of Family Physicians uh, to provide not only um, CME, CME credit, but also OAFP credit. So if you're a member of OAFP, uh, you may be getting some information about that. But please visit our website at explorehealthcaresummit.com uh, to get more information. Uh, we have um, Bob Goff will be joining us as our keynote. Uh, in addition, we have um, Dyke Drummond, who is the happymd.com, talking to us about burnout, and Larry Van Horn, who's an economist out of Vanderbilt, who uh, we'll be talking about transparency in medicine. So, and believe it or not, he's a very entertaining economist. So um, uh, I think you would enjoy that. So before uh, we get started, I just wanna introduce um, our speakers. Uh, Sherry Morrison is again, my senior risk analyst in Texas. Uh, she's a tenured risk management consultant and she's worked for uh, MedPro for about uh, three years and had been with other professional liability carriers as well as working in a large hospital system and large federally qualified ambulatory healthcare system. So she has provide, provided a wide range of services to healthcare providers um, related to risk management across many specialties and settings. Uh, she has her Associates of Arts from the College of Southern Maryland and received her Bachelor of Science degree in Community Health Education from Texas A&M. So she is, she is uh, one of the whoop whoopers and uh, she has multiple certifications in healthcare quality and is a fellow of the American Institute for Healthcare Quality as well. Uh, T. Mark Calvert uh, became Attorney at Law became certified uh, by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization in the field of personal injury trial law in 1994 and remains recertified. Um, he established Calvert and Associates in 1996, and the focus of his practice has been healthcare defense. And over the years, he has handled many, many cases, disputed matters, and appeals. In 2010, he was recognized by H. Texas as one of Houston's top lawyers. And he has given many presentations to healthcare providers and insurance professionals, including continuing education courses. He's one of the contributing authors to the Quick Reference Guide for Healthcare Liability Issues and recently finished Doctors and the Board, a primer on the Texas Medical Board for Texas Doctors. So I welcome you again. Uh, Mr. Calvert and Sherry will be on at the end of the presentation to answer any questions that you have. But again, if you have questions after that, do not hesitate to call us at PLICO at 405-815-4803. Thank you so much again for allowing us to present. So another disclaimer, the, this information is not intended to be legal advice and is not intended to establish guidelines or the standard of care. MedPro is not a regulatory agency. MEPRO does not dictate, mandate, or identify practice protocols to be used. MEPRO does not ensure practitioner compliance with guidelines. At the conclusion of this activity, you should be able to define the scope of social media, identify the risks of using social media, discuss appropriate use of texting and patient care, and discuss strategies to navigate and mitigate those identified risks. This slide right here I thought was just just cute because it just shows over the decades how things have changed. You know, remembering first offices and you know college and everything with um, bulletin boards and we had maps and a Rolodex and a rotary dial phone and how each one of those things um, has translated into a new social media forum. And this is just another one about reading time how things have changed. I love reading. I read about three hours a day. My favorite book is Facebook. And that goes into to this slide here that breaks down a little bit about how we spend our time on social media during the day. And um, I don't know about you all, but my phone sends me an update once a week about how much time I have spent on various um, platforms on my phone and it can even say okay you spent this much time on work because I have work email on my phone this much time on on YouTube or um, Instagram in the overall lifetime what this same study showed 
is that the time that we spend on social media could be greater than five and a half years. So if you just think about that time, and it seems to, especially with the pandemic, um, we spend more and more time on social media and on platforms. But over five years, and just equate that even to college studies, it's a long time and the world is definitely transitioning. The promise of social media included sharing, you know, your work collectively and individually, being able to connect with other colleagues, having good choices for health and well-being, and engaging with your patients in the community. And it's very, very convenient, but we just need to know the cost and proceed cautiously. Um, Staying in touch with family and friends is very important. We have news at our fingertips, news, news, more news. And it can be a constant barrage and distraction from the task at hand or from patient care. So we just need to learn those risks and how to manage those. Some of the pitfalls of social media include the sharing of private information, whether that's your information or patients, inappropriate words or images, there can be personal attacks on you, on your staff, patients and visitors, a lot of sharing of negative opinions and then trying to balance that out with, with compliments and the benefits, inappropriate provision of medical advice, there are risks when a claim of negligence is made and there could be risk to your reputation and career. The pros are great, but the cons are numerous, so we must be cognizant and prepared. And you'll see some situations today, some real life situations with with Mark on um, what has happened or could happen and then how to manage that. A number of ethical concerns that we'll talk about briefly over the course of the program are patient confidentiality, professional behavior online, online medical advice, colleague behavior and possible reporting of that in distracted patient care similar to distracted driving. And it used to be the old adage, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, and that's not true anymore. Um, so what happens in the hospital doesn't necessarily stay in the hospital. Actually, we know it doesn't. One of the things with social media is keeping in mind with all of these platforms, um, whether it's a social media platform or using your phone to consult with another provider or texting with a patient is the issue of online privacy because privacy breaches can cause much greater harm online than they used to on paper because face to face, you know, the, the crowd was limited. And now we know that when things are online, they can spread like wildfire and get out of control very, very quickly. So some of the do's and don'ts for patient confidentiality are making sure that um, you and your staff are aware of federal and state privacy laws and how they relate to social media. And don't assume that everyone that you work with um, identifies the risk of divulging sensitive information online. I think sometimes, especially with um, the younger generation that I've been working with maybe early mid 20s and late 20s, they don't really understand where some of those boundaries are. There can be issues of some recent med school and nursing school graduates posting from hospital units or other locations in the facility. They may have another job on the floor and they're not taking care of that patient specifically, but what happens, say if that patient crashes and they're on their phone doing something else unrelated to that, when there's an investigation, that phone or what that person is doing could certainly be called into question. And prior to taking photos or testimonials for marketing or advertising, make sure you get the patient's written consent because if you rely on a verbal agreement, as we'll see later, or an informal consent, the patient could always come back and say that was not what they intended, especially if the information ends up being misused or is, is out of control. Ethical concern number two, professional behavior online. Standards expected for healthcare professionals don't change just because it's social media. And I think sometimes people 
um, assume that because it's not interacting face to face or somebody can't really see me that the same rules don't apply. But social media actually raises new circumstances um, for those old established principles. Social media is not private, which you all know. And it's very important to be aware of public perception in your newsfeed and what you have out there and what you post. Is that something that you want patients seeing or in sharing with their family and their public? It's very, very difficult to be friends with a patient because it's really hard to keep that boundary in line and not go down that slippery slope. And posts are never truly deleted. Anything that exists on a server is there forever and could be discoverable, discoverable in court. And of course, even if you delete the post, someone could have taken a screenshot of it and they're still capable of sharing it with others. And if you get a friend request from a patient, politely decline and explain to the patient the reasons why it would not be a good idea for you to accept the request and then redirect them to maybe your your business site or indeed or things like that where it's more appropriate make sure you monitor your own social media feeds and put the highest privacy setting on your own personal accounts and as we said try not to interact personally on social media with um, patients or their families and don't make any comments about patients, coworkers, or your place of employment on social media because a little bit later in the program we'll see how that can get out of hand. Do consider how you'll respond to negative comments online if you have them and monitor patient comments on, on those different sites. Social media can make or break your personal brand or that of your business or your hospital, and you will know more people through social media than you're ever likely to meet face to face in your lifetime. And giving advice online, how do you manage that? So you want to make sure and include disclaimers and disclosure language on your website and your social media accounts and don't offer guidance online that may trigger a duty to care or potentially compromise patient care. I um, recently got a call from a dermatology practice where they had um, an online platform where people could make appointments, but one of the patients figured out how to attach a photo and attached a photo of a skin lesion and that patient didn't have an appointment for two months because they were a new patient. But what happened is that photo went through to staff and because the photo looked so suspicious for cancer, they called us and we actually recommended they work that patient in because there was a potential there could be more damage down the road if they didn't do that based on what that lesion looked like. So we went back and discussed some of the parameters they had on their website about not being able to attach photos and making sure that they had a disclaimer that it was for appointments only and not any patient or personal information other than um, to sign up for the appointments. And also decide how you would respond to any negative comments online. You can use standard language and not identify the patient or share PHI. Consider a statement like, we strive to provide quality care to our patients and we take concerns very seriously. Please call our office at X number and ask to speak with the office manager. And then on the office side or whoever's taking your phone calls, make sure that they have um, the knowledge and or the authority to handle the, the question or concern that the patient has and or route it as appropriate for escalation. And if you see a comment online, I love these, if you're watching those platforms, is thank you for the kind words. We are really proud of our staff and glad to hear that you had a good experience. And it's always nice to see that information out there as well. Ethical concern number four, colleagues' behavior. When you see content posted by colleagues that may appear unprofessional, do you have a responsibility to bring that to their attention that that information is out there? And if it can be truly damaging, do you have a responsibility to your employer um, or the hospital you work with to bring that to their attention? 
If the behavior significantly violates professional norms and the individual does not take appropriate action to resolve the situation, you may need to consider reporting the situation. And Mark will talk more about those situations as well. Ethical concern number five, distracted patient care is similar to distracted driving. Um, I don't know if you all saw in the news recently, I believe it was a surgeon out of California who had a court date and the court date was set up to be virtual, um, but he decided to accept that court date from the operating room while the patient was under anesthesia. And it only took the judge and um, the, the court personnel not very long at all to realize that he was actually operating. And when they asked him about that, he said, yes, but my partner's here, everything's fine. And he holds up his hands and he has a little bit of blood on his gloves. And needless to say, the, the judge shut that down very, very quickly. Um, but that video went viral and um, that provider is in a lot of trouble now with, with the Board of California. In a study that was done, um, these are large percentages. So 55% of um, bypass technicians acknowledged they had been on their phones during surgery. 40% said they knew it was wrong and it was always unsafe, but they did it anyway. And in anesthesi anesthesiology news, the nurse anesthetists and residents were distracted by things like surfing the internet in 54% of the cases, even when they knew they were being watched. Um, that's a little disturbing, and I hope through courses like this and, and professionals becoming more aware um, that we can help educate everyone that's on our healthcare teams to the dangers of doing that. So again, increase awareness and education. Um, be a good role model. Um, set the standard for your group. Don't allow those distractions to get to you. And don't forget the focus is the patient. The next section is to talk, I mean, to text or not to text. Um, text messages may reside on your mobile device indefinitely. They could be exposed to unauthorized third parties due to theft, loss, or recycling of the device. They may be accessed without any level of authentication depending on the services. They're easily intercepted and decrypted with inexpensive equipment. So consider effecting official doc, sorry, consider um, how you're gonna do official documentation in the medical record as well, because if you have patient care information on your phone, that needs to be translated or transferred somehow securely to the patient's medical record. And then again, all information on your device may be discoverable if there is medical information on it and there is a claim or a lawsuit. And when you're texting, HIPAA comes into play again. It has to do with the electronic media discussing your patients. And then another thing to think about is individuals do have the right to request that the information in their medical record be changed. And that includes the information on your phone, which could open up the other content on your phone um, to becoming more public in these situations. Some of the strategies are password protection and encryption, using a secure platform for texting with your devices and that communication, having an organizational policy. Also um, part of that policy, are you gonna wipe down devices that are lost and can you do that remotely? And use of alternative technologies such as vendor supplied secure messaging applications. So do comply with those policies. Make sure you use the passwords as you're supposed to. Are they four digits? Are they six? Do they have to be a mix of characters and letters and numbers? All of those things are important to make the level of security higher. Um, if you have a business device, use that and not your, your personal device. And don't use text talk because again, that can become part of the medical record or part of a court proceeding. And, Exercise caution when texting patient care orders and be aware of hospital policy on whether or not that's even allowable. And in closing, dance like no one is watching, email like it one day may be read aloud in a deposition. 
because everybody's watching. So up next, we have Mark Calvert. He's going to discuss the legal side of social media up close. And then after that, we have Stan Tebot, who's going to discuss Texas torts and liability trends. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point. There we go. And then I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sherry. That was great. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Mark Calvert, and it's a little bit unusual to do this remotely. I, I, I know there's people out there, but I can't see any of you. I hope you can see my screen. I'm going to share it now and uh, and jump in. It's an honor and privilege to be with you. I think you have a right to know uh, my motivation today. My motivation is to help you. I've defended healthcare providers since 1987. Uh, it's my passion. Uh, I like to joke that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's my honor to work with those who could get through organic chemistry because uh, that's where my pre-med days begin to slow. So uh, I still think that the medical profession is the greatest profession in the world. And I like sitting with you and helping you and fighting for you. And that's what I'm doing here today is to try to give you some information to arm you to miss and, and evade uh, potential issues that could be connected to the technology and social media that is upon us. Uh, a little bit more about me. I went to the University of Texas, graduated in 1987. As I mentioned, I've defended healthcare providers since then. I've been board certified since 1994 and have handled a, a zillion different types of claims and matters and lawsuits. Uh, it's a privilege to get to work with Medical Protective and I, I appreciate uh, the Sherry's and also Sarah's here who I work with her virtually every day. She's probably sick of my shtick, let me tell you, but she's great. They have a great Never. department and, and um, so uh, uh, that's, that's kind of the context of where I'm coming from. Somebody wise once said that the best way to learn is by other people's mistakes. And so I want to be able to show you some things here today that can um, hopefully arm you and, and get you ready uh, for the brave new world that is upon us. Uh, I feel obligated to start with a little bit of a joke. Uh, some of you have heard it before, but maybe we can get this get this potty started, as they say, uh, it is Saturday morning. So um, there was a man on a deserted island and he rubbed the proverbial bottle and a genie appeared. And the genie told the man, I'll give you three wishes. Just keep in mind that whatever you request, double that request will be provided to every lawyer in the world. So the man, first of all, has always wanted a Porsche. He asked for a Porsche, voila, the Porsche appears. And the journey remi uh, genie reminded him, look, every lawyer in the world just got two Porsches. So the guy asked for a million dollars, a wheelbarrow full of million dollars comes there and he reminded him that every lawyer in the world now has $2 million. So the man had figured out the pattern here. He's a little bit of a slow learner, but after two rounds, he got it. And he said, you know, I've always wanted to donate a kidney. <laughs> anyway, I know we have a, a little bit of a love-hate relationship <laughs> with uh, doctors and lawyers, but Stan and I are the good guys. We're on your side and we fight for you every day. And so with that, let's, let's dive into some context and some foundation as we work towards uh, how social media uh, can help you and how it, and how it poses risks. I want to do a little bit of a quick refresher of Law 101, some of the key definitions and standards, what must be proved, uh, what are those key words. Uh, just to remind you, and a lot of you know this, some of you may not, but just to refresh you and you'll see how it connects to social media situations, uh, is the template of proof in a, in a medical negligence case. There's really three prongs or, or three links in the chain. The first thing that must be proved by the plaintiff who's bringing the case is that there was negligence, which is a breach of a duty, a violation of the standard of care in a medical case, a failure to act reasonably. 
By the way, this is the same template that's used in car accident cases or in some other general negligence cases. It becomes very complicated, obviously, in something like medicine, but the actual um, arena is really not that complicated. So first element is negligence, the failure to uh, act reasonably. The second element is causation, which is basically, but for the negligence, things would have been better. And then finally, is the notion of damages, which is the measurement of the value of the harm that was experienced by this uh, negligence. Now, the standard of care for healthcare providers, again, is what a reasonable doctor would have done in the same or similar circumstances. The keys on that, what your peers would do, and what the literature says. I think those are the two pillars in a standard of care assessment. Uh, in short, the phrase is be reasonable. That's the overarching principle in the care that you're provided, whether it's on the phone, whether it's uh, with uh, colleagues and consultants, with staff, everything needs to be reasonably done because that's what will be assessed down the road if there's some type of complaint or lawsuit. Um, talked a little bit about causation already. Uh, and cases are fought in both, uh, both trenches. Was there reasonable care? And did that care have anything to do with the outcome? Stan and I have a case right now together where we're fighting for our respective clients on both issues. Did we act reasonably? And did the outcome of the patient really have anything to do with some type of substandard effort? And, and that's the ball game uh, that, that we deal with every day. Um, it's important to also understand that in lawsuits, it is the damages that, that drive them. And that's what attracts um, lawyers. I wanna play a, a brief clip of a, um, a, a movie. I think it's worth watching. I know you probably don't have a lot of extra time, but if you're looking for some kind of older movies that were are high quality and good, uh, Civil Action, it's a great book and it's a decent movie, but it has some elements to the, the movie that I think capture what I'm talking about here and underscore how plaintiff's attorneys look at this. I mean, let's, let's be honest here. We are a uh, hundred people right now talking about what is the opponent going to try to exploit on you? And what can you do to not give them things to, to take out of context or to use to hurt you? That's why we're taking the time to do this today is to better prepare you uh, to, to handle uh, uh, equipment and components of, of new advances such as social media, uh, which will streamline and limit the exposure that you may have to the ravening wolves that are out there and want to take advantage of situations. Uh, Sherry's example on the dermatology is a great one. The hot potato has been handed to the dermatologist when they send in that picture of something that's probably cancer. And maybe a couple of months makes a difference on a fast growing uh, skin cancer. Uh, so a plaintiff's attorney would take advantage of that. Uh, we have to close that gap and, and, and make sure that we have plenty of wording that documents that this is a appointment uh, a forum only, that this is not checked for substantive medical information. Please contact if it's an emergency, whatever the disclaiming language is decided upon. Because this is how plaintiff's attorneys play. We have to understand that. So watch how they take a situation and really manipulate feelings and money. This is a medical case. The judge has not come in yet, but the jury is seated. The plaintiff is brought in very dramatically, clearly very quite injured. And the plaintiff's attorney has made sure to be able to document all the things he cannot do. Your head oh. He can't raise his own headrest. His shoes are untied. Okay. Are you comfortable? Okay. Can't button his shirt or unbutton it. And the good people on the jury are, are digesting it and soaking it up, which is what the plaintiff's attorney wants. The defense attorney starts to panic. 
and over the next 20 seconds, you'll watch that All right. go up. This court is now in session. The Honorable Constance Mullen presiding. Carney versus Massachusetts General Hospital, case number 81-27-25. Attorneys, please state your appearance. Randolph Woodside, Mass General. Greg Monk, Massachusetts General Hospital. Harold Fishdown, Mass General. Jan Schlickman for Paul Carney. Kevin Conway for Mr. Carney, Your Honor. Mr. Schlickman, the court's ready for your opening statement. Now, there's been no evidence presented and that one of the jurors is already crying. Your Honor, if it please the court, the parties involved have agreed to a settlement. We cut it off perfectly because you can see the smirk. Uh, that may be a little dramatic, but frankly, that is kind of how it works. And so with that in mind, we want to be able to navigate and slalom through, um, I guess, self-inflicted mistakes is what how I would define this technology and social media arena. Uh, damages attract lawyers. And this was a case I had where that lady popped that leg off so quick and wanted me to take a picture of it so that the doctor and the insurance company could see what she was having to fight every day. Um, so that's the bottom line for them. Real quick primer on how to avoid these things, obviously. And these, this is the stuff for other presentations. But the three things that I see that drive lawsuits and, and, and claims are first, some type of bad outcome, a legally savvy patient uh, or family, and then poor bedside manner by the practitioner. Usually a combination of two of those will lead to some type of claim or lawsuit. So a reminder, best practices, good care and good judgment, a great bedside manner, and of course, good records to protect you later on. All right, let's jump into the meat of this and, and try to connect the dots with what we just went over with the template. There's a ton of pros of social media and technology. Uh, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when faxes came out and it was on that rolled up paper, uh, waxy, uh, so many advances and there's many, many pluses to it. And I'm not saying that you should put your head in the sand and dodge all of the technology and media out there. You're not going to be able to compete by doing that. Uh, your peers are doing it and you're going to have to swim in those waters somewhat. So the benefit of it is obviously to allow patients to be aware of your presence and your skill set, your group's uh, presence and skill set, what's, what's uh, offered. Uh, it also, of course, has a conduit for communication that is really unparalleled. It can advertise the successes. You can also easily refer patients to things like YouTube for contemplated surgeries that can actually watch the surgery there. The Mayo Clinic, who has the printouts on everything, diabetes, hypertension, these things could be on a Facebook page or a website and uh it's it's wonderful i mean it helps patients it helps the doctor it makes everything more streamlined it uh, it can make it very very efficient but it's a it's a, a minefield it's shark infested waters and there are cons to the the new technology and uh, social media and so i want to talk about five areas uh, websites online reviews being recorded, texting and emails, and social uh, media missteps. I could talk for a long time 
I think there are other areas. There's a ton of examples. I'll do my best to touch on all of them and then I'll leave some time for any questions that you may have and we can round table things. I'm, I'm glad Stan's here because he can jump in too. I'm sure he's seen as many or more than I have. So the first area that I wanna talk about is uh, relates to websites. Um, when this comes up, <clears throat> it typically comes up well, we've learned. So the, uh, the first couple of times it came up for me was my client getting cross-examined in a deposition setting about their website. And after, after about the second time, and this was probably 10 years ago or so, I said, okay, this is, this is something we work into our preparation meetings. And that is talking to the healthcare provider about the content of their website. Uh, this is a, uh, podiatry website and it's very simple you know we're not going into the details here of all the pull downs but just look at the uh, quote at the top there and even the name of the cotton pick and practice is dangerous uh, in law you cringe a little bit when you start using the word promise so uh, that opens you up to some attacks so what is the follow-up here? Well, this, this is based on an actual case that I had because this is what happens. You're deposed and boom, they, they Google you and they look up licensing board information, they look up website, they look up articles that you've written, et cetera. And so here's, here's the flow of a deposition. Uh, they immediately jump in and grab onto that uh, motto of the promise uh, to get the best result. Uh, of course, the doctor's defensive. They had nothing to do with it. The lawyer's not going to let up with that. Um, you know, here's the motto. What are you doing with that? I'm not involved. How does that make you look to a jury that you're not aware of what's going on with your own website? It already gets you backpedaling uh, when, when, you know, that's, that's not the best direction to be going. Um, and ultimately kind of confessing that the, the client who has had multiple surgeries and complications did not get the best uh, as is promised on the website. Um, so what is the takeaway here? I would say right now, and don't do it on your phone, wait until we're done, but look at your website, look at biographical information that you have submitted, whether it's to a facility whatever's available on the internet, uh, to an academic institution. Um, how accurate is it? Are there embellishments? Those will be exposed and uh, it will come back to haunt you. We see it sometimes with football coaches. I remember a few years ago, I think it was Notre Dame, somebody hired a new football coach and his resume was scrutinized and he had overstated some things. I mean, I think he put in there, he had fought in Vietnam and he hadn't and uh, had, had gotten a master's in something and he hadn't. Uh, these, are, these are just, um, again, routine self-inflicted errors and plaintiff's attorneys who are hungry to, uh, to hurt are going to do that kind of digging. So is your biographical information accurate? Many times on a website, we give kind of the, the highlights in the hit parade. We've got to be careful. Um, what kind of promises does your website make? Uh, the wording needs to be, be careful. We, I see this all the time with cosmetic surgeons and with others who are in very competitive, you know, uh, specialties. And it's things like, you know, voted the best for the Cypress area of Houston. And then you come to find out that, you know, they took a, they took a poll at the local elementary school and, and he and he won three to two versus the competitor. Um, that's at least something that's going to be brought before the, the Texas Medical Board. Um, and it can be a haunting representation when you have a billboard to that effect or something on your website that makes that kind of uh, uh, over the top statement. I know we're trying to get business. I get that. Uh, we're, we're in the same arena in that respect. We want the people who can assign us business 
to be impressed with our performances and our accomplishments, but let's make sure they're accurate and let's not go over the top in our promises. So basic tips on these things. I say keep the website and the biographical information simple, make sure it's honest, and frankly, less is more. Uh, so that's website information. Take a look at yours and other biographic information. If it's not just pristine and accurate, go ahead and clean that up ASAP so that you don't give a potential heat seeking missile to the other side. Second category, uh, online reviews. This is uh, an aspect of the advent of technology and social media, which I know causes a lot of consternation and challenge to uh, providers. Um, unfortunately, we're lumped in the same area as a restaurant. And when you know the local uh, Mexican food place has somebody go on there and describe how they pulled out a 18 inch hair from their fajitas, uh, the, the people looking at that aren't super thrilled with it. And so when there's a negative online review about a doctor or staff, it has some ripple effect. Um, it's not easy to uh, to deal with. It's 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 complicated. But I wanted to to get this out on the table because I am constantly, uh, you know, contacted by providers saying this review has happened. What what can I do? I want to sue them. I how do I get it removed? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is actually an excerpt from a negative online review from a patient of a doctor that I am helping. And this is just a, a redacted clip. It doesn't identify any uh, information, but it, but it shows you the detail that the guy went into in attacking the doctor. And I, I felt sorry for him that this was happening. Uh, so again, they're hard to stop. As far as what to do, Sherry's touched on some of this in her presentation, but uh, you've got to not take the bait. You cannot personally respond. First of all, once you uh, acknowledge that the person is a patient, you've violated HIPAA and, and other privacy laws. And that's something that you don't want to do. Um, also, it just, uh, there's, there's just no good way to, to win the fight with the skunk, as they say, you know, they, they like it and it's not our natural arena. Now, there are some options. Um, as Sherry mentioned, you know, kind of ignoring it and hoping it goes away is the most common one. Um, I tend to be pretty proactive and try to help my clients solve things. So we've, we've come up with some, some approaches that you might want to consider. Uh, one of them is to have a positive review published by an ally, uh, a really good and trusted patient. Um, maybe even um, a staff member uh, who does just a great review about you, about your offices, doesn't really acknowledge or address the negative re review per se. Um, and I've seen that happen uh, and I think it can be successful. So you have a, a negative review, but underneath it, you have a glowing review, can water down the negative review a little bit. Another one is to uh, get help from an attorney. Um, you can uh, send a cease and desist letter to the, uh, the patient who's making the complaint. You can even mention the possibility of uh, a defamation lawsuit, asking them to take it down. Sometimes those are hard to take down. Uh, I think that the Yelp and Google reviews, it's not very easy for them to just go in there and remove it, but sometimes they can soften it uh, like I was mistaken, I've rechecked my records and I actually was sent the information I asked for. So the above review uh, should, should be, you know, considered in that light. Words to that effect. So you can get an attorney to put a little pressure on the person. That can stir some things up. I would proceed cautiously in that area. But as far as possible options to consider, having an attorney get involved is one. Now, I actually got involved for an orthopedic surgeon who I had defended for years, and he got one of these crappy reviews, um, and he was beside himself. And so what I did is I went in and gave him a review because he had actually treated family of mine. And so here's my review. It was still online. I found it the other day. Um, 
and uh, you can see that I went in and really sang his praises, um, basically kind of in a veiled way, shamed the person who had filed the negative review and how you know, it's kind of a cheap shot and the doctor can't just you know step out and, and address it himself. There's privacy laws, but I'm here to, to assure you that he's great and that I would let family be operated on him in a second. And, and that was still resting underneath the negative review. Um, I think it helped him. And, and uh, so those are some options to consider. I know it's a tough area uh, and, you know, just for what it's worth in the last, you know, three decades of doing this, I've noticed some some real changes in, in medical practice. I know reimbursements are down. I'll, I'll throw that one out there. But the two I've seen the most are, number one, the quality of the staff of doctors I deal with has gradually diminished. Um, I, that's probably from, you know, salary issues, et cetera. But you just, sometimes you don't have the great office person that you need. Um, I recommend that you remedy that they can be worth their weight in gold. But the other thing that I've seen is, I would say a deteriorating mental health um, average for, for the patient population that you see. Uh, so when you take people who aren't doing that well and you give them uh, technology that in seconds they can file a negative review, these things become very, very, very challenging to stop. Um, I offer you a, a couple of cr uh, creative ways to deal with it, but um, uh, it, it's out there and it's tough to stop it because uh, of, the, of the, the dysfunctional patient population. Okay, the third area I'd like to address on the hit parade here, and that's the idea of being recorded. <clears throat> um, I know in Texas, we're a one party state. So one person who is aware of the recording can record a conversation, even if the other uh, participants are not aware. Uh, you probably have been recorded, both audio and video. Some of it is innocent. People legitimately want to be able to understand what is being said to them. Uh, sometimes English isn't their first language, et cetera. So sometimes the recording I think is not nefarious and they're actually trying to get information then go home and look it up and slow it down and re-listen to it. But other times it's a little bit of a setup. And um, so uh, you have to be aware that you're being recorded. Now, you can put a sign up saying, pursuant to uh, HIPAA and other privacy laws, no audio or video recording is allowed in this office. Um, but that's probably not going to stop it. That'll stop some of it. It's not going to stop all of it. So you got to be on your A game. You got to realize that uh, this technology can capture you and may well uh, be used aggressively. Now, what I'm going to show you is something that's just off the internet that we found, and this was not this doctor's finest hour, and it um, it looks terrible. <laughs> Know when they make an appointment that they may not be seen in a timely manner. Are you kidding me? Do you know how many people I've got seven rooms okay. back there? I made an appointment at 6 30 because I knew it'd be out of my bed an hour and, and 45 minutes. We've already been working on you. you. We've you done a me. urine test on you. I've Nobody's, seen you. You came in and said, I'm going to check your pee. I'm Does that take three appointment. seconds, you think? I don't know how long. Do you want to be seen or not? I want to go home and get in my bed. I'm then miserable. fine, get the hell out. Get your money and get the hell out. I did. But that See you right later. There is just rude. That's really? Very really? Rude. If you go to Care Spot, you're waiting for three hours. I don't know. Go to the ER mean. and wait for nine hours. I don't okay, you can get, get out of her face. Get the fuck out of my office. I will now. I will complain with a better business. Mom, I got it on video, so it doesn't matter. And then, go. And What's your daughter? This. My What's daughter your name? Is you're recording this? Give me my phone. I'm, oh, my mom, I'm, I'm, I'm calling him, please. People are getting here. I'm calling the police. Give me my phone. I'm calling the police. Can you believe that? That's not good. And the fact that we were able to dig it up is uh, is not good. Um, so this is where the technology kind of morphs into then being published. And we have a, a social media fiasco and it's going to, to haunt those providers. Uh, here's another one that happened, which was somewhat bizarre. Younger doctor was a resident, I believe. 
Um, this gal called for an Uber, the Uber arrived, but it was somebody else's Uber and she was not, um, believing that and not happy. And so she decided to battle the driver and somebody videotaped it. And it was uh, a little bit of an ugly situation. Angeli Ramkasun attacked the Uber driver in downtown Miami for refusing to give her a ride because another passenger had actually ordered the car. She goes nuts, first punching him. Seriously? Yeah, seriously, get some help. At one point, she tries to knee the driver and gets thrown to the ground. She just won't give up. It's not her Uber driver. <laughs> It's terrible, but the effect on her, then the effect on the residency program that she was in, uh, I mean, this, her name is out there now. It, once she's licensed, uh, patients will Google her. Uh, this misstep in that setting and not appreciating that, you know, when you're a professional, you always have to have your game face on. You always have to be behaving in a, in a good and, and decent manner because hospitals, and uh, CEOs and partners and patients, none of them want to see this kind of meltdown. Uh, a fourth area that I want to be able to uh, touch on here uh, relates to texting. Um, and that's obviously uh, something that Sherry went into. Um, I think it's a great way to streamline communications, but uh, as with everything else, there are some uh, potential downsides to it. So I want to try to touch on this a little bit here. This is actually a um, picture that, well, let me kind of set the stage here and, and my computer, I don't know, this automatically is popping things in. So I guess I'm just going to let it, um, hopefully it'll stop and not go to the next thing. Nope, it did. Okay, so we represent a cosmetic surgeon in the greater Houston area. Great guy. He texts a lot. We've handled some board matters and lawsuits for him, and there's always a texting issue. Uh, we've had some, some very frank discussions. Um, so I, for all the reasons that Sherry mentioned, this is a ticking time bomb. Uh, so we have a case right now we're defending for him. It's a wound healing case. The patient sent pictures. He didn't get her in the hospital. The pictures he took later don't seem as bad as the ones that she took on the day because the lighting is different, et cetera. It creates um, a, a mess uh, when there's a back and forth with the patient. Uh, often personal health information is divulged casual language is used as Sherry mentioned in her presentation and you as the provider are making some commitments and giving some some advice that you're going to have to defend and, and answer for. I much prefer when you're dealing with a patient to uh, it's fine to give them your cell phone number. I think that's great. I've had some recent health issues. I have my doctor's uh, cell phone numbers. I like to be able to reach out to them. Uh, and, but I'll tell you my, the one doctor I have, a cardiologist, great guy, his texting to me is very cryptic. I will send a long question or a long comment about something that, that, you know, is going on and he will make a very, very cryptic comment and it will be something like, call me or let's talk later today. Uh, those are the types of things I think that you should use in texting. It's fine to receive that information, then react appropriately, if not a bit cryptically. Um, for this particular thing, I think it's best to just say, let's, let's talk about it. I need to see you in the office. Can you present in the office? Uh, some people have some pressing matters. They may need to go to the emergency room. That should be in the text. I, I, I can't see you right now what you've sent me is concerning to me. I need you go to the emergency room to have this evaluated. That's a text that I think will get you some, uh, some safety, if you will. Um, so 
here's here's a, another aspect of that text and here's something i don't like so the doctor calls in the antibiotics what's the next phrase he uses good luck that is just not something i want blown up in the courtroom or in a deposition to have him uh discuss it um i think he's trying to help her but it will be portrayed as cutting corners as 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 not being interested enough to 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 see the patient i mean lay people don't have the same knowledge and information obviously and we don't want the we don't want the stewardess and steward flying the airplane and that that's the imagery that plaintiffs attorneys use so you have to take control of the situation and get it to where it's a, a phone conversation so if you're if you're a uh, a hospitalist and you get a text from a family member of a patient that you're seeing and they have some questions, swing by that room and talk to them or get them on the phone. I would not have a long thread of back and forth with patients or patients' families. I think there's too many ways to um, misconstrue things, to not understand things, both on your part and on their part. Uh, get it to where it's a phone call or where they come into the office if that's what's uh, indicated. Uh, other aspects of testing, obviously, are with consultants <clears throat> and peers about patients that you're sharing. And as was mentioned earlier, you've got to be careful with divulging a bunch of pers uh, uh, private health information, uh, personal health information. Um, be careful listing that out that can be sent to somebody uh, that you didn't mean to send it to, you know? So when you do a, um, you know, hey, Dr. Smith, I wanna talk to you about Benny Jones and his Brazilian butt lift that he had yesterday, and you send that text out, and then you get a response that says, was this meant for me? And it is, you know, your, your uh, dog's groomer or something because oops i'm sorry i put that on the wrong thing god the names are similar <clears throat> so be real careful what you're popping into the the you know content of the text as having that private information um here's a sample that i've put in there where you don't name the full name you're communicating to someone and letting them know where you stand i think that's fine I think it's also good to say, do you have a moment to talk? I know everybody's busy and the text really streamlines things and it's, I don't wanna to talk to them for seven minutes. Literally get on the phone and say, I've got one minute to talk or I got 30 seconds. This guy's ready, his blood pressure is a little bit up, but I'm okay with it, that's his baseline. I'd like you to take a look at him, thank you. This same cardiologist that, that I uh, told you about a few moments ago, um, he's somebody that we use as an expert. I mean, I just like him a lot and he's, he's, he's become a friend. I watch him text. <clears throat> he's a super fast texter. So if somebody texts him, he responds quick again with one word, two words. Uh, the other thing that he does is he'll jump on the phone, but those conversations and I've sat there in the office and watched him are stunningly short. I mean, he's busy and he cuts right to the chase. You know, I've given them, uh, you know, Lipitor and um, they seem to be doing well. What what else do you need? I mean, it's very, it's not rude, but it's, it's cryptic, it's clear, it's correct. Uh, and then of course being available. Hey, do we need to talk further? Yes, I can talk to you at noon. Offer to talk, offer to see them, offer to see the patient. Uh, and those things can be in writing. Again, we want to understand, as was pointed out earlier, that this is creating a record and the, the plaintiff's attorneys will ask for these things. So I guess mental imagery that I would like for you to practice doing is all of these things that publish things, website, biography, texting, emailing, I want you to envision those in your chart. I want you to envision those being reviewed by an opposing expert against you. The language, the content, the, the, the length of it, et cetera, will be subject to scrutiny if there's any kind of lawsuit uh, and write it as if it's going to be in front of a jury. What do you wanna show? You always wanna show caring. You always wanna show competence. 
we can get a little lax. It can become a little locker roomish uh, in all of our professions. And, I, and I'm not holier than thou. There are some doctors I represent who I prefer over others. There are some that I have called a knucklehead more than once. Um, and if I text that out and that person saw that, I would be mortified and embarrassed. I know that's the same thing with respect to patients. You've got a 500 pound guy who just can't get a hold of himself on something. Be real careful how you describe that guy. He may be the guy that sues you in a lawsuit and you don't want a jury seeing you calling him a name in a text to a colleague. So you want to keep it very professional and medical record like that's, that's, you know, my passionate plea to you to help protect you because Stan and I can defend you usually on the medicine, but those types of things can enrage a jury. And our system is changing some, and I know you guys have, have, have seen it and felt it, whether it's with elections or, or different types of things that are happening in the culture, things are shifting a little bit. And so judges and juries are not what they were 10 or 15 years ago in terms of how they look at things. Um, it was hard to convict a doctor of malpractice uh, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, there was just such a level of respect. Um, that has been eroded. And so uh, we have, we many times have juries with the so-called have nots who are very interested in making sure that the haves are kept in line. And uh, it's a brave new world. And I'm just giving you information from the front lines. You wanna be real careful how you refer to patients and what you say in your records and in these casual conversations in the text messages. Um, I say include some of these things in your chart. You can forward those. You know how to, to take a picture of a text thread and send it to a trusted staff member and say, put this in Mr. Jones' chart. I would do that because three years from now, your text may have been deleted. It might be hard to get them from the, uh, the companies. That's not always that easy. Um, and it's, it's something to, to, to consider doing is putting it in your chart. Another thing that I advise is when there are some uh, significant pieces of information about a patient um, conveyed to you or there's action you need to do, uh, I recommend, and I'm holding my phone up here, uh, just taking your, your smartphone. I have an iPhone. There is an audio memo feature here and I dictate letters all the time. Uh, so I may be reporting to, to Sarah who's attending this and I might have a, a very in, interesting uh, conversation with the plaintiff's attorney or an expert or a colleague on a case. And I may say, you know what? I gotta do about three things related to this call. I'm gonna send a letter to Sarah, let her know what has happened with this call and outline what our plan is. Um, Boom, I do that, I can email that. We have voice operated software that types it out. I take some time to review it and rewrite it and it's sent to Sarah. That's the same type of thing that I think you should consider doing when you receive a text or an email or a phone call from a colleague. So they have kind of passed the hot potato to you about a patient. Let's say it's, it's, it's 1 a.m and you get a call from somebody, hey, this person's not doing good, I think we need to do X, Y, and Z. And you make some comment and it's back and forth with the colleague and the consultant. What do you do? Before you turn over and go to sleep, consider sending something to your office about that conversation. Why? In a year when there's a lawsuit, you're gonna say, geez, I remember getting a call and I remember talking about the patient. Well, did they tell you that they had a white blood cell count of 19,000? Nope, he didn't tell me that. Well, he says he did, and he's a co-defendant in the case. So the plaintiff's attorney is going to fold his arms and say, it's either Smith or Jones. They either told her about the white blood cell count or they didn't. And they're button heads. Well, guess what? If you dictated an audio memo and it's a record and you've sent it to your office, you say, well, I've summarized that conversation and here's what they said. You know, they did not tell me about that white blood cell count or the hospital nurse did not tell me about that blood pressure. I dictated an audio memo on that. Now, 
look, I know this is complicated and you guys are juggling a lot of balls. And you might be saying to yourself, come on, Calvert, I can't dictate an audio memo after everything that is, uh, that is said to me. I get that. But as the, as the saying goes, be wise as serpents, if not harmless as doves. Be very good at triaging and prioritizing what is hot. You know the calls you get <clears throat> that pose a little bit of risk, that things can go south. That's maybe 10%, right? Maybe it's 1%. <clears throat> Excuse me. So on maybe 1% of these interactions, whether it's text or phone calls, do some type of chart entry. It might be something that you that you type out and send to your staff. It might be something that you dictate. But on the ones that are key, capture that information and get it into the chart. Now, another thing on texting, and then this is a big area, so I'm spending a little bit more time on this. But another thing about texting is uh, the plaintiff's attorneys are gonna ask for texts. That's become very common. And uh, I know Sarah sees that all the time and I'm sure Stan does too. Uh, we ask for texts. I want to know what the what the plaintiff and the the plaintiff's wife sent to the doctor or to their kid when they were in the ER or whatever it is. So I try to get that information too. So it's a battle for information. It's a battle for truth. You're going to probably have to turn over text messages at some point in the future, even if you're not the subject of the lawsuit. You may be the recipient from the guy who is the subject of the lawsuit. So. You want to really um, be ready for that. And I just say overall, uh, raise your game in terms of how it looks. Um, you want both form and substance to be uh, spot on. Okay, last area, and I'm in the home stretch, I promise. Social media missteps, um, we've, we've played some of them. Uh, this is just kind of a general be careful. Uh, there are so many different things that can go wrong when you don't stay within the bell curve of being reasonable. Um, here's an example. A New York public relations executive is out of a job this morning. She is apologizing for what's being called the tweet heard around the world. On Friday, Justine Sacco wrote on Twitter, quote, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding, I'm white. Her words sparked global outrage before her flight to South Africa even landed. The response from her employer was also quick. Media conglomerate IAC terminated her as communications director Saturday. On Sunday, Sacco said, words cannot express how sorry I am and how unnecessary it is for me to apologize to the people of South Africa who I have offended due to a needless and careless tweet. Um, yeah, we got to keep our powder dry. Uh, we don't, we don't have quite the flexibility of just saying being loose with our, with our comments. Uh, sad that she said it, sad that she thought it, but really dumb that she communicated it. Uh, same with this gal too. Um, this is a cosmetic surgeon, I think out of Georgia and, uh, was not very wise in terms of doing some uh, I guess selfies, self videos of her dancing around the operating room with the staff. Um, can you imagine these things being played if something goes wrong in that surgery? And I've got several plastic surgery cases right now where something went wrong and this surfacing, that that was a component of the, of the surgery earlier uh, before the complication is, uh, is a kill shot. I mean, I just can't imagine this. She had them apple bottom jeans. The woman known as Dr. Booty, infamous for dancing and singing around her sedated patients, isn't operating anymore. Okay, ladies, now let's start sexy nation. Wendell Boutte agreed to give up her medical license for at least two and a half years. But those questionable videos aren't even mentioned in court documents. I don't know. I, it's, it, words can't really capture the judgment issue. That's a judgment issue. Um, we just did a quick Google search on doctors uh, getting disciplined for political positions, and this one popped up. Uh, this was a, a, a resident at Vanderbilt and kind of a, you know, uh, an anti-Trumpster and, and um, kind of went out of his way to make sure that people knew that. Um, that is a potential problem. Uh, it's not 
where you're at on the political spectrum. It's having the poor judgment to convey things that are objectively controversial uh, because uh, it's a close call, but about half the people who you treat aren't gonna be happy with the position you take on a controversial issue. Half of them will, but about half of them won't. So it's best to be real wary and discreet on publishing your positions on some of these controversial issues. I'm not advocating to be a blah um, a person who has no passion, who has no interest, who won't speak their truth. Then I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying be real careful of speaking that truth and also be aware that it has impact on people that might be important to you, patients, administrators, colleagues, et cetera. Um, obviously we've talked about privacy laws and, and these are just uh, really no brainers, frankly, um, on, on publishing things, uh, just, just a little bit uh, nutty and out of line. That should be, that should be a, an electric shock uh, line in the sand. I mean, that's, that's a, that's where that, you know, your dog has the collar and if they cross into the neighbor's yard, there's a little shock. We should never go into this realm, um, because, uh, that's just got a flashing light of danger with respect to uh, HIPAA. And so we return to where we began and that's going to connect the dots for you. And that is to be reasonable. Be reasonable in the use of technology. Use it to your benefit. Be guarded, be careful, be reasonable, and uh, try to evade some of these controversies that can uh, rain down upon you some, some challenges. Okay, well, I think I'm finishing on schedule to allow uh, several minutes of questions if you have them. And so I will probably stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna get my techie guy to help me with that. And if you want to give me some questions, either by chat or orally, lay it on me. Mark, this is Sherry. The one question I see um, is about texting and HIPAA compliance. So when you talk about using text messages, can you please explain how they can be HIPAA compliant as most platforms for texting are not? Right. So, you know, in general, you, and you guys know HIPAA probably as well as we do, but, you know, HIPAA is, a, is, is the federal privacy law and the publishing of personal health information uh, that's not consented to is, is, uh, is not allowed. Now, my argument when you're texting a, so there's texting patients and family, and then there's texting peers. So let's talk about patients and family first. If it's the patient, and they've texted you, uh, I think you've got a very strong argument that they are um, consenting to this being a means of communication where personal health information can be uh, exchanged. I just think you have to be careful in, in doing so, uh, careful in mentioning and careful in the content. Uh, if it's family member, I think that you need to make sure that they're on the, the release, you know, uh, I think most offices and most hospitals and, and institutions do have something that allows you to talk to people and you list out who those people are. I mean, I, I had surgery six months ago and I had to list out who the people were that they could talk to. I think if you get a text from Johnny's mom about his broken arm, uh, you need to, you know, that if, if it's a minor grade, if Johnny is 32, um, did Johnny list mom as someone that he wants you to be able to, to text with? You can open up a lot of problems texting with family members who Johnny doesn't want them to know uh, that he has a broken arm or whatever. Um, so is there a release that's involved? And then obviously texting colleagues. Uh, if the colleague is involved in the care, um, you know, there's a kind of a business association uh, situation there. It's as if you're talking to them in the hallway, in my opinion, um, you can communicate also in the chart. Uh, but I, I like the, I like using names that don't divulge personal health information. Um, now the, the risk of that is confusing patients. So if you say, well, the hernia repair who's in ICU, 
I saw them and they appear ready for discharge. Well, there may be three hernia repairs in there. So that's why I like the idea of you have some general discussion, but you eventually move to call me. And then you can have a discussion about, yeah, I'm a hospitalist. You're the orthopedic surgeon. I've seen her. I think she can go home, but she is still having some back pain. You probably want to set up a follow-up with her. Um, just wanted to let you know that. And you have this back and forth that's oral and not the back and forth that contains personal health information uh, in the text. I think you should treat the text like a medical record and it's a live grenade and you have to be very, very careful what you're divulging because it might make it to people who don't belong in it. I've, I'm not a techie at all, but I have heard of people not being addressed in texts that end up receiving texts. Uh, so that opens up Pandora's box on some of these things. Um, be very, very careful, very, very careful on that. Um, but I, I, I do agree with the idea that uh, um, you shouldn't assume that the texting is HIPAA compliant and therefore it should be, a, do you have a moment to talk today about a mutual patient? That's a safe text. And if, if you have the right now gene where it has to be done right now, then try to call them. Do it, do it, to, do it verbally. That's the safest thing. Any other, any other questions at this point? Anybody videotaping themselves in surgery or doing procedures? <laughs> um, Tracy, did you see any other questions in the comment box, the chat? Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't look like it. Um, I'm happy to, to, I'm certainly going to listen to Stan and I'm happy to answer any questions after his as well, but, um, right. muted. <laughs> I, I see something where it says, uh, okay, let's see here. Um, using patient initials or room number for peer text. I think that that's a safer way to do it. I like that as a general idea, surgery videos, the video of the operation. I mean, um, I'm sure Stan can. Hi, everybody. This is Mark Calvert. I've been on for a little while. I haven't looked at myself with that degree of intensity since I was about 16. It kind of made me gag a little bit, but. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I do see I do see a question. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it. It's along these same lines. It says, if a colleague texts you a message that includes PHI, what is the best response? Can you reply if you don't include PHI or does that violate HIPAA by acknowledging that you would talk to them about it later? Um, some of this is uncharted waters, but as I mentioned in the in the taped presentation, uh, when you're communicating with a colleague about a common patient, uh, that's allowed. Um, the danger is the information surfacing uh, with someone else who shouldn't be privy to that conversation, but that could occur, uh, that, that could occur with an email, that could occur with a hallway chat. So I think you, you wanna be careful uh, and make sure that it's going back and forth to the correct person. I think eventually more cryptic language is good and then a, and then a verbal discussion. Um, I know that that takes more time, but I think it's uh, kind of the safer way to reach the climactic uh, part of the discussion. There are encrypted apps. There are some, some ways to, to approach making this more safe. Um, I think with colleagues, it's usually pretty safe my big concern is when you're texting patients and they're texting you and you start making diagnosis based on pictures of things that they've taken on their skin or, or uh, uh, symptoms that they're conveying to you and you haven't really had a chance to explore it, I think that that can come back and haunt you. So I just, uh, my passion is to try to help healthcare providers 
avoid these landmines. And so you want to be be careful not to have this long thread as if you're talking with a bestie about, um, you know, your favorite uh, movie. Okay, that's the only question I see in writing. And I'm not begging for questions. It's Friday evening. I know people want to get rolling on some stuff. Um, any other questions? Does anybody want to ask anything orally? You got me captive here. I'm in my big spacious library, which is a virtual background. <laughs> and just to let everybody know, Mark, at this point, we are live here with you on Friday afternoon. So please feel free to ask us any questions that you have. Yeah, we're fair game. We're captive. And we may have answered everything. That makes me feel good if we did. We have another question. Uh, what about the video visits? Ah. Well, um, look, that is also uh, somewhat of a new area, as we know, and I know that's exploded with COVID. Um, heck, I mean, me being recorded on that prior uh, speech, I, I realize, you know, some of my annoying mannerisms and uh, have to work on some things, but um, first of all, I would say that on a televisit, the likelihood of you being recorded goes up. They can put a camera in the corner. Again, some of it is, you know, innocent. They just want to be able to look at it later and understand what you're saying and Google the words. But understand that, uh, you know, the chances of being videotaped increase or audio taped if it's some, some kind of um, audio discussion. Um, I think that... Uh, Again, I would be on your A game. Uh, I would go through symptoms. I would encourage them to come in if there's any doubts. You want to put the ball in their court somewhat. Um, you know, I live 57 miles away. I really can't come in that easily. Okay, well, it'd be preferred if I could see your elbow, but uh, or if I could touch and examine your elbow. But based on what I see and based on what you're telling me, these are my following thoughts take these steps, do this, conservative therapy, whatever, communicate with us in a week, um, call me if it gets worse. But, uh, you know, as I've mentioned before, you know, have that soap in your mind, you know, have that subjective discussion, objective uh, assessment and plan so that if an expert is critiquing this and it is videotaped by the patient, that you're touching all of the bases. The, uh, I guess the analogy is in baseball, you know, it doesn't matter how great your hit is. If you line one down the third base line all the way to the corner, if you miss first base or you, or you run directly to second base rather than touching first base, you're going to be out. And so you want to touch all the bases on a televisit just like you would an in-person visit. Um, and Another tip I heard just, just a couple of days ago, uh, and actually it was from, um, I think maybe it was Sherry Moore, who said that her, I think that her father was a veterinarian and her mother had always talked to the receptionist about smiling when they talked on the phone because someone who smiles is much more likely to be compassionate, engaging, kind, etc. I think that when you're interacting with a increasingly uh, dysfunctional patient population, your attitude and bedside manner is going to dictate a lot of how they feel about that visit. And so having uh, a kind disposition, a look on your face that is kind, coaching your staff in that regard will really uh, set people at ease and will grease the skids. Um, and sometimes with a televisit, that's doubly important because you just don't have the uh, the warmth can, that can naturally occur when you're in person in the same room. Um, I don't know if there was more to that question than, than that, but let me know if there was. Any other questions? I don't see any in the little, the little folder. Mark, there is another question that says, this may be a silly question, but how do you correct yourself when you do a misdiagnosis from a televisit? So uh, I would like to know kind of what, 
what we're talking about in terms of a, a misdiagnosis. Um, let's see, I'm looking to see, I don't see that question, but uh, how do you correct the record? Or how do you correct with the patient or adjust? I mean, I, I guess I could touch on all of those. Uh, let's say that you diagnosed GERD and it turns out to be some type of cardiac issue, uh, maybe based on you thinking about it or maybe based on a study coming back. Update the, update the record, you know, uh, received lab values that indicate that there are some cardiac issues. Um, have adjusted diagnosis and communicated with the patient, contact the patient. I have some updated information for you. I want you to proceed to the hospital or I want you to proceed to such and such location uh, and you know, be transparent. Why didn't you get this the first time? I didn't have all of the information, now I do. I have more information than I did or this sometimes evolves and uh, uh, I would make sure that it's documented in the record. Um, you know, the thing about, and I don't know if I, I don't know if this particular presentation touched on the, you know, the audit trails, but, uh, if you're going to make an update to the record, go ahead and acknowledge it with a, you know, an all caps, you know, update or addendum. Don't run away from that. You know, it's the Watergate rule. It's not the crime. It's the cover up. You don't want to go in and try to mess with changing it because it does leave a digital footprint. They'll be able to see that later when they get the audit trail. So just be, um, you know, be honest on that. Be transparent. Here is my new diagnosis. And the reason for it is received labs or uh, symptoms, you know, did research, looked at an up to date article, whatever it might be, and then be prepared to defend that. Uh, another question here, it says, in my specialty, I do a lot of advocacy for individuals with different diagnoses. I've been invited to join Facebook groups related to these diagnoses, but have not thoughts on this. Look, I think it's, I think it's fine. Uh, I, I wouldn't want you to, um, to avoid being able to share your skill set and to help others. I would be discreet on the case studies. You know, I do a lot of presentations and I try to uh, change the facts some, certainly change the names. If you go over anything, obviously make it uh, pretty sterile and neutral as if it's in a, a medical article, make that case study not really uh, assigned to one particular uh, individual. Another thing is to have in your records where they sign off on allowing their information redacted to be used in educational purposes or or things like that, you can get consent forms to that effect or put it on something that they sign when they come into your office. Um, we have a comment here, no matter where the visit took place, call the patient. Uh, yeah, I, I think communication is is key. And, and you know, again, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a little bit older uh, probably than the average age here, but, uh, I think something's lost in translation on emails and texting. Um, and so it's always better to talk, particularly professionals to a patient, because I think that you can calm and soothe and inform better like we're doing right now versus pounding out a few sentences in a text or in an email. It does take a little bit of time, but that's just that commitment to the craft that uh, has to be there. Again, we prioritize what really what patients we should call and what what issues we should call about. I'm not saying calling everybody about everything, but you know the ones that that need their hand held more than others, and you certainly know the issues that are a little more dangerous or concerning than others. On those, I would take an extra few seconds. I don't think you'd regret it. I you know, saw. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Mark. Go ahead. I was just going to jump in on on the idea of boundary issues. Again, I'm not sure if I touched on that in this presentation, but uh, we see that a lot with both board uh, matters and lawsuits. Boundary issues are kind of exploding. So I would have a default of having a chaperone. If you're going to examine any sensitive area, make a note that there was a chaperone there and put their name in there. Um, even have the chaperone possibly make a note or, or sign in the record or indicate that they were there. 
uh, you'd be surprised. We've handled a lot of things and it's no longer just, you know, male doctor, female patient or vice versa. It's now um, same sex, you know, male doctor, male patient, filing a complaint or even a lawsuit. Hey, he, he touched me inappropriately. And then it's a he said, he said, and it just can be, you know, just a devastating wrestling match on trying to prevail in those situations, particularly in this Me Too environment where there's a little bit of a, you're, you're uh, presumed guilty, not presumed innocent. So boundary issues, be real careful um, and document and have a chaperone. That's just a, I throw that tidbit out there because I'm seeing those cases repeatedly. Um, Audrey, I didn't see any more questions, but I did see where two people raised their hands. I don't know if they can unmute themselves and ask or if they added those questions to the chat. Um, I am unsure. Uh, we we have disabled the the speaking in the in the chat. It's just through the Q and A to avoid confusion. So okay. I, I believe that is it with the questions. All right. All right. Well, um, have a great weekend. Uh, enjoy that wonderful Oklahoma spring weather. And um, I won't say hook 'em horns. I will not say that. <laughs> well, <laughs> adios everyone you. Um, thank you very much thank you thank you thank you and have a wonderful weekend my pleasure we'll see you guys thank you mr calvert and miss morrison we hope you have a relaxing evening good night